It's the eyes. And believe me, no one is innocent here. No one is innocent here. The stand that is being taken by India, there is a very logical reason behind it. Right? Before going for Russia-Ukraine war, I would like to talk about the present posturing of India in international relations. Look at the statements being given by our external affairs minister, Dr. H. Jayashankar. I'm not bothered about most of the ministers. No, I'm not. We know how our ministers, they make statements at times, right? They, they are so knowledgeable people. They know so much about the constitution, which is not even written there. They can make statements on that. We have not become ministers yet, so we can't make those statements. Clear? But this person, he is not one of those. Let's talk about who Dr. S. Jayashankar is. Forget it. His father, K. Shankar, one of the closest associates of Mrs. Indira Gandhi and an IFS officer. A person who changed, who single-handedly changed the Nehruvian ideas in India's foreign policy making and brought an era in India which is even today called Indira Doctrine. An extremely high-handed mechanism of policy making, policy making in international relations. According to the parameters of international relations, we call this real politicking. What's happening with this real word? It talks about power. Negotiating or discussing from the position of power. That's what this does. This school does. While taking the class, those of you who have been into my class, you know that I, talk, I told you about one particular source, one free source of material from one think tank called IDSA, Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. I told you you go to the website of IDSA, get the materials from there because IDSA is a think tank, a research body. They keep on doing their researches and all these researches are freely available to us. They are authentic things. Why? Because this is a government think tank. Do you know who formed IDSA? No, Manohar Pareka did not form IDSA. It was K. Shankar, father of Dr. S. Jayashankar, who formed IDSA, being a part of Mrs. Gandhi's cabinet, Mrs. Gandhi's coterie, coterie of people. That's K. Shankar. Today we have a position called a National Security Advisor, NSA. Right? Today we have the chiefs, uh, chiefs of staff, the, the chiefs of staff in defense, that position, right? Do you know all of these things were suggestions given by K. Shankar after the Kargil conflict? K. Shankar made these suggestions and based on his suggestions, the then Atal Vihari Vajpayee government, they started introducing these reforms. His son is Dr. S. Jayashankar. Don't, don't get into party color. I am looking at a breed of technical experts. A breed of technical experts coming from real school. A typical school of scholars who believe in taking decisions from a position of power. Simple idea, the world will listen to you only if you are in a position of power. And the idea, the basic idea here is that the government of India, at the end of the day, their responsibility is not to ensure world peace, no. Their responsibility is to look after our interest. Okay? 
See the difference between Nehruvian approach and this approach. It's not fault of Nehru and please don't criticize anyone. Why? Because you are talking about whomsoever you're talking about, you're talking about the government of India. Again, please don't get into the party color. You're looking at the governments of India, the successive governments of India. We have no right to criticize them. There's a famous saying in cricket. All the experts outside, they know very well how to play a ball. Considering that the person who's best in position to play the ball, that is a batsman, he knows the least. Here the batsman is the government. They're in the best possible position to play the ball. And we all think we know the best than them. Don't get into that. They know far more better what to do with all these things which are going on than what we can even think of. It is in this... And one more thing, what I was telling you right now is also about, not just about prelims, it's also about mains, it's also about personality test. During all the three phases of the examination, do keep in mind that we are in no position to even contemplate what the government is doing. So at the same point of time, we also do not have any right to criticize the government as such. Okay, now it is in this backdrop that I'm looking at the policies of Nehru. Look at the situation when Nehru came into play. These people, Nehru, Sardar Patel, Maulana Mulkalam Azad, all these people, all, all, all of those leaders, they were coming from a highly ethical and moral form of movement. See the way they were schooled, see the way they were prepared to deal in their life, the Gandhian school of thought. In this backdrop, do you think that they could, they could do anything which is immoral or which is amoral? There's a difference between immoral and amoral. Immoral means which is outrightly wrong. Immoral means something which has got nothing to do with morality. These people, the way they were groomed, the way they carried forward the movements and, and they did everything, they were highly moral and ethical people. So naturally that thing was also resonating in Nehru's foreign policy. I know on Friday, Sinasar was, was talking about the Nehruvian foreign policy in front of you. Even in my class, I have been telling you all the features of Nehruvian foreign policy. Highly moral and ethical way of approach. Anti-colonialism, anti-racism, peaceful use of nuclear technology. Nehru was never in favor of nuclear weaponization. At the same point of time, NAM, Panchil, all of these features. Right? Why? This man, intrinsically, from within, this man was ethical and moral and that's how he was trying to look at the world politics. And quite often than not, he forgot that while being moral, it's not that he forgot, he realized that interest of India and ethics and morality, they may not be on the same page. 
So at times, yes, we saw the governments during those days sacrificing at least a little bit of the national interest because of the ground of ethics and morality. Yes, they did that. I cannot say that wrong as well. At the same point of time, the real school which I'm looking at to come into play from the time of Mrs. Gandhi, which is still being carried forward. What is it talking about? No, secure India's interest first. Forget about all the ethics and morality. None of them say Russia, Ukraine war. Just now I said, no one here is innocent. In this backdrop, how, why should we sacrifice our interest to be moral, to be ethical? Are the Westerners innocent here? They're the biggest culprits here in this whole game. You can't imagine how they backstabbed Ukrainians in 2014. Crimea annexation. And they are the actual catalysts because of whom this whole problem came into being. People today, they are trying to draw uh, relations from 1922, the clash between Ukrainians and the Soviet Union, 1991 and all of those things. I am least bothered. No, the present crisis is not from there. Don't try to trivialize it. Don't try to trivialize the role played by the Western Hemisphere. The present crisis what we are looking at is typically created by the Western Hemisphere. And in this backdrop, they want us to sacrifice our interest. Why should we? That's real school. As a result, in the recent past, you have seen quite a few statements being made by Dr. S. Jayashankar, where he said that what Europe purchases, the amount of Russian gas and oil that Europe purchases in an afternoon, India purchases less than that in a whole month. True. You, the Europeans, you, the Westerners, you're telling us to stop buying oil and gas from Russia while you're buying the bulk of it. What hypocrisy is that? Clear? On a number of aspects, in, in, uh, in US, we saw one statement being made by him where someone raised the issue of that, uh, that US, US report on religious freedom here in India. And uh, they said, Ki, what's your statement on this? He said, Ki, everyone has a, has a right to take a, take a view. But don't forget, we also have a right to take our views. Right? The kind of things which are being meted out to the minorities in US, blacks and Asians alike, blacks, Asians and Indians alike, what we are facing there, the color discrimination, we also know about that. In USA, the moment the police sees someone black in color, the first assumption they make that that guy must be culprit. You know what happened? 2016, one university professor of Stanford, a black person, an African American, he got stuck out of, outside his house. Why? Somehow he forgot the key inside and he locked the door. Now he was not being able to open the door. He was trying to open the door somehow. Police came, took this guy into custody. Why? Na neighbors they didn't realize that this guy is a university pro professor in Stanford and this is his house only. He had purchased it recently. And they reported that this guy is trying to break into a house. Police came, saw that this guy is a black. This guy kept on saying that this is my house only. Police didn't bother to listen to him. Just took him into custody. And they are lecturing us on anything. I'm not saying that things are very nice here in India. No, I'm not saying that. But then again, do they have the right to lecture us? I don't know. Clear? 
That's a typical display of this real school or real politicking as we understand. That why should we be taking the blows lying down? There's no reason for that. Yes, everything is not fair, everything is not right in my country. Fine, let's deal with that. Let's solve that problem. Let's think about it, let's contemplate that and solve it. But this does not mean that someone else who himself has, has got his hands red in color because of the hands being dipped in blood would be lecturing us. That's also not done. Clear? This also we have been see, seeing in the recent past. It is in this backdrop that I'm looking at the Russia-Ukraine war. Right? See, yes, it's true that it's since 1991 we are looking at a kind of crisis between Russia and Ukraine. One particular region of Ukraine called Don Donetsk. Donetsk and Donbas, both. Okay. These are the regions which are predominantly inhabited by, let's also mention Donbas. These are the regions which are predominantly inhabited by Russians. Okay. 70% of the population in both of these regions, these are the regions on the eastern side of Ukraine, eastern and southeastern side of Ukraine. Predominantly inhabited by Russians, 70% of the population is Russian. May 30% of the population, they are Ukrainians or Ukrainian speaking. These two languages are separate, are different languages. At the same point of time, ethnically, these two are different people. We think everyone who lived in former Soviet Union, they all are just the same. No, they are not. There are 17 different countries within Soviet Union. Clear? Russia was just one of them. Russia, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, then uh, Moldova, then uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, all of these countries were part of the former Soviet Union. Clear? And all of these people, they are different people. In Russia alone, there are at least five different ethnicities. Okay? So from here itself, you can understand that the, again, I'm looking at an ethnic conflict. It's more an ethnic conflict. We people of India, we know about ethnic conflict. We have the issues here. Clear? Anyway, so this is the issue which started rising since 1991. Prior to 91, the issue was not this much severe because Anyway, they were under one umbrella, Soviet Union. One major umbrella which was covering all these areas. And the Soviet policy was that everyone should be given equal significance. So yes, these problems were far more in check. But post-1991, these problems just started rising. Whether in Donbas region or in Donetsk region or even in Crimea. Okay, Crimea, continuously we are talking about Crimea. It's a region just like this in Black Sea, on top of Black Sea. If I draw a crude map of the region, it's more like an area which can control the whole of Black Sea. Problem in Crimea was 90% of the population, they were Russian speaking. If in Donbas and Donetsk, the population proportion is 70-30, there it was 90% Russian speaking population. <laughs> 
result since a long time russia has been talking about making these regions autonomous to protect the interests of the russian ethnicity people the people belonging to russian ethnicity they have been doing that they have been trying to do that okay but this was on the back burner this was never so prominent yes in 1991 after immediate separation after immediate fallout of soviet union because there was chaos everywhere see the breakup of soviet union was not a planned breakup all of a sudden the whole soviet union they got into a severe economic crisis and the severe economic crisis that caused the complete collapse of soviet union in one single go this was rise gradually this this was growing this problem was growing right those uh, who were there in my class we have talked about the afghan crisis and its impact on for, on breakup of soviet union what happened afghanistan is is a unique place there are jokes about afghanistan right there is one myth i'm just telling you this myth this myth is uh, in association with Alexander the Great. I don't know whether we should be calling him the Great or not. Uh, four feet nine inch guy. Anyway, yep, that's what his height was, four feet nine inch. Let's come back. His mother, Olympia, he wrote to Alexander that you have been winning all these areas so fast. You even defeated the great Babylonian empire, Darius III. You defeated him so easily, captured Babylon. And you're taking so much of time in capturing a small area of Afghanistan. Why? Why is it happening? The, the story says, I don't know whether it's a real story or, or a joke, right? The story says that in response, Alexander sent one bowl of soil from Afghanistan along with a litter. He said, okay, you do one thing, you spread this soil at four corners of your palace and be alert at the night time. And tomorrow, you'll, the next day, you'll realize why it's taking so much of time for me to capture Afghanistan properly. When this, this particular bowl of soil from Afghanistan and uh, this later reached Olympia, mother of Alexander, what she did, she spread the soil at four corners of her palace and at night she was she was alert as per the litter the lit, as the litter suggested that night all the guards of her palace revolted they went for they, they revolted they went against the government and the king so something the moral of the story is something is there in the soil of afghanistan I'm looking at 26 different ethnicities, right? Normally we think Afghans are Pathans. No, they are not. Mere 40% of Afghanistan, they are Pathans. 60% they are of different ethnicities. And even the Pathans are not one people. They're Kugianis, Momans, Afridis. Shahid Afridi, right? He belongs to the Afridi tribe of the Pathans. There are 12 different tribes among the Pathans. And as for the rest, 60% population, you tell me, Hazaras, Tajiks, Uzbeks, Turks, you'll find every, everything there. Every, every ethnicity of, of that region, whole Central Asia would be found in Afghanistan. In the history, Afghanistan has been peace only when they were in war. When they were fighting outsiders, they were very, very peaceful inside. The Afghans actually loved when the British, they tried to capture Afghanistan. In the history, the British, they tried to capture Afghanistan three times. These are the three periods 
when all the afghans they came together they hugged each other ki we are brothers let's fight the british together that's the population you're looking at who are only at peace when they are at war if they don't have outsiders to fight with they fight among themselves and soviet union all of a sudden they decided ki okay fine fine we'll go and capture that country you united them you did the same mistake what the british did the british had a cash cow india they were looting india and they were doing all that nonsense what soviet union did they ruined their own economy one afghan campaign brought soviet union down to its knees they they are outsiders right so when they attacked afghanistan all the afghans came together okay we are brothers again let's fight the outsiders and god they know how to fight clear condition was so bad in soviet union that for last two years 1989 to 1990 1990 to 1991 for these last two years soviet union was not even able to pay the salary of the military why do you think there is so much corruption there in that region why do you think the world talks about russian mafia i know you are good boys and girls you don't watch movies right if you watch hollywood movies you'll always see russians are always mafias that's the image of the russians russian people okay they can do only one thing killing and looting that idea came out this whole culture came up because of this chaos that happened at the time of fall of soviet union so all the issues which were kept under control during the time of soviet union all those issues all of a sudden they started rising from 1991 onwards a typical example is this ethnic conflict how this because of this ethnic diversity diversity between the russians and the ukrainians this crisis would start happening from 1991 but again this was a momentary issue this has never been the primary concern then what happened in ukraine till 2013 there was one president who was very close to russia okay yanukovych he was very close to russia and accordingly he was managing the country ukraine was one of the closest allies of russia good there's a problem then problem would be created what happened from 2011 onwards we are looking at a continuous flow of revolutions across the world it would start with tunisia for the first time a very small country in north africa in tunisia a vegetable vendor frustrated of his life because this guy had a masters degree in spite of having masters degree this guy was forced to sell vegetables why given the rampant corruption in the country there was no job the president was ruling the country for last 30 years and he was doing only one thing looting so out of frustration this guy he would self immolate he would pour kerosene on himself and he'll burn himself right when he and and this thing was live streamed on youtube 
When this happened, the whole of the country went up in flames. The whole Tunisia went up in flames. After Tunisia, the next country was Egypt. There was one particular president in Egypt called Hosni Mubarak. For last 20 years, 20, 25 years, he was ruling Egypt and the same story. So now the revolution against Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. Then it will start in Libya. Then in Syria, Arab Spring, Jasmine Revolution or Arab Spring. Gradually, this revolution would start spreading elsewhere in the world as well. And this revolution would spread into the former Soviet bloc countries as well. In Ukraine, we would see the rise of this revolution in the form of Orange Revolution. They would call it Orange Revolution, Colored Revolution or Orange Revolution. Yanukovych would be thrown out. There would be massive riot and those who, who, who were going for the revolt, they were down on the streets. When this revolution started in Ukraine, God knows why, European Union would come forward. And European Union would say that if this revolution succeeds in Ukraine, we will take Ukraine into our fold. We will make Ukraine a part of Uni European Union and we will ensure economic prosperity of Ukraine. Ukraine won't have to care about its economy anymore. We will take care of it. Good. NATO comes forward. We know NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, right? NATO comes forward and NATO says, if this revolution succeeds, we will make Ukraine a part of NATO. NATO will provide security cover to Ukraine. Ukraine won't have to care about Russia anymore. And not only that, Ukraine won't have to spend much on defense. NATO will take care of Ukraine's defense. And you, you make most of your money, you use most of your money for your own development. You don't have to take care of your defense. We'll take care of your defense. Good. Not only that, the then US ambassador in Kyiv, the lady who was US ambassador in Ukraine, she would come down on the streets of Kyiv. Revolution was going on. She would be seen, she and the staffs of the US diplomatic mission, they would be seen distributing food packets and water pouches among the revolutionaries. Those people who were down on streets, food packets and water pouches were being distributed among them. It was at this point of time when for the first time, the Russian media, they would highlight a name. I can't take the name because obviously we are, we are also streaming online, right? Name of a lady who they would tag as a CIA operative. They would present all the documents that see this lady, wherever she was going, in all of those countries, revolution started. So this is not happening naturally. This is being orchestrated. This is being done artificially. This revolution you're looking at, revolution in Ukraine that you're looking at, this is not a spontaneous revolution. This is not a revolution of the common people. Outside elements, they have instigated and they have started this revolution. Why? To answer the why, again, I'll take a broader route, broader approach. What are we studying? International relations, right? This is hardly about relations. It's all about politics. World politics. A major part of this world politics is geopolitics. Let's get into geopolitics a little bit. 
Let's look at one region of Ukraine called Crimea. Before talking about Crimea, let's talk about the Black Sea. The countries in and around Black Sea. Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, Iran, Turkmenistan. Look at the names. All of these countries, they are oil rich. Newer and newer oil, oil fields are being discovered in this region even today. Clear? And pipelines are being laid from this region to Europe for transfer of oil and natural gas, energy supply. If you want to control this energy supply in the future, you need to control Black Sea. Problem is, here in Crimea, exactly at this spot, is a Soviet era naval base called Sevastopol. And in spite of Ukraine be being a separate country, Sevastopol was under Russian Navy. Look at the position of Sevastopol. If you control Sevastopol, you control the whole of Black Sea. You control the whole of Black Sea, you control that flow of energy from this region. Please try and understand in all these nonsenses in international relations, billions of dollars are spent. Do you think they would spend billions of dollars just because, just like that? There would be an intrinsic re reason, a very strong reason behind every action. Try and understand that. Nothing in international politics, nothing in world politics happens just like that. It doesn't. Why? Billions and trillions of dollars are at stake. Clear? So now tell me. So what was actually happening? Yes, what the Russians alleged was true. This revolution was not spontaneous. This revolution was orchestrated. Orchestrated with one single objective to pull, to wean away. This spelling of wean is this one. To wean away Ukraine from Russia. So that NATO can access Sevastopol. So that the Western Hemisphere can control Black Sea, take over the control of Black Sea from the Russians. This was a whole game plan. That's why that revolution, that's why that statement by European Union, that's why that statement by NATO, that's why the US ambassador she personally came down on the streets of Kyiv distributing food and water pouches. Why? S to sentimentally connect with the people of Ukraine and pull them towards themselves. Part of propaganda, as we understand. That's what was going on here. Russia also realized what's happening. What happened? I told you that the population in Crimea, 90% of the population, they are Russians. We would see a counter revolution. A revolution was going on in Ukraine. This is a revolution against revolution. A counter revolution to start in Crimea. 
people in crimea now they would start saying that we don't want to be part of ukraine anymore we want to join you don't have to write these things down i'll be dictating them hold on so people here they would start making making these statements that we don't want to be part of ukraine anymore we want to join russia and what would we see god knows from where some soldiers would come into play soldiers who were not wearing uniforms of any other country any country for that matter they were wearing black uniforms these soldiers would provide protection to the revolutionaries here in crimea so that the ukrainian forces they cannot enter crimea they would stop this entry point and a referendum people's vote would be organized in crimea in that referendum in that people's vote 98% of the crimeans they would vote that we want to join russia i don't know how much free and fair that election was but 98% of the people they voted official figures that 98% of the people they voted in favor of joining russia and immediately the lower house of russia duma they would pass the resolution making crimea a part of russia they would also build a bridge connecting russia with crimea to avoid ukraine that map is not to scale you can understand that gap is not that much it's a small gap right they would use that small gap and they would build a bridge to 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 bridge between russia and and crimea so from 2014 onwards crimea is properly in the hands of the russians do you know what happened eu nato they all came they prepared a beautiful cake the russians came ate the cake went away and in all of these who are the victims common ukrainians clear anyway so after this we would see usa european union they all would impose sanctions on russia see the beauty they all impose sanctions on russia today in usa we, they have an act called katsa countering america's adversaries through sanctions act katsa 2017 right because of this act usa tells india that if you buy any weapons or anything from russia we will impose sanction on you right when we talk about these s400 missile missile defense system or camov k226 helicopters or anything for that matter they say we can impose sanctions on you europe is completely dependent on russian oil and gas they have imposed sanctions on russia but still they keep on buying oil and gas from russia what's happening with them no no they are okay so please don't tell us about these hypocrisies Thirty-four percent of the Russian oil and gas is purchased by Europe. The largest consumer, obviously, is China, no doubt. After China, the second largest consumer of Russian oil and gas is Europe itself, and that too, Western Europe. Countries like Germany and and those 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 countries there. so now tell me and they impose sanction on russia what kind of sanction that was i don't know they said we don't we would never do trade with you 
other than doing trade with you. We'll do trade with you, but we'll never say that that's trade. Okay. All that great talk by EU that if this revolution succeeds, we are going to take Ukraine within our fold. We are going to revolutionize Ukrainian economy, right? All that talk by NATO that if the revolution succeeds, we'll pro provide protection to Ukraine. Where goes all those, all those talks? They all stopped. Why? The main purpose is gone. The main purpose was Crimea and, and Russia has taken that, that purpose. Who cares about Ukraine now? Let them fend for themselves. This is international politics. This is world politics. 2015, again we would see the Ukrainians would try to take over Sevastopol. And the Russians will beat them back like anything. Ukraine kept on asking for support. Support from NATO, support from Europe. Nothing came. Who cares? This time what happened? A new idea came, came to NATO. What is the idea? Let's take Ukraine within our fold and let's place ICBMs in Ukraine. Right? Let us be aggressive. Let us take Ukraine within the fold of NATO. See, 2014 NATO said that we want, we would provide security cover to Ukraine. From 2014 to 2022, Nothing happened. 21 actually, nothing happened. By end of 21, early 22, NATO would realize, ki, okay, forget about Ukraine, for, for, forget about Crimea. Even Ukraine has significance. How Ukraine has significance? Ukraine is very close to southwestern part of Russia. Chechnya and all those regions, they're very close to Ukraine. So let's do one thing. Let's take Ukraine within NATO's fold. And let's place our third and other ICBMs in Ukraine. So that in the eventuality of any hostility with Russia, we can immediately destroy Russia. Say someday if China says, okay, we are going to take our missiles to Sri Lanka. We will place our missiles in Sri Lanka. So that if any war with India starts, we won't only attack India from north. We'll be shooting those missiles from down south to India and we'll destroy India. How will you feel like? Nice feeling, right? This is what they started doing here this time. It was in this backdrop that Russia would raise the issue of Donbass. Why? Told you. This, this area. That fine. NATO would take, take over Ukraine and would make Ukraine a base against Russia. Let's capture as much territory of Ukraine as possible. So that this does not happen. It was in this backdrop that they would raise, raise this issue once again. The issue of Donbass. That we need to provide protection to, to those 70% Russian ethnic people. Till now everyone forgot about them. Till now no one cared about them. But now safety and security of Russia is at stake. So this becomes a major issue. Is this actually an issue? Tell me. No. This has been made an issue. The actual thing is far more deep. I'm looking at geopolitics of the world. What I'm seeing is a new caucus coming into play. 
রাশিয়া চায়না ইরান আম লুকিং এট দ্য বিগিনিং অফ দ্য নিউ কোল্ড ওয়ার দ্যাটস ফাই অল দিজ ননসেন্সেস If you have noticed, very recently, Russia, China and Iran, they have announced a war game and exercise in Indian Ocean, right? That's a new grouping that's, that's coming up. Pakistan is nothing here. Pakistan is a new territory of China. Whenever they want, Pakistan will join them. So forget about Pakistan. Your politicians may keep on showing you Pakistan, but that's actually insignificant. Actual play lies here in this new, new grouping that's coming up. Russia, China, Iran. Till now, you were talking about Quad. Till now, you were talking about AUKUS. Now, they are coming up with their own game plan. China is already beyond reach of USA. USA knows they cannot control China. Their point is, Russia should also not gain that much prominence as China has. If both of them become so huge, so potent, USA knows it will lose its number one position. So they cannot allow Russia to grow. China has already grown. China has already grown beyond the capacity of USA. USA cannot control China anymore. But they cannot allow Russia to grow as well. So now they have to control Russia to keep this newly formed group of China, Russia and Iran somewhat under control. To maintain the balance in the new Cold War. That's what we are looking at. Clear? Till now what we have been talking about, what we have been reading, that's frivolous. That's never pointing. You show me one article in any one newspaper, especially the international articles, which is showing me this real picture, which is connecting all the dots. Guys, your training has already started. You know what happens, how, how this whole game plan plays out in UPSC? Why UPS has included all these aspects in the syllabus? So that you start knowing about these things from this stage only. So that upon your selection, they don't have to make you aware about these basics anymore. They can deal with the advanced things then. They need you to clear these basics right now. So please go beyond those newspaper articles, they are not sufficient, they are not enough. They are showing you half-hearted pictures. Clear? They are showing you the picture of a house from one, one side. Okay? They have painted one side and they are showing the picture of that, of that side of the house. The rest of the house is actually broken. Before you buy the house, please see the house yourself. That's what is happening. So now tell me who's innocent in this whole game plan. Even not them. When for the first time, no, not even Russians. When for the first time that NATO came forward, today this Vladimir Zelensky he is saying that we don't want to be part of NATO anymore. It was you who was also shouting that we want to join NATO, we want to join NATO. 
you knew very well about the security issues. You're not the only country who's outside NATO in Europe. Finland was outside NATO. So was Sweden. So, so many other countries, they, they were outside NATO. So what? It was you, the, the, the Ukrainians or, or the Ukrainian policy makers who made your own people pawn, pawn into this game. How come you're innocent, tell me? You, the Ukrainian policy makers, out of your greed to sit on the high tables of world politics, you thought, ki, okay, NATO will come and we'll, we'll teach the Russians a lesson. Okay, fine, go teach the Russians a lesson. You made your people a pawn. All the three parties here, whether the Western Hemisphere or the Ukrainians or the Russians, they all have their hands dirty. No one is innocent in this. In 2014, this revolution succeeded, right? New government came to power in, in Ukraine. N EU was not bothered about economic prosperity of Ukraine ever. EU never took Ukraine into their fold. So what was Ukraine doing? How, are, how were they managing their economy? Do you know what they did? All the Soviet era, Weapons industries which were there in Ukraine, they revived them. They revived those Soviet era weapons industries and started selling weapons to the outside world. They were selling weapons to others without realizing that someday these weapons can come back to haunt themselves. That's what is happening. So who's innocent here? I don't see anyone innocent here. So in this backdrop, you tell me why should we sacrifice our interest? In this whole story, did you ever feel any emotional affinity to any side? That okay, they are the bicharas here. For their sake, we should sacrifice. No one is a bichara here. They were trying to play chase. One side is winning, one side is losing. Fine, they, they knew, the, knew what is at stake. So what's our fault? Clear? This is Russia-Ukraine war. Clear? Let's write it down in brief. I'm using very, very simple language and the language for your own understanding. I'm not using any, any formal language for notes making in that sense. What we are looking at, what we are looking at is part of, is part of The larger game plan of Cold War 2.0, of Cold War 2.0. If on one side, If on one side, we are looking at NATO, 
North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The Demographic Quad. AUKUS. Australia, Ukraine, US. AUKUS. Australia, UK, US. That's why AUKUS, na? A for Australia, UK, United Kingdom, US, United States. That's AUKUS. UK. Australia, UK, US. And the unnamed grouping the unnamed grouping of India, Israel, of India, Israel, UAE and USA, UAE and USA. For your information, this year in the month of February, for the first time this grouping had a virtual meeting. I'm looking at another quad, not a democratic quad, right? But I'm looking at another quad forming on the western, western side, western side of India. How come UAE and Israel in the same group? Aren't they enemies? <coughs> not anymore. You're forgetting Abraham Accords. Okay, not anymore. Now they're uniting forces, they're joining forces to fight against the Shias, Iranians. Iran is the common enemy now on that side. This is international politics. No one is a permanent enemy, no one is a permanent friend. This is politics. Clear? The only difference is there's no party color here. They're countries. And the newly emerging block, the newly emerging block of China, Russia, Iran of China, Russia, Iran. Put a full stop. China being world number two, keep on writing. China being world number two, is already beyond control of USA. Is already beyond control of USA. stop. In fact, comma, the way Chinese products, the way Chinese products have inundated, have inundated inundated means flooded, inundated, the American domestic market, the American domestic market that they cannot avoid or ignore China anymore. They cannot avoid or ignore China anymore. Put a full stop. Donald Trump administration, 
Donald Trump administration tried to change this course tried to change this course by imposing high taxes by imposing high taxes on imports from China on imports from China but failed but failed rather China being the number one consumer the number one consumer of US agricultural products of US agricultural products comma this policy hurt Donald Trump very badly this policy hurt Donald Trump very badly you know what happened we talked about this in the class see USA is the largest producer of soya bean in the world also wheat production in USA is phenomenal right wheat and corn production in USA is phenomenal who's the largest consumer of this China Chinese they don't consume it for their own eating purpose no what they do they import the soya bean from USA they import the corn from USA process it manufacture tinned foods sell it back to USA clear so the US they prepare the food they actually produce the food but now for eating purposes they're dependent on the Chinese so when Donald Trump he started imposing these high taxes what happened Donald Trump's traditional support base was the agrarian community of Iowa and other other states which are agricultural states China also imposed tax on agricultural imports from USA and they started buying soya bean and other things from India now the US farmers got angry with Donald Trump and he lost the election so do you realize what happened here this is what is going on we see anything with simple eyes no please you have grown up enough look into the reality behind the picture the picture is half of what it what is happening get behind it clear chalo let's come back and give me the last line here last line please pro full stop however today the realization is today the realization is that Russia cannot be allowed that Russia cannot be allowed to grow farther to grow farther because in that case because in that case the newly formed grouping the newly formed grouping of Russia China Iran 
of Russia, China, Iran would dethrone USA, would dethrone USA from the number one spot or from the number one position, from the number one position. It is in this backdrop that we are looking at the beginning of, that we are looking at the beginning of, that we are looking at the beginning of the new age Cold War, the new age Cold War. For your information, please try and understand, time has come for India to adopt NAM again, non-alignment again. And what you're looking at in the approach of Dr. S. Jayashankar is a typical display of that. This time the policy of non-alignment is not like the Nehruvian policy of non-alignment. Nehruvian policy of non-alignment was ethical and moral. This time the policy of non-alignment would be driven by real politicking, India's own interest. And that's exactly what we are looking at in the posturing of Dr. S. Jayashankar. There's a new policy of non-alignment again, that no, we are neither aligned with the US or, the al or aligned with the Russians, Russians or Chinese. We will do only what suits our own interest, that's it. Clear? See, what you think today, international relations is one such area that what you can think today, believe me, that has already happened yesterday. You have to be on your toes. One thing for sure, to understand these things, you need to know the history, no doubt about it. But then again, after knowing the history, now be in the present. Be in the present and think of the future. You have to contemplate what's going to happen. Problem is, in India, for a long period of time, we have seen a vacuum. From 2012 to 2020, for eight long years, in India's foreign policy making, there has been a vacuum. This was also accepted by the present foreign minister, the present minister of external affairs, Dr. S. Jayashankar, in 2019. 4th of November 2019, Dr. S. Jayashankar was delivering the fourth Ramnath Goenka Memorial Lecture. Who's Ramnath Goenka? A pioneer in Indian journalism and the founder of Indian Express, the newspaper. Okay. After his death, in his memory, this Ramnath Goenka Memorial Lecture has been instituted. On 2019, 4th of November 2019, Dr. S. Jayashankar was delivering the fourth Ramnath Goenka Memorial Lecture. While delivering this lecture, Dr. A.S. Jayashankar, he talked about in the evolution of India's foreign policy. Among you, how many students whom I have taken the international relations class? I do see a few faces here. While talking about evolution of India's foreign policy, we, we had a separate section for this. Okay. I'm looking at six phases as talked about by Dr. A.S. Jayashankar. Right? He says that phase one, policy or uh, era of ideological optimism. Right? We were too ideological, we were moral, and we were optimistic that everyone, everything should happen for good. 
Please don't, no. Even naive. Right? Next phase. He calls this the era of realism. Realism means where the country started realizing what actually it is. Phase three. A period dominated by Indira doctrine. He calls this the era of regional hegemony. Where in South Asia, we impose ourselves that we are the boss. You the small countries, you have to listen to what we are telling you to do. An era dominated by three people. At the head of the three, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, Dr. K. Shankar, R. N. Kao, Rameshwar Nath Kao. Who are they? Rameshwar Nath Kao, an IPS officer. India's number one spy master who would ultimately set up research and analysis wings. Till his death, till the very end, he will be there by Mrs. Gandhi's side. And Dr. K. Shankar. Till Mrs. Gandhi's death, he will also be there on Mrs. Gandhi's side. And these three people, they would be shaping India's foreign policy during this time. An era of regional hegemony. You small countries, you Sri Lanka, you Bangladesh, you Pakistan, you have to do whatever we tell you to do. Forget about what you want. Sorry. Then comes he calls this era of radical rethinking. We started rethinking our position and we started doing a lot of things which were unthinkable to us. Radical rethinking. Clear? Then he says that from the year 2000 to 2014, India gained the position of a counterbalance, counterbalance to China. Clear? That's the fifth stage. Uniqueness is about the sixth stage. He talks about the period from 2014 till 2019 Being a typical diplomat, he does not criticize the government. How can he criticize the government? The government of whom he himself was part of. Then what did he do? He just did not talk about India. This is one thing for you to learn. Where you cannot defend the government, learn to keep quiet. Learn to divert the attention. What did he do? He says this is a period where regional players like Russia and Japan started gaining prominence. True. India's foreign minister, talking about evolution of India's foreign policy, forgets to mention India. No, he didn't forget to mention India. He knew we cannot mention India here. Because we have been taking selfies during that time, sorry. <laughs> Clear? Post 2019, again I am looking at that rise. Please try and understand you need experts to deal with the expert area, the technical areas. Clear? So, we, we needed the expert. And again, from the, from the end of 2019 or from 2020 onwards, we are looking India to reshape its policies once again. And now we are looking at the rise of non-alignment. Non-alignment 2.0. 
क्लियर चलो गिव मी द लास्ट लाइन प्लीज द बिगिनिंग ऑफ न्यू एज कोल्ड वॉर इट वॉज इन दिस बैकड्रॉप दैट वी नीड टू लुक इन टू दैट वी नीड टू लुक इन टू द रशिया यूक्रेन वॉर the russia ukraine war normally normally people tend to link people tend to link the present developments the present developments with the ethnic conflict with the ethnic conflict with the ethnic conflict that has been going on in the region that has been going on in the region since long we have also seen newspaper articles we have also seen newspaper articles linking the present crisis linking the present crisis with the 1922 with the 1922 internal crisis within soviet union internal crisis within soviet union now stop guys please have some senses we have yes i have gone through number of articles newspaper articles where they have they have been talking about how in 1922 under stalin Lenin was gone by this time. 1922, Lenin was gone. It was Stalin who was at the at the head of Soviet Union. Stalin would try to revolutionize Soviet agricultural system. Why I'm talking about this? Because this this will link with my next topic, Sri Lanka crisis. Okay. Yes, Stalin would try to do something nonsense in in Soviet Union in 1922, and as a result. there would be massive hunger and and famine which will break out in soviet union more than 1 million people 10 lakh people would die in the process yep we we take joseph stalin uh, then uh, harry struman that uh, that Winston Churchill as great people, right? They are making a movie on Winston Churchill. Do you know how great Winston Churchill was? How nicely he tortured the Indians. Okay, they are making movies on that. Anyway, none of them were good people. Joseph Stalin would die in 1953. After three years of his death. just imagine till the point of time this man was alive no one had the courage to say anything against him after 3 years of his death now soviet union will officially accept that during his rule stalin has killed 3 million 30 lakh people we call hitler a devil because he killed 6 lakh jews no that was also wrong killing six lakh jews was no right thing to do right 
But tell me about Joseph Stalin who killed 30 lakh people there. And 10 lakh out of them would die this time. In 1922 because of this huge famine. The Britishers, Winston Churchill, right? 1942, the Great Bengal Famine. Today, the state of West Bengal, Jharkhand, Odisha, Bihar, Bangladesh, part of Assam, Tripura, Chhattisgarh, all engulfed in famine. How many people died? Official estimates 5 lakh, unofficial estimates 15 lakh. Three times the official estimate. And Winston Churchill is a good, good person. Obviously, killed Indians. No, one, one logic we can, we can use. He was actually doing population control in India. He knew we would be growing in such a such a large scale, so he was doing population control at the point of time. Anyway, let's not get into that. Let's not trivialize what these people they did actually. Anyway, number of people they link this particular problem with the present crisis. Why? The severity of this problem happened in Ukraine because Ukraine was the most agriculturally prosperous region at the point of time. So when all these idiotic changes were being brought in. Ukraine was a severe most affected. Problem. Joseph Stalin was not a Russian. Take out your phone, search for Joseph Stalin. He was a Georgian. There's a country called Georgia, na? He's from that country. He's a Georgian. is not a Russian. So how can I link the action of a Georgian with Russia-Ukraine crisis? These people forget that. They just link with anything. Don't do that. Clear? Let's move forward. Which led to, uh, have, we, have we mentioned that it led to the death of 1 million people? No. Okay, which led to the death of, which led to the death of, which led to the death of a million people, a million people in the famine that will occur in the famine that will occur. Put a full stop, next paragraph. In reality, in reality, the roots of this crisis, in reality, the roots of this crisis can be found, can be found in the recent Crimean crisis, in the recent Crimean crisis. It was in 2014. It was in 2014, in the backdrop of Jasmine Revolution and Arab Spring, in the backdrop of Jasmine Revolution and Arab Spring, wait a minute. Jasmine Revolution and Arab Spring that a colored revolution
called orange revolution called orange revolution would start in would start in Ukraine would start in Ukraine would start in Ukraine and the then president of Ukraine and the then president of Ukraine comma who was pro Russian who was pro Russian called Yanukovych called Yanukovych would be thrown not only out of power but also out of country would be thrown not only out of power but also out of country would be thrown not only out of power but also out of country put a full stop it was during this time it was during this time that we would see that we would see NATO and European Union NATO and European Union to make a ploy P L O Y to make a ploy P L O Y to make a ploy to get control to make a ploy to get control of Crimea of Crimea and the port Sevastopol and the port Sevastopol put a full stop if we look deep down into it if we look deep down into it the newly rising cold war politics the newly rising cold war politics and the effort to control and the effort to control black sea and the energy supply from the region and the energy supply from the region becomes clearer to us becomes clearer to us put a full stop hence no wonder hence no wonder that russia would also make a ploy that russia would make would also make a ploy and using and using the highly debatable the highly debatable referendum referendum 
the highly debatable referendum which was voted by the people of Crimea which was voted by the people of Crimea would be used would be used to annex the region by the Russians to annex the region by the Russians a n n e x annex the region by the Russians annex means to attach it to attach it with themselves right to annex the region by the Russians put a full stop today all of these factors Number one, the rising clout of China, Russia, Iran, the rising clout of China, Russia, Iran. How, how come this ri rising clout we are looking at? Just see what's happening. One country after another is getting into this lobby. Iraq has already got into this lobby. Why? Majority of the population of Iraq, they are Shias, right? In Iraq, 15% minority are Kurdish people, Kurds. 30% are Sunnis. Saddam Hussein was a Sunni, but he was part of the minority community. Remaining 55% of the population, they are Shias. Result today, when democracy has come back to Iraq, in, uh, come back to Iraq, naturally the majority community, they are holding the power. The Shias are holding the power. Clear? Syria, again a Shia country. The ruling dynasty, Assad dynasty, the person who's the president, he calls himself the president. Just imagine his father was the president. When his father died, his father made him the president. It's monarchy here. Anyway. Presidency. Basar al Assad. Right? They are also close to Iranians and Russians. Gradually, one country after another. Yemen. Who are controlling Yemen right now? A minority tribal community called Houthis. And these Houthis are Shias. Till now our understanding was that Iran, what kind of power are they? They have huge amount of political power to carry. You have no idea what kind of power they carry. I know a lot of people, lot of you, you are thinking, okay, China, Russia, Iran. Yes, Iran. Azerbaijan. In the recent past, there was a war between Azerbaijan and Armenia two years back. Right? Do you know? Yes, Azerbaijan took help from Turkey. Being a Muslim country, they took help from Turkey. But actually, Azerbaijan is close to both Iran and Russia. Similarly, Georgia, close to Russia. Armenia, close to Russia. So just imagine, I'm just putting this, these countries here, if I may. China, Russia. Okay, now see. This whole belt is being controlled by the lobby. Not a single country is out of that.
Not a single country is out, out of that, out of that block. So now do you realize how strong this lobby is? And Pakistan, well, how can I miss? A country where Mandarin is an official language today. Chinese Yuan is an official currency today. They should call themselves yep, a new province of China rather than autonomous territory of China. So now do you realize what's happening? That's why Iran. Now do you realize how this Cold War is again being played? This is being played in front of you and you don't have any idea. That's why this is Cold War. This has already started. You're already three years late. This started in 2019. Okay, let's come back. Yep. Shias. See the conflict between the two sides, Iran on one hand and Saudi Arabia on the other. Saudi Arabia, UAE, they, they control the Sunni bloc. Okay, whereas Iran controls the Shia bloc. Well, the discussion is quite long, pretty long. Don't expect me to do that discussion today. Because in that case, let's cancel all the other classes. Let's cancel my flight as well. And let's carry on with the discussion of Shia Sunni conflict. That will take at least three hours of discussion. Started a long time back now. Since the time of Hajrat Ali, I would have to talk about. Since then, I would have to talk about. Yep. So let's come back. Fine. Now, uh, just read the whole sentence, now, please. In, okay. Okay. Point number one is this: uh, rising cloud of China, Russia, and Iran. Number two: control of Black Sea. Control of Black Sea, geopolitically, control of Black Sea, geopolitically, and controlling the flow of energy, controlling the flow of energy from the region to Western Europe, from the region to Western Europe. Number three, the power tussle for the future, the power tussle for the future in between the Western Bloc, in between the Western Bloc, consisting of USA, UK, Germany, France, etc. Consisting of USA, UK, Germany, France, etc. And Russia, China, Iran on the other hand. And Russia, China, Iran on the other hand. Okay. These are the three critical aspects here which ultimately led to this crisis. So please, this is 
a lot is happening here. It's not just a war. It's practically, we are looking at something mushrooming. And here, a propaganda war is also going on. Don't fall victim to that. Clear? A lot of what you're reading is part of the propaganda campaign. In India, what has happened is, uh, because of a lull in Indian media, our narrative is controlled most or more by the Western media. So the way we are looking at this war is more the point of view of the Western media. Because our media people, they know only one thing, how to dance. They don't create content on their own. They dance, right? The content is being created by the Western media and they are dancing to the tune. But that content which is being prepared by the Western media is a part of their propaganda campaign. Please don't fall victim to that. Even if you get into Russian media, if, if you start watching RT and other such televisions, they'll be present in their version. That, that too is propaganda. Don't fall victim to the propaganda of any of the sides. Take a chill pill, relax, think. You'll get the answer from your own understandings. Clear? That's this issue. Russia, Ukraine. I'm not intentionally deliberating more on this topic. The next topic is uh, economic crisis in Sri Lanka. But I would like to take a break here, if possible, right? Uh, in the next half, what we'll do, I'll take uh, one topic from here, right? Then I'll be going for a few topics from Indian society as well. So the issue of death penalty, that's, that's again on, on, on the discussion. We need to talk about that, right? So these kind of few things are there which we need to look into. Those areas I'll be taking up here in the class. At the same point of time, I'm also going to provide you with a list of topics and some content. Please do bother to go through them. Okay, we still have some time. Today is 9th, 9th of May, right? 22 days is still remaining here in the month of May, four days there in the month of June. So 26 days we still have. Please, let's use that. Chalo, thank you. Uh, 15, 20 minutes, good enough, thank you.
नॉर्मल चार्जर सी टाइप नॉर्मल चार्जर वन फिफ्टीन या जस्ट बैग ऑन ऑन द बेड गाइस सॉरी सेड ट्वेंटी मिनट्स बट टू टेन मिनट्स एक्स्ट्रा सो वाज हैविंग वन आई गॉट वन क्वेश्चन yep please sir okay that's the first question and the second question right the question is it's genuinely unique question that whether economic economy drives politics or the politics drives economy See what it should be is that the economy should be driving politics, right? Why so? Because at the end of any given day, consumers need to survive. Let's see. Let's let, let me explain this how and why. See, there is nothing called capitalistic economy or. That, that kind of thing. Oh, please, uh, those Marxists they would keep on talking about capitalism and all all that thing. Let's not get into that. <clears throat> those from sociology they know that uh, <laughs> we study capitalism as well of Karl Marx. That that's a different thing altogether. What is actually there is called market economy. There are two models of development: market economy. and the socialistic model of development these are the two models of development there is nothing uh, that kind of capitalistic model or something of that sort no whether that whether it's market economy or it's socialistic economy in both the economies the driving force is the consumer say tomorrow in analog say here in analog we are putting in all the efforts we are, we are trying to put in all the best possible efforts we are being honest with our initiative and everything but say in spite of all the best efforts we are not being able to spread the information properly why because the channels for flowing information they are controlled they are controlled and those who are controlling the flow of information they are favoring only one or two players result most of the players they are not being able to flow the information about what they are doing how they are doing would the consumer get to know about all my best efforts no why since the channels for flowing information they are blocked so in spite of all the best efforts i would never be able to convey my message to them properly do you know this completely goes against the idea of perfectly competitive market in a perfectly competitive market everyone should be having every information the buyers should also know what they are buying what all things are there the sellers should also be having all the informations about the buyers their preferences and everything that's perfect competition at the same point of time say the controllers of the market they are so biased that they created certain conditions because of which i do not have proper market access even result what will happen say i am trying to sell something acha let me ask you people only you have come to a coaching institute take an admission what is the amount of gst that you have paid on the fees of the coaching 18% 18% gst what is the amount of gst that you pay in a bar 5% gst you want to tell me that the bar is a necessity and the coaching is a luxury
how do you realize what's happening? But being a student from sociology, I must admit, education is always a luxury. It's always for the elite. No doubt about it. You study too much, you come to know too much, you don't trust anyone. That's what happens. So, yes, it's a luxury. <laughs> let's not get into that. Anyway, let's come back. So, what's happening at the end of the day? When the market forces start controlling the market and they don't give everyone equal opportunity, the perfectly competitive market starts dying down. And instead of a perfectly competitive market, what rises is oligopoly or a monopolistic competition. Where only a few, they start controlling the market. There was a time when we had so many players in the telecom sector. And as a result, there was a feature of competitive pricing. Pricing was coming down. Pricing in telecom sector was coming down. Right? Today, how many players do you have? Effectively two, practically three. Because the third player, Vodafone idea, they're dying down. They're dying out. The two players who are, who are having the market share, Reliance and Airtel, okay. Out of them, Airtel is having the market hold or they, they are they're being, being still a strong player because they are making windfall profit in Africa. That windfall profit that they are making in Africa, they are bringing that profit here in India and that's how they are surviving here in India. Or else they are making huge loss here in India. Once Vodafone idea moves out of the market, now tell me what's going to happen to you. Do you know, there was a time when we used to thump our chase that we have the uh, cheapest data in the world. Data was so cheap. Today per GB data, is it, it actually costs 51 rupees. In Bangladesh, per GB data costs 26 rupees in Indian currency. You're already paying more. Yeah. Sir, but uh, the government uh, newspapers say that uh, competitive prices reduce so that to encourage new players in the bidding process. Let the bidding take place in 5G process. Let the players come in. Problem is, it's the government only who has killed one of the largest players, MTNL and BSNL. I don't know how much effective they were, but the presence of MTNL and BSNL was a very big protector. It, it was a big shield for the common consumer. That shield is missing now. And we all are volatile to the other players. Now tell me from the point of consumerism. Is this perfectly competitive market? So what's happening here in India? I'm seeing at the end of the day, politics driving economy. And yes, I cannot deny that on certain parameters, we are at a very bad stage. Right. The head of NSSO and the chief economist of NSSO was fired in 2019, no doubt. But the report that they prepared was right. We are looking at an unemployment scenario, which is genuinely scary. Guys, please try and understand, we talk so much about human capital and demographic dividend. Dividend is always drawn from capital. Please try and understand the logic here. Dividend is always drawn from the capital. To draw that demographic dividend, we need to build the human capital. 
have we been able to build the human capital? So what we are looking at is a population surge and a demographic burden, not the human capital. To convert that into human capital, we need to skill them. Whether hard skill or soft skill. Hard skill means vocational skilling. Soft skills, say writing skill, communication skill, whether verbal communication, non-verbal communication, at the same point of time, leadership training, entrepreneurial skills, them being imparted, these are the soft skills. I can challenge any of you right now, come on stage, teach me about one topic. The topic you're most comfortable with. Anyone right now. Do you know what you're fearful of? Verbal communication. It's not so easy. I still recall my first day in college. I, I was, uh, at that point of time, I joined as an ad hoc lecturer in a college in Delhi. The first day in class, some 40, 45 scary faces looking at me, a new guy entering the class. My knees were actually shaking. Then I also do remember the first day I went into ALS, in a class in ALS. 500 students sitting in front of me. The second day when my knees started shaking. 500 students, it's a sea of heads. So even verbal communication is not something which comes very, very easily to us. We need to master those. So that's what the scenario is. So I wish I have been able to properly elaborate the idea here that yes, why economy should be driving politics rather than politics driving economy, right? Once the economic interest that starts controlling, when the political interest starts controlling economy, that becomes detrimental for the economy altogether, right? It's always better to leave the market as it is. Please don't poke too much within the market. Let the market play, it will play properly. See, from 1991 onwards, the idea that we have been mooting and the way, that we, the, the way we have been thinking, generally the idea is that the government has no business in doing business. The best role for the government is, at best to be a catalyst, catalyst of growth and development. These are two separate concepts. Growth is a separate concept, development is a separate concept. Being a student of sociology and being a teacher of Indian society, I must admit, we should be having these ideas clear. When we talk about growth, it's just a numerical growth or, or accumulation of wealth that we are looking at. Rate of growth of GDP. What will happen with rate of growth of GDP? We start chest thumping with, with Okay, okay, this is the rate of growth of GDP, that's there. What will happen with that? Unless and until the amount of wealth that has been accumulated, that wealth is now used for public good. Article 39B and 39C of Indian Constitution, DPSP. Take out your phones, search for 39B and 39C. It's 
practically against concentration of wealth, right? Someone was saying con about concentration of wealth. That whatever wealth is generated, that should be used for public good. That's the idea. That's the concept of development. Or else growth is just a numeric factor. Clear? That growth means nothing. Unless and until that enters into market benefits. Clear? So that's where the things stand. So please try and understand essentially the model of market economy and the model of socialistic development, they are not antagonistic to each other. No, they are not. They both want the common people to survive because at the end of the day, it is the common people who's going to be the consumer, is the common people who's also going to be the producer. I don't want the government to be a producer. If the government becomes a producer, nah, look at Indian Railways. That production process will never be sincere. Clear? And not just in India. You look at the railway system anywhere in any country. Talk about the railway system in USA. Hardly anyone uses that. Clear? So that's the condition. And by railway, I'm not talking about urban railway, metro railway, suburban railway. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about long distance transportation. Look at the services there. And across the world, not just India. So it's always preferable that the government should not be in production business. It should be the common person who should be the producer. It's the common person who should be the consumer as well. But for that, the common person needs to survive first. Clear? That's where the whole thing lies. Chalo, let's come back. Uh, this question was genuinely interesting. That's why I delved into it because this bordering between Indian society and Indian economy. They both are getting merged here. That's why I took it up here in the class. Okay. Achha, uh, we were talking about the economic crisis in Sri Lanka. That's the topic that we said that after the break we will start with. Fine. What happened in Sri Lanka? All of a sudden we came to know that the Rajapakse brothers are so bad. Three years back, 2019, election, they were having the Rajapakse brothers on their head and they were dancing. What happened all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. Why? This is not distress, this is disaster. Don't trivialize it. He stopped fertilizer import so that the parts of its import is going to fertilizer. Okay. Good, 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 good. Someone at least is conceptually on the right track. See what happened. Sri Lanka is considerably dependent on tourism. Nearly 16% of Sri Lanka's GDP comes from tourism. And as a result, a good amount of foreign exchange was earned through tourism. When people, they used to come to Sri Lanka for tourism purposes, they used to bring in foreign exchange with them. They used to spend that foreign exchange in Sri Lanka. And as a result, they used to earn good amount of foreign exchange through tourism. What happened with COVID-19, the tourism industry was particularly bad hit. Right? Tourism industry across the world got butchered. Result, that foreign exchange which used to come to Sri Lanka through tourism, that stopped. And this didn't stop in one year. This went on for two years. From March 2020 to March 2022, 
for two long years this this whole aspect it went on across the world right result by this two years yes foreign exchange reserve was in a very bad state in Sri Lanka now Sri Lanka as a country they were food self-sufficient no doubt but they were importing fertilizers pesticides uh, herbicides and everything from outside India and other countries China no doubt here I, I need to talk about one more aspect why the foreign exchange reserve has never been strong in Sri Lanka no exports is there they are one of the good exporters of tea right no this is this is a very wrong idea I have been hearing this that a lot of people they are saying that it's all about freebies it's all about the development model no it's not about the development model who's not a development oriented country who's not a welfare oriented model is USA not a ori welfare oriented model you tell me about Obamacare what was that free healthcare services do you know the person behind the actual brain behind Obamacare is an Indian who's also the brain behind RSBY, Rashtriya Swast Bhima Yojana, which has been re-Christian today as Ayushman Bharat. I had the privilege of interviewing him once. I know that person very closely. He is a former IS officer. He has also been India's school secretary at once. When RSBY was a major success, at first, the Obama administration requested him, Ki enough, you please come and join us. You resign there, come and join us. He refused. Then the Obama administration requested Dr. Manmohan Singh government, Ki please send him for three months to us on sabbatical. He went on a sabbatical to USA. He was the primary brain behind Obamacare. So is USA not a welfare model? This is a very wrong idea. If you can properly target your welfare model, your welfare model will become the primary force to generate wealth, for transfusion of wealth. There are two models of development. I was talking about development, right? See, two schools of economists. First school of economists, Welfare economists Amartya Sen and Jadre. Jadre also writes a lot of articles in the Hindu. You read his name as Jean Drez. It's actually Jadre, he's a French. Okay? What are they saying? Simple idea. If this is the population of India, give money to them. Gradually, this money will go up. The government gives money through welfare model, through DBT, direct benefit transfers to the common man. Is the common man going to eat the money? Is the common man going to take that money to Swiss bank account? The first thing the common man is going to do, he is going to buy something. Production increases. Please don't become a victim of propaganda. There are schools of people who just to justify their own point of view, talking a lot of nonsense. That has got nothing to do with academics. This is one model of development through direct benefit transfer. Do you know the primary tool because of which India had phenomenal success of bringing 
a lot of people out of the classes of poverty? MG Narega. And where did these people go? They became consumers. They became consumers which fooled Indian economy further. So what are you saying? You are saying this because you are looking at a passport size photograph. You are not even looking at the whole picture. See, again, you are talking about something where politics is driving economy. Hold. Right? The world runs in moderation. Too much of anything is bad. If you make a person drink too much of uh, the nectar, amrit as it is called, even that guy is going to die. Die out of indigestion. Right? Too much of anything is bad. You need to know when you need to stop. Right? The other model of development that we talk about is the growth model given by another economist, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati, called trickle down approach. The idea is give the money to them. Why? Because they'll invest the money. And the money will start coming down from this route. These are two models of development. The bottoms up approach called welfare model. The trickle down approach called growth oriented model. Two schools of economists, Amartya Sen and Jadre, Professor Jagdish Bhagavati. Problem is, this model has already proved itself to be a failure. Why? No. When you give money to them, it's never necessary that they are going to invest the money in this country's economy. They can take the money to somewhere else. In last three years, over 6 lakh high net worth individuals from India has shifted from India with their money. So the money that was given to them, that money did not got invested here in India, that money got invested elsewhere. So tell me the benefit to Indian economy. The government gives you say Bharat Biotech. I should not be taking any names here. Number of companies who got advantages from government of India. Low cost low interest loans, subsidized loans, big orders so that they thrive, they help Indian economy to grow. What happened? They took the advantage from India, from government of India, developed their business and took the money out of India then. So which model failed? And you're talking against welfare approach. Because you didn't study here. You've been living in a fool's paradise. Clear? These are two models of development that I'm looking at. Fine, let's come back. Now see what happened. No, this is not what happened in Sri Lanka. This is not a problem of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's problem lies somewhere way back. This started from the Mahinda Rajapaksa reign, 2010. What I'm looking at is, just now I was talking about confluence between Indian society and economy. Let's talk about confluence between international relations and economy. Debt trap diplomacy, China. Let's see what happened.
let's see how economy actually operates. See, economy is more like a wheel, a smooth running wheel. Don't poke too much to the wheel. Let it move. It, if it keeps on moving, it will move on in a very, very symphonic way. Let that operation go on. Let's see what happens. Say, government of India takes a good amount of loan, say $100 billion of loan from World Bank. Maybe a big uh, infrastructure project is coming up. All the major, all the capital cities are going to be connected by highway network. Right? From Delhi to Lucknow, Lucknow to uh, Patna, Patna to Kolkata, Kolkata to Bhubaneswar, Bhubaneswar to Hyderabad, Hyderabad to Bengaluru, Bengaluru to Chennai, Chennai to Tiruvandapuram. Maybe even crisscrossings are also happening. Right? So I'm looking at that kind of a highway network which is being built by the National Highway Authority of India, NHAI. And for that, the government of India takes $100 billion of loan from World Bank. See what happens as a result. See, what will NHAI do? They'll be the supervisory authority. They'll give this as contract to the other developers Say four developers got the contract. Larson and Tubro, DFL, right? D, uh, right? DFL, right? DLF, DLF, God knows some, some others, right? So four major developers, they got the contract to build this highway in phases, okay? What happens? NHAI, transfers this $100 billion to four different companies. Company A, Company B, Company C, Company D. What are they supposed to do? They are supposed to build highways, right? The first thing that these companies would do, they would hire engineers, civil engineers. Why? To do the survey. Do the survey from where the highway can be constructed to understand that. And then to design the highway. Right? So, jobs. First thing that they do, jobs. Hiring. Once that survey and everything is being done, even at the time of the survey, they, would, they need to do certain purchases. Why? How would these engineers move? For that, they need to buy jeeps and all these things, four-wheelers four -wheeler, four and all these things, so that the engineers and all, they can move freely. They need to field, uh, they need to construct field offices, right? So already an amount of investment would happen, right? Already purchase of automobile. Now they would purchase heavy earth movers, stone crushers, other raw materials that they need, cement, steel, and all of these things they would keep on purchasing. So they start purchasing raw materials. They would also be employing other people now. Why? Construction workers? Who would do the actual construction? All coming from China. Why? Example, right, let's talk about India first here. We'll go to Ch Sri Lanka later on. Okay. So these companies, they would be uh, recruiting laborers and workers, construction workers and all. So further job creation. Those people who are getting salaries and jobs and salaries, what would they do? 
Are they going to take the money back home and then start eating the money? They'll go and they'll spend the money. They themselves will start buying automobiles. They'll buy real estate. They'll buy fast moving consumer goods. They'll be buying fridge, they'll be buying uh, TV, AC machines. All of these things they'll be buying. What's happening? Production is increasing. See automobile here, automobile here. Across there would be automobiles. Result, production in automobile increases. So job increases in automobile sector now. When job increases in automobile sector, more people get hired. They also start getting bigger salary. They also start buying automobiles. Things start fooling each other. This is economy. So once you infuse the cash, that cash starts multiplying itself. Do you know what happens with the money that you put into your savings account? Multi money multiplier effect, that's what I'm talking about. Say there is a man having 1 lakh rupees in his bank account. What's the cash reserve ratio right now? 4.5, they have increased a little bit now recently 0.5 so out of this 1 lakh rupees the bank needs to keep 4.5 percent that is 4500 rupees with itself as cash then there would be SLR other aspects repo rate reverse, reverse repo but those are not cashes which are being stacked no Cash being stacked is only in the form of CRR, cash reserve ratio. The remaining amount, 95,500 rupees, the bank is free to give that amount as loan to someone else. And the bank does that. So you earned a salary of 1 lakh rupees, you put it in the bank. Out of that 1 lakh rupees, 4,500 rupees is written by the bank and the bank gives someone, some, some Mr. X as a loan of 95,500 rupees. That person gets the money, 95,500 rupees. Now he again makes, that, makes good use of that money and say whatever he does. Again, that money goes back to the bank. Again, some amount is kept back. Again, that, the rest of the amount is given as loan to someone else. So this money keeps on multiplying itself. That's called a money multiplier effect. That keeps on happening continuously. Same thing we are looking at here. The money is circulating in the hands of the common people. The money that was brought in as loan from World Bank, that money starts rotating again and again and multiplying itself. Within 10 years, this 100 billion dollars is going to give us an effect of 950 billion dollars. An infusion of 100 billion dollars in 10 years, if it gets a free circulation, would give us an effect of 950 billion dollars. Now tell me, can the government repay the loan with interest? Yes, they can. What would be the interest on, on this 100 billion dollars? Given India's credit rating of triple B minus, right? Given that credit rating, India would be getting loan at a rate of 16% around. 16 to 18% in between that. So after 10 years, India would be supposed to return back $226 billion. We have $950 billion. Let's repay back that $226 billion. What's the problem? No problem. You can return back that money. Right? This is what happens when a country takes loan from World Bank or any such organization. It actually helps 
to boost your economy, grow your economy, grow your economy further. As against this, let's look at the Chinese loans, as he was saying. China gives loan to a country with a condition. What is the condition? You can only employ Chinese companies to do the work. Chinese companies, number one, most of them, they are government-owned companies. Why? In most of the companies, 51% stake is of the government. Those which are in private sector, there are a few which are in private sector, chalo. Even those companies, they can come out of China, participate in the international economy under one condition. That they will be bringing raw material, labor and everything only from China. Here what happened? Government of India, they gave the orders to four Indian companies and the money got invested in Indian economy. When China gives loan to some country, what happens? That country gives the work to Chinese company and the Chinese company invests the whole money in Chinese economy. Because they do the hiring from China, they get the raw material from China, they get every tool from China. So where is the money getting invested? For practical purposes in economic terms, where is the money getting invested? In the economy of that country or in the economy of China? Just imagine China gave loan to you with its right hand and with the left hand took the money back. And not only they took the money back, now they're telling you, you still are supposed to pay me. This is Chinese loan. Now do you realize what's happening? When you take loan from a country or loan from a financial institute and you invest that money in your economy, your economy starts growing. But here in case of Chinese loans, your economy is not growing. China's economy grows. Because all these effects are happening where? In China, not in your country. All the money goes, returns back to China, not in your country. In 2010, in a sense, the Sri Lankan government, the then Sri Lankan government under Mahinda Rajapakse, Mahinda Rajapakse was the president at that point of time. That government became an international pariya, untouchable practically, rogue. Why? The amount of human rights violations that they did to end the civil war. I'm telling you two instances. Instance number one, where Sri Lankan soldiers used Tamilians as human shield against the LTT combatants. If the LTT combatants fire, these Tamilians will, will face the bullet. And from behind these Tamilians, the Sri Lankan soldiers will be shooting back, killing these Tamilians. Instance number two, this was actually aired in BBC and then BBC asked for forgiveness. This video is no more in circulation. I'm talking about a 10 year old boy in Jaffna, one of the camp fell. In that camp, a 10 year old boy in 2009, that boy was 10 years old, the only son of a person called Bhelupillai Prabhakaran, the head of LTTE. This boy was there in that camp and this boy was obviously, he, he, he was rescued, he, was, he got into the hands of the Sri Lankan soldiers. In the beginning of the video, we are seeing that the boy was sitting on a bench at a corner, very scared. One of the soldiers gave the boy some apple or some fruit to eat. The boy was eating that fruit. Now the BBC reporter and the videographer, they went somewhere else to see the whole camp. 
what is there in the camp, the weapons which were recovered and everything. All of a sudden, they heard sound of bullets being fired. They came rushing. When they came back, what are they seeing? That boy was lying dead in a pool of blood. The boy was just lying dead on the field, on, on the floor, and there was blood everywhere. Later on, the government of Sri Lanka said that the boy died at the time of fighting. He was a collateral damage, a casualty of war. Really? The only fault of that boy was that his father's name was Velupillai Prabhakaran. As a result, no one was ready to do any dealings with Sri Lanka at that point of time. And China loves these kind of countries. They're helpless, they need support. No country in the world can survive alone. They need support. What did China do? China gave Sri Lanka a loan of $8.4 billion. Sri Lanka is an economy of $56 billion. Look at the size of the loan, one-seventh of Sri Lanka's economy, not GDP, Sri Lanka's whole economy. Clear? That's the amount of loan that was given by the Chinese to Sri Lanka for two ports. They were going to build two ports. Colombo Port City Project and Hambantota Port Project. Two ports are going to be built for $8.4 billion. And again, the Chinese loan. Right? Problem is, oh, fine, this $8.4 billion came actually when the audit was done in 2015. It was found out $1 billion has gone missing. Mahindra Raja Pakse, good man. Do you think only your politicians are good people? There are good politicians everywhere. So, $1 million went missing. Two thousand fifteen. Sri Lankan government would say that th there was a new government which came into power. Maitri Pala Sirisena government that came into power in Sri Lanka. That government would say, ki, see, number one, there has been financial irregularities. One billion dollar has gone missing. Right? You, China, you have been giving the money. You can't say where the money has gone. Right? And one billion dollar is missing and the government of Sri Lanka will, repay, will have to repay back you that money. First, we would like to know where that $1 billion has gone. And then at the same point of time, every norm, environmental norms, postal norms, every norms have been violated in Hambantota and Colombo Port City project. So we would like to stop the project. Five years, they say that we are going to stop the project. Achha, one more thing. Chinese loans, they're like China itself come with an interest rate of 6%. Normally, when a friend gives loan to another friend, they don't charge much interest. You have to charge interest. If you don't charge interest, in international, according to international laws, that, that is not a loan. That becomes a grant. If it is a loan, you have to charge interest. That's why India charges interest of 0.1%. Because you have to charge interest. China charge, charges interest of 6%. China's friendship is also like Chinese products in India, I mean. So anyway, so after five years, Sri Lankan government, they stopped the construction of Hambantota port project. They said we are not going forward with this port project. China says, fine, it's your country. But then return us back the money in full with interest. Interest of five years. Fixed interest of 6% per annum for five years. 30%? $8.4 billion. 
So another 2.4 billion dollars. 2.8, right. 2.8 or 2.4? 2.8, good. So now tell me. Right? It was in this backdrop that the whole play was going on. India would finally give Sri Lanka a loan, a soft loan of $5 billion. Sri Lanka will pay some of the loan back. But even then, the controlling right of Hambantota will completely pass on to the Chinese. 99 years of lease, it was far worse previously. I'm not getting into the whole details right now. Why? Because there was a freehold land as well. Sri Lanka was at least able to negotiate because the money that was given by India to Sri Lanka and because that money they returned back, they were able to negotiate. There was 21 hectares of freehold land. That land at least they have recovered. They said no freehold land. This 99 years of lease is still good. There was supposed to be 21 hectares of land for freehold basis forever. But the controlling authority for Hambantota port project has completely passed on to the Chinese. It was this time, since this time, that Sri Lanka's foreign exchange reserve started dwindling. This is the first thing that caused foreign exchange crisis in Sri Lanka. And since then, they are still grappling. It was in this backdrop that the COVID-19 pandemic came in. So now do you realize why this, this crisis became so severe at a time? All these things they are accumulating, they are collecting, they are getting collected. Already the economy was in a bad, sh bad state, bad shape and now comes the COVID-19 pandemic and they have to repay back to China. And one more thing that happened, 2019 election, Rajapaksas came back to power, relation with India started deteriorating. So the former help that was be, be, being available from India, that help stopped, not stopped, but that help got reduced, substantially got reduced. Right? And in this backdrop, they are importing fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, everything, even farm machines from outside, from China and from India. Clear? So just imagine already their foreign exchange reserve is in a bad state. In addition to that, they are importing too much for food production in the country. It was in this backdrop that the Rajapakse brothers, right now who is the president? Gotabaya Rajapakse. In 2010, Gotabaya Rajapakse was the defense minister. Mahinda Rajapakse was the president. Right? All in the family. Anyway, so now Gotabaya Rajapaksa is the president, Mahinda Rajapaksa is the prime minister. That's uh, the younger brother who's half Sri Lankan, half American. Yeah, he's an American passport holder. That guy is. Anyway, so no, he has been removed anyway. Finally, he has been removed. Chalo, whatever it might be, let's not get into the di dynasty again. We all already have a good amount of dynasties here in India. So anyway, Gotabaya Rajapaksa is the president and Mahindra Rajapaksa is the prime minister. Right? And they only, they decided, ki, okay, uh, fine, the amount of help we were taking from India, let's reduce that. Okay. And not only that, all of a sudden they would decide that we are going to revolutionize Sri Lankan agriculture. Guys, agriculture of a country is something which is always slow moving. Don't try to do anything drastic with agriculture ever. In the history of the world, previously two countries tried to do this. All of a sudden revolutionizing agriculture. And the effect has been very bad. The 
फर्स्ट कंट्री टू ट्राई रेवल्यूशनाइज एग्रीकल्चर वॉज सोवियत यूनियन नाइनटीन Soviet Union would all of a sudden decide Joseph Stalin the then head of Soviet Union he would all of a sudden decide that I am going to bring in cooperative system commune system of agriculture when this sudden revolution was brought in the whole agricultural system collapsed and the worst hit was the most agriculturally prosperous region called Ukraine today why so why does this happen let's talk about india merely 17% of 17 17% of india's gdp comes from agriculture right but 60% of the workforce is engaged there that's directly you know taking the allied sector i need to take the allied sector right farm processing processing of the of, of the farm producers and everything where would go that so I'm, i would be including directly and indirectly the whole workforce there because if the production agricultural production gets hampered where goes their job those who are who are processing the farm farm food what would they be doing those in, those workers engage in fertilizer production what would they do for whom would be they producing the fertilizer if there is no consumer even their job will go into vain economy bro everything is interconnected so obviously when i'm looking at the agriculture sector i'm looking at those who are directly and indirectly in engaged in that and that workforce is 60% so if anything goes wrong with agriculture sector 60% of the households are going to be affected do you realize that that's where the problem lies the second country who tried to do this china itself 1958 Mao Zedong all of a sudden would decide ki i am going to revolutionize chinese agriculture 16 lakh people died no one cares though communist countries who cares for them these are small sacrifices made for the collective good 16 lakh people gone and now this time sri lanka decided will revolutionize our agriculture good do it problem with the two forms of agriculture is organic agriculture might be good to hear production is 60% less what you produce if you convert into organic farming the production all of a sudden comes down to 40% of of the original produce so now tell me about food security in the country previously the country which was food self sufficient all of a sudden because of that 60% slash 60% drop in production now that country became forced to buy food from outside they stopped buying fertilizer from outside to save for an exchange now they are forced to buy food from outside in any way their foreign exchange reserve got exhausted and started food scarcity now do you realize what happened in sri lanka always break the problems right and please don't get carried away by what you think is right let people say what what is happening there if you start living in a world built by you yourself that's a fool's paradise please please come out of it clear so that's how the things are to be looked at this is what happened in sri lanka
the Sri Lankan economic crisis. Okay. One more thing that is brewing is uh, the ethnic clash in Darfur, South Sudan. Although that's quite a negative report, I don't think that much attention should be given to that. Uh, by the way, uh, those uh, material that that material that I told you about, I've already passed it on to the to the institute. Right? It should be made available to you shortly. Okay. Uh, a lot of issues have been listed there. Please go through them. Right? And what I have done is, wherever possible, I have been using the the what to say the links of the various news reports as well. So take out those news reports, use those links, go, go to those links, mostly I have been using Hindu, right? Go to those links, read what's there. Clear? Chill. Any question? First of all, for such a long period of time, we have been talking about uh, all these issues. Now, your confusion from any of these issues and then I'll be moving towards the last topic that is about the death penalty that's the death penalty row that's going on in a brief see what what they made the mistake is they didn't rely on the technical experts the technical experts in Sri Lanka, they kept on warning them, please don't do that, please don't do that. What happens when you have the numerical superiority in the parliament? At times you feel, I can do anything, I'm the, I'm the god. And you start ignoring the technical experts. Never do that. If you start ignoring the technical experts, the technical experts know the field. That's what their job is. If you start ignoring the technical experts, you'll always get into that fool's paradise. That's what happened with the Rajapaksa brothers. Just imagine the country which was worshipping the Rajapaksa brothers two years back, today they are calling for their heads. That's what is happening right now. There is continuous call for the Rajapaksa brothers to resign, Fresh elections, maybe someone can bring back Sri Lanka from the clutches where they have gone into. Right? Just tell me now, what were they thinking when they when they stopped importing fertilizers and pesticides? Fine, but to, to reduce the export bill, you actually increase the export bill. Because fertilizers, pesticides, raw material, their prices were cheaper then food, which is a manufactured product, its price would always be higher. Right? Raw materials are always cheaper in that respect. So now when you're importing wheat, when you're importing rice, when you're importing pulses from outside, that will be costing you more. That they never took into consideration. Why? They're the god. They can do anything. This is a typical example of what you said. Politics driving the economy. Yeah. And for your information, Sri Lanka has already failed to, re to repay one of the installments. So they are officially one of the defaulters. It will keep on rising now. Unless and until they get a good uh, hefty amount of uh, infusion of cash all of a sudden, this will keep on growing for the time being. There's a problem with economy. When the economy is on the upswing, it will keep on giving you good results. Continuously, it will keep on giving you good results. When it is on the downswing, that bad result will also start multiplying. So right? Of cash. See, if you if they start printing cash right now this is a problem that that i i would be saying because even number of ministers in india they all of a sudden said okay no, not an issue we can print cash is it a paper, piece of paper 
If you start printing cash like anything, what will happen, you know. After a point of time, you'll burn those cash. Uh, yeah, Zimbabwe. You'll start burning the cash and you'll, you'll be, uh, during winters, you'll be, you'll be taking heat from that cash. Because that cash will lose all its value. Do you know how money is valued? Th there are two measures. Previously, before 1974, there was a measure called gold standard. Right? For every one rupee that was printed by the RBI, yes, they stored or they kept aside equivalent amount of gold. Gold which they could then hedge in case of any crisis. Right? Today, you take out any note and in the note, there will be a statement. I assure to pay the bearer the sum of whatever the denomination of the note is and then the signature of the governor of RBI. Well, not on the one rupee notes. Finance minister. On the one rupee notes, the finance minister used to sign. Okay. Anyway, let's come back to what we were talking about. So before 1974, it was gold standard. The money was hedged against gold standard. The promise that was made, that was made against that amount of gold that was kept aside. Say 10,000 rupee notes were printed. As against the 10,000 rupees, equivalent amount of gold was set aside and the note, the currency notes of 10,000 rupees were issued in the market. Right? That system has changed. Yep. Not just dollar, four currencies. A basket of four currencies are used. Dollar, Euro, uh, the pound, pound sterling, and 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 and, and uh, no, ja Japanese yuan, yen or yuan, yuan is uh, Chinese, right? Yen, Japanese yen. These are the four currencies which create the basket, and against this basket, the money is hedged. Why? Because these are the four currencies which are most stable. That's what is understood. That impact of inflation and deflation on these currencies are the least. That's why they are taken as the as the basket, and against them, the dollar price uh, or rupees is hedged. So, if one rupee is being issued by the RBI, equivalent amount of foreign exchange is being set aside by the RBI. If that money, if that currency is not there in the hands of the RBI, this rupee note is valueless. It's just a piece of paper. So you can't print money if you just feel like. If you do that, your currency will be devalued grossly. And after a point of time, it will become valueless. And there will be huge inflation in the country. Zimbabwe, the best example. They, they started printing trillion, trillion uh, Zimbabwean, uh, whatever the Zimbabwean dollar, right? One trillion dollar note. And the value of that one trillion dollar note was of one rupee coin here in India. It's better to burn that note than having it in the purse. Clear? Well, this is because of the distribution or separation of power in, in Sri Lanka, right? Sri Lankan constitution says that certain area of, of the operation, say economy, foreign policy, defense, right? Telecommunication, internal security, number of such areas, they are solely in the hands of the president. The Prime Minister looks after only the internal development. Healthcare, education, these are the areas which are in the hands of the Prime Minister. Unlike India, in India it is the Prime Minister who is directly elected by the electorate, by the common people. The President is not directly elected, right? That's why the legitimacy of the Prime Minister is more in India. 
president can be the head of the state but the president is not directly elected by the common people that's why the president does not rule here in india he is a symbolic head of the nation he is a prime minister who holds the power here in india because he is directly elected by the people in sri lanka both of them are directly elected by the people both the president and the prime minister and the way we have the seventh schedule here separating power between center and state similarly in sri lanka they have separation of power between president and prime minister so the areas that they have failed in are the areas which are actually looked after by the president but actually the anguish is against the rajapaksa family as such that they collectively they have failed clear anything else no chalo let's take up the last topic the next topic what's the issue with this uh, death penalty what's going on see this this discussion has been going on since long this is not a new discussion the idea is whether the state has the right to take someone's life or not let's talk about in details right because the law the legal system that you're talking about this legal system is a colonial legal system the colonial masters always had the right to take away whatever you have if they could they could have taken away your shirt as well right anyway so let's not talk about the legal procedure let's talk about the ethical and moral dimension here what we call as social consciousness and social conscience should the state have the power to take away someone's life that's the question 2009 law commission report states uh, it was 49 or something of that so i'm lo losing the number right now that report states that the state should not be having the right to take away anyone's life that's the idea of the national law commission why can we give someone the life back the person whose life you're taking away say you gave death penalty to a person you took the life of that person after 10 years new evidences came in which showed that the person was innocent or there was reasonable doubt on the verdict that was passed can you return back the life of that person based on this argument in most of the developed nations capital punishment has already been banned okay even in usa in a number of states they have banned capital punishment capital punishment is not awarded in those particular states of united states of america fine that's their issue let's not talk about that let's talk about our concern even here gradually the first case i would be talking about is bachchan singh versus state of punjab 1980 when for the first time this power to award death penalty in the hands of the court was questioned Yeah. as is understood in chapter 28 of criminal procedure code it states that if a sessions court first of all it has to be a session court which can award the death penalty so the sessions court in one particular case said that no there should not be any death penalty in this particular case and the case goes to the high court and the high court gives death penalty no the high court cannot originally give death penalty or the supreme court cannot originally give death penalty the first right and the only right to give death penalty is in the hands of the sessions court the lower court 
But even in those cases where the lower court is giving death penalty, that has to be validated by a high court. When the sessions court gives death penalty, mandatorily the state has to take that case to the high court. That the lower court, the sessions court has given death penalty. You please look into it whether this person should be given death penalty or not. Right? On validation, the high court may keep the death penalty, may remove the death penalty. Right? Even when the high court validates the death penalty, this case can be taken to Supreme Court on further appeal. Right? First of all, from single bench of high court, it will go to the division, uh, double bench or triple bench. Right? And then from there, it can again go to the Supreme Court. Doesn't matter. If throughout, death penalty is carried forward, even then there is a system of recuse existing. Pardon. Where the person who has been awarded death penalty can appeal before, before the president of India to be pardoned. Right? Now we know our president for all practical purposes is a rubber stamp. Okay. To the president means ultimately the president's office transfers it to the Ministry of Home Affairs. The Ministry of Home Affairs looks into every nitty gritty whether the person can be pardoned or not and then gives its recommendation to the president of India and the president behaves accordingly. Right? See even there a reasonable restriction has been put by the Supreme Court in the recent past. What happened? One of our former presidents, APJ Abdul Kalam, he was personally completely against death penalty. So what he did when he was the president, all the recommendations by the Ministry of Home Affairs, whenever someone appealed to him for pardon, those requests for pardon went to the Ministry of Home Affairs. The Ministry of Home Affairs in most of the cases rejected and sent it back to the president for the president to sign. Right? And deny the pardon. APJ Abdul Kalam, he used one of his veto powers, pocket veto, that he has, that he had. Right? Since he was against death penalty, morally and ethically, so what he did, he used pocket veto. He never took any call on the death penalty cases. Whenever, and, and those people, they, they remained in jail, practically enjoying pardon. Right. This same practice was carried forward by the next president, Pratibha Devi Singh Patil. Right. She also followed the same tradition of APJ Abdul Kalam. After Pratibha Devi Singh Patil, Pranam Mukherjee became the president. Pranam Mukherjee was a former finance minister, okay? And he knew the expense that was being borne by the exchequer for keeping safe some of the verdicts like Ajmal Kasab and others. So the moment Pranam Mukherjee became the president, what he did, he started signing on the <laughs> rejection of the pardon that was there. And one after another, all those pending cases were getting cleared. First, Aj Ajmal Kasa was hanged. Then, uh, Afzal Guru's case that was also uh, disposed of by the president. So, a number of such cases came and the pres president, he just rejected them. And things went ahead like that. Now, the Supreme Court realized that things are going beyond control. The Supreme Court would intervene and the Supreme Court would say that, see, in those cases where the president, even the president's office, has been sitting idle on the appeal for pardon for too long. That also in a sense is a violation of Article 21, right to life with dignity. Because personal liberty won't come into this. That was already there. 
Yeah. Yeah. Number of such cases are there. Okay. So the Supreme Court would come out with a verdict that in those cases where the president has not taken a call early enough. Okay. In these cases, the, the stipulated period has not been given. Okay. Said early enough. The Supreme Court says that in these cases, this amounts to violation of right to life with dignity. Because if a man or, a, or someone who's living with the fear of being hanged, where is the dignity in that living? The president's office is violating that article 21, right to life with the dignity in this case. So in those cases where the president's office is, has not taken the decision fast enough, it will be assumed that they have been pardoned or their death penalty has been commuted. Yep. All these restrictions are already there. It is in this backdrop, this whole debate is again making a round. Where we know that even the Supreme Court has taken up a Suomoto action. They have, they have raised a Suomoto case. Let's see what the verdict comes out to be. Yep. So that's all about this particular issue as well. Please keep an eye on this topic. Right? If, if the verdict comes out pretty soon, we may expect questions from here. That's why I, I rake this issue up. Clear? Um, even for Indian society, uh, I'm, what do I see? I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, we have 10 minutes left. At least uh, till one, we can stretch the class. Chalo, uh, can we take up one more issue here? Right. In the recent times, we are seeing that so many dignitaries from Britain, they are coming to India. Right? First, our external affairs minister, he had a talk with the British, his, his uh, British counterpart. Then, then uh, this uh, Boris Johnson, he also came, took a ride of the JCBs. Right? Uh, why? Why Britain is so much, so keen about India? What's happening? This is the impact of Brexit. We were anticipating these things long back. This was supposed to happen a long time back. Didn't happen. See, post Brexit, the British companies, they lost a good share of the European market. Right? In the, if they don't take immediate measures, if they don't, don't take immediate steps, in the long run, this can if impact the British economy badly. So they need a good market. And then that good market still exists in India. In India, we have a considerable middle class population. And the market is always the middle class. Let's see why I'm saying this. Right? We did this exercise in, in Indian society class, I think. Say a person having 2,000 crore rupees, isn't he a good market? One person have worth 2,000 crore rupees. See what's happening. The person has 2,000 crore rupees. So I assume he would be having at least three houses. A guy of 2,000 crore rupees, three houses, banta hai yaar, right? So tell me how many refrigerators will he buy? Chalo, 10. A person like me, gosh, I have that much of money. One refrigerator for non-veg items only, getting recorded anyway. Yeah, I'm a non-vegetarian, can't help it, sorry. One only for ice creams, cold drinks, and something else. Let's not specify. Okay. One for hospice. So three refrigerators at least in a house. Three houses, nine refrigerators. One maybe in a car. For good things. Ten. 
can't have any more refrigerators here. Can't think of. 10 at max. Achha, chalo, tell me how much, how many television sets will he buy? Three houses. Five televisions per house. Chalo. 15 televisions. Maybe two in the cars. Those small screen ones. Can't buy more than that. How many cars can he buy? 7, 8, 9, 10, 15, 20. <laughs> Petrol prices will make him poor, yeah. <laughs> 2000 crore rupees only. <laughs> Petrol prices are 100 rupees, uh, 120 rupees, 125 rupees. Excuse him, please. <laughs> Not 20. Okay, 10 max. Okay. Now let's divide these 2000 crore rupees into packets of 50 lakh rupees. To how many people can we give those packets? 4000. 50 lakh. So from a high net worth individual, I'm delving typically into middle class. 50 lakh per household, everything included. How many refrigerators? 4,000 refrigerators. How many television sets? 4,000. How many cars? Small cars maybe. 4,000. Tell me which is a market. Clear? High net worth individuals are not the market. Middle class is the market. Clear? So, and obviously the policy makers they know that in India we have good amount of middle class. So this is a market. And I'm looking at the post-Brexit scenario in Britain. Now do you realize why Boris Johnson never asked any tough question to Mr. Modi? Why he was riding the JCB? As simple as that. This was anticipated, this was expected, it's happening. Clear? That's the scenario here. So there's no reason for, whenever you see something happening, now, please try and understand why that thing is happening. Right? And normally in Western Hemisphere, economy is still the driver of the politics. Right? So in that sense, even in Japan and China, economy is still the driver of politics. Those places where politics has, has become the driver of economy, do know that place is already doomed. And one more thing, we are looking at this crisis in Sri Lanka, right? Nepal and Bhutan are also on the same path. Be careful. Next set of news is going to come from Nepal and Bhutan. So be careful about that from right now. Keep an eye on that, on those developments. Okay? That's all about what we had to discuss here. Chalo, thank you class and all the best. Okay.
Yes. Welcome. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, got stuck in traffic. Yes, uh, all our new faces here. I am Dr. Vinay. I am a medical doctor. I have been dealing with a multiplicity of subjects across time and breadth, length and breadth of Hyderabad and across the country. And thank you for being here. And I would always wish positive for your outcomes of the forthcoming preliminary examination. And here we'll be talking about one component of your preliminary examination, which is your environmental studies, otherwise the ecological studies. You get it? Yes. So here, we have few basic things. What you get in the examination is always, always, almost, let it be any subject for the matter, what you see in the newspapers as contemporary developments or issues or recent happenings or current affairs, whatever you call them as, they would be the tip, the so-called contemporary. And please remember, though you might have a similar kind of thing in the examination as a question, the knowledge of these contemporary issues alone will not be sufficient for you to answer that. Please understand this. Uh, by now, probably you are familiar with all these things. Yes? So this is something called as what? The news per se. Please understand this. And most of you or most of the aspirants who are about to write the prelims would assume that this is what you need to study. And that's what many of the aspirants would be busy with the, the Hindu newspaper almost all the time. You understand this? That's a mistake most of the people do here because there is something deeper like a nice work so this is the core, the basic concept, the fundamentals. And this is where your day-to-day -day life, you understand this? So this is where you learn in school works. You all have studied all these things in school. Please understand this. It's a kind of revision what you study in the classrooms of as coaching institutes. This is what you experience on your day-to-day -day basis, application. And any recent happening must always, almost always, be connected with these two things. You understand this? That is how you can answer your questions in the preliminary examination. And let me give you a bitter pill first. I'm spoiled by the virtue of my education and experience that let's give a bitter pill first. You have two approaches to your prelims, please understand this. A need-based approach and a greed-based approach. You understand this? Now, need-based, yes, we'll come to that later. But most of the people have this greed-based approach. So that, let's revise entire environmental studies in this session. What is that? You understand this? Let's have a quick revision so that we'll be prelims ready in this class itself. What is that? Just if you study current affairs, the prelims preparation is over. Are you able to understand this? By attending this class, we can learn about all contemporary issues concerned with the environment. What is that again? Let me give you a bitter pill, as I said. Truth is bitter, always. Do you understand that? Don't expect all these things to happen. Let it be any given subject for that matter. And don't expect that a single person would know everything about any given subject. You understand this? Don't be greedy. It's practically not possible. It is one individual against one institution there. Let it be any given person as an individual will not know everything about any given subject or everything about any contemporary developments concerned with the subject. So no single source can cover all contemporary developments which may be required for your preliminary examination. Please understand this. You get it? 
and then. You don't have to know everything. You get it? You don't have to know 100% of everything. Please understand this. 55% you are through the prelims. Understand that. You get it? You have to stop somewhere. There are some limitations. You have to accept them. Be realistic. Be practical. Instead of complaining, judging, get used to the reality that I upon that 55 to 60 percent and don't let it go out of your hand. You get it? At least be sure about the 60 percent of the content. Don't worry about the rest of the 40 percent of the content. Don't focus on what you don't have or what you cannot have. Focus on what you can always. So the, the basic things and please remember everything would boil down to basic concept. Everything will boil down to application. Whatever you read in the news. For example, there is something called as AR6 as a contemporary development. Hope you are aware of this. Let me remind you this class will have its own limitations like every other of such sessions. Don't expect that we'll be starting from ultra basics and then we'll be going towards your exam oriented or the most important or guaranteed questions kind of things. That's a myth come out of it. Do you understand that? That's never going to happen. Let it be any program offered by any institution by any person. You get it? We have time limitations. In general we consume around 40 or 50 plus hours to discuss about these concepts. Contemporary developments will not be included. That will consume 10 to 15 more hours to cover everything. And don't expect that you learn everything within 3 to 4 hours. It's practically not possible. I'm giving you a bitter pill first. If you can take it in, you're welcome. Yes? So, everything would be connected towards the core concept. When we say the assessment report, the latest one of IPCC, so the core concept goes back to what? IPCC. And then it goes back to what? The UNEP. And only then you can understand why June 5th is. You understand this? And what, what is this product of? Then we have something called as what? The Stockholm Conference. What is that? On human environment. What led to this? Then again you'll have to go back to what? The Club of Rome. So this IPCC's assessment report 6 is what you see in the news. And the question can span or go back and forth from 1969 till date. That is what you don't see in the newspaper. And that would be stressed in the question. You understand this? So uh, by the virtue of my experience we can say that this is the major problem for most of you you would face in the preliminary examination. You understand this? Questions would never be asked or option, options, answer options would be never, never be from whatever you have studied. You get it? So that's, that's a small uh, thing which you can think of if you are serious about your prelims. Yes. Getting back. So here we have few components which will make things easier for you. Number one is the fundamental concepts of environment and ecology. Fundamental concepts like biotic, abiotic components and all these things and then you have governing principles and then you have the structure and functions of ecosystems and then you have these food chains, food webs and all these things, yes, biotic interactions, fundamental concepts which will end by ecological succession, basics. And in the recent past we don't have direct questions from them. So but fundamental, very fundamental concepts. Number two is what you have something called as the environmental degradation. Now this occurs in two forms. Number one is short term reversible environmental degradation which is referred in by the term of what? Pollution. 
And long term irreversible, largely irreversible. Please understand this. Environmental degradation, which is in the form of what? Yes. We will study in this second discussion. In general, you would study about them. The second discussion would be in your studies, environmental degradation. Short term, reversible. Long term, irreversible. And most of the questions would be from this because of international efforts put forth by international organizations. You get most of the questions till the Glasgow, the recent COP 26, Glasgow. So till that, that means they start from 1969 and they go back or they, they come up to 2021. And most of the questions, when you refer to previous exams, you would find from this, this area, and very few from this area. For example, you have something called as the Global Methane Report. If you want to understand that, you have to have an idea of how methane and why methane is considered as a pollutant first, then a potent greenhouse gas later. That lies in basic concept of pollution here. Please understand this. Yes? So we'll talk about them. And the third component is what? Something called as the biological diversity and conservation. Of late, we are getting more questions. What do you mean by more questions? In general, if you have approximately on average 17 questions. So the number of questions from this area, that is environmental studies, never went lesser than 10 in the recent past, please understand this. And it could be as much as 30 questions as well. 2014, between 2014 and 2018, you had average 22 questions from environmental studies in the preliminary exam, please understand this. In GS paper, preliminary, you had 22, average 22 questions from one small domain. So you can understand the relative significance or importance you need to give to this area. Yes. So uh, I'm assuming that this is not the beginning of this session. So this is the last one of such sessions. Biological diversity and conservation. And then of course, if you have any, you may have some basic elements like the environmental impact assessment or sustainable development. I bet these are present in multiple areas of general studies. Yes. So, most number of questions come from these two chapters. Please understand this. So, environmental degradation and biological diversity, that is conservation. Largely from IUCN and the IUCN red data, so all those things. You understand this? And there was a thing, for example, I'll just mention that. There's something called as the barometer. You understand this? So, biological barometer, environmental barometer or ecological barometer. You know, barometer, the pressure, you know that atmosphere, basic things. But what is biological or environmental barometer? The IOCN red data list is called as barometer. You understand this? For that, you have to have the basic knowledge of what is IOCN? What are the different categories, nine different categories of IOCN? You will understand. So that is where the link goes here. Please understand that. The most important feature of your preparation to make your preparation comprehensive would be an integrated approach. That means you have to link up all possible subjects in the general studies, link up the fundamental concepts, applications and contemporary developments. Only then your preparation would become comprehensive. You cannot study individual subjects in an isolated manner and still assume that your preparation is comprehensive. Please understand. That would never happen. Each and every subject will have intricately intertwined with the other subjects will have a connection, interrelatedness, interdependency with another subject in general studies. Please understand this. So that is why an IAS officer would be able to perform multiple roles, whatever are thrown at that person in the society once recommended. You understand this? Because your preparation would connect all possible domains of people's lives. And naturally, UPSC expects your answers be multi-dimensional in nature. When can your answers be multi-dimensional? Whenever you have this interconnected, interlinking method of preparation. Please understand this. So that is what you have to do. 
So don't assume that economy has got no link with biology and biological diversity has got no link with geography. No, that never happens, please understand. Everything is connected, whether you know or not. Yes. So we'll try to focus on these important areas. That's what we have been told to follow. Important areas, contemporary developments. Please remember the biggest constraint, let it be in preparation or in the exam, is time. The biggest constraint is time. Please remember this. So your exam is about how do you manage time, please understand. Otherwise, your preliminary exam is not an exam. People who are acquainted with me would already know this. My next statement would be in their mind. Yes? What is that line? Preliminary examination is not an examination. I know what I'm talking about. Don't worry about my mental condition. You understand this? Question is given. Answer is also given. Damn it. You call it as an exam? See your faces. Ha, come on, change it. Look at yourself in the mirrors. And you started assuming that this is the toughest exam on the planet Earth. Do you understand this? This is not an exam at all. It's a joke. UPSC is cracking jokes upon you. By giving question and answer. And same question paper to all. But that's the second joke. That means you can see the question. You can as well see the answer. Yes or no? And you know, third joke, you fail in it. How's that? So who are you? Joker. It's a choice. <laughs> Anyways, it's a choice to be a joker. And you chose to be here. Look at you. Life is a choice, trust me. Yes? Uh, as usual, I say, our orthopedics professor used to say, what is that? Your eyes cannot see what your brain doesn't know. As simple as that. That's over. Though something is in front of your eyes, you can't see it. Your eyes can't see what your brain doesn't know, though it is in front of you. That's what is happening here. It's not a test of your eyesight, damn it. You get it? It's a test of your cognitive abilities. Sorry, it is not a test of intelligence. Did you get it? It is a test of skill. What is that skill? Memory. Do you understand this? So that's how it is. That is what your preparation must include. You get it? So it's about, preparation is about looking at something not with just eyes. You understand this? For that you need vision beyond vision. What is that vision? It is required intellectual vision, not ocular vision or optical vision. Do you understand that? Now that's the, the simplest thing you need to observe here in preliminary examination. Yes. So and then the next thing what I want to say in preliminary examination, please understand this, that no two people will have same question paper. Okay, I know what's happening in your brains. What am I talking about? We have same question paper, isn't it? If you say that all people get same question paper, things would be different. Some people get recommended, some people don't. Because the way you look at the question paper is different. Please understand this. When the way you look at it changes, question paper changes. Are you able to understand this? Same question paper is very tough for someone, moderately tough for somebody else, very easy for someone, and a joke for somebody else. Do you think all of you got same question paper? Now? Definitely not. Are you able to understand this? So look at that. There is nothing called as universal strategy to crack prelims. Please understand this. There is no universal, common, workable, guarantee strategy in prelims. Please understand this. So next time, don't go and ask somebody that how to prepare for prelims. There won't be a bigger joker than you on the planet Earth. Trust me. You get it? 
it's, it's next to impossible to have same strategy for two people. Question paper is not same. Question and answer both are given. You can't see one. You understand this? So observe these basic things and develop your own strategy here. Yes? Some basic elements. Okay. Can we have the projector working? Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Not sure. So all of you are giving this year's prelims? Seriously? Let's see. It's visible. Is it visible to the last benches? You have sharp eyesight. Or you have another screen there. Yes. Okay. So, contemporary issues. Yes. Please remember, as we said, it is practically not possible to cover all contemporary issues within the next two to three hours. You have to understand this first. So that you may not complain that not everything was covered in the class. You understand this? Be prepared for it. There is nothing called as completion of preparation for UPSC civil service exam. You have to accept these, you know. These are bitter, these are realities. At no point in time, one aspirant can ever say that preparation is complete. You understand this? That never gets completed. There is no completion. And there is no completion for multiple people at the same time. You get it? You stop or you need to stop at some point. Because it would be over for you, overwhelming for you. That's where you stop. And again, the most important element here is time, time constraint. When would you say that your preparation is done? You can't prepare any more. From that point onwards, questioning starts. Yes. So, contemporary issues, as we said, most of the issues would focus on number one, climate change. Number two, biological diversity and conservation. Because around 75% of your questions from environmental studies would come from these two areas. Please understand this. You get it? So we'll try to focus on few important areas. Yes? So one of such things. Why have selected? Because the IPCC has got the linkages to all possible elements of climate change. Please understand this. IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the product of UNEP. So for you to understand what is this journey, just have a look at a simple element here. You can see here. You understand this? So this is the journey of multiple milestones in the domain of climate change. And here, one basic element, number one, which is called as a 
conference. Conference is just like as we are meeting now, people meet, meet and greet. You understand this? That's a conference and people talk. Next, whenever upon talking, people arrive at rational, meaningful and legally binding outcomes. Such a legally binding outcome of a conference is in general called as a convention. Implementation mechanisms of these conventions in general are termed as protocols. Just remember these things. Meeting, meet, greet, conference. Legally binding outcomes of any given conference is a convention. Implementation mechanisms of any given convention is called as a protocol. Till date, climate change has got only one protocol. Please understand this. That's not very difficult for you. That's Kyoto. There is no other protocol. Please understand this. Concern with climate change. We have one in making. That is 2015 Paris. But that's not yet a protocol. Please understand this. It is still in making. And for biological diversity, we have only two protocols, which are outcomes of CBD 1992, for those protocols, Cartagena and Nagoya. That's it. We have no other protocol concerned with conservation of biological diversity except two, Cartagena and Nagoya. If at all there are any others, you'll have them here. What are they? Just a kind of brief focus here. This is your the formation of United Nations Environment Program on June 5th. And you know the significance because that was the foundation day of UNEP. We'll learn about it, don't worry. We'll have a quick glance. Why? Because 1972, there was a conference called as United Nations Conference on Human Environment in Stockholm. Why was there a conference? Because in 1969, something happened in Europe. There was a kind of informal association of industrial elite in Europe. Informal association. The name of that association was Club of Rome. These are not new. You must be aware of all those things. And you can change your surprising faces. You understand this? Club of Rome authored a book. Limits to Growth. Name of the book was Limits to Growth. In that they opined that if the growth and development continue at the current, the then 1969-70, the then pace, limits to economic growth would be attained within the next 100 years. That is, it was published in 1969-70 and became popular by 1971. 100 years from 1971 means 2071. By 2071, in 1969-70, Club of Rome opined that limits to growth. That means there would be no more growth possible globally. That's what they opined, Club of Rome. And this book generated an element of panic among all educated, industrialized elites globally. This necessitated a conference. And that was the conference called as 1972 United Nations Conference on Human Environment, Stockholm. And out of which originated United Nations Environment Program. A body which is a component of United Nations, which exclusively deals with environment related issues globally. And this was founded on 5th June, hence you would still commemorate that day as that's how the day comes a newspaper you'll have only that day nothing else yes and next comes your sites very very important concerned with your biological diversity conservation you learn about this you get what is sites here convention please understand this it is a convention Convention on. Convention on what? International trade. International trade. Trade in what? Endangered in species. endangered species. For you to know what is endangered, then you need to know IUCN red list. So that's how things go. You understand this? 
yes next comes what born otherwise called as convention on migratory species for example in the recent past you must have heard about something called as olive ridleys visiting the gahir mata you know that olive ridleys visiting gahir mata what is the obligation that government of india has got to protect those olive ridleys now here comes international obligation what's that bonn convention and we are signatories you know that is the link because in the news you'll see olive ridleys are getting affected because of tourism or any kind of coastal human activities and government of odisha is taking steps you'll say why should we protect instead of eating them as biryani why should we protect them average hyderabad is thinking every moving thing is biryani come on yes or no well all those carnivorous creatures out there you get it instead of eating them as biryani why should we protect them so many millions are there no ah, sorry we have something called as an obligation we need to protect it why then comes your balance global ecological balance so we have things we need to discuss next comes your what your vienna convention and a product of this is what we have something called as what the montreal you would study in newspaper in the recent past that kigali amendment you must have studied about whatever whenever you pick up any contemporary development regarding the environmental or environmental or ecological things you would come across kigali amendment it started in 2016 but recently also we had an amendment to kigali kind of changes occurring in this montreal protocol so you should know what is this so for the first time globally we have some unique attribute given to vienna convention because this was focused on what protection of ozone why only in 85 because 83 united nations environment program published the whole near antarctic there is a hole i you understand the people said so what so many holes are there even in your body you have so many holes big deal in sky what is what if there is a hole on one hand you have greenhouse gas accumulating on other hand you have holes let greenhouse gas escape through the holes what's the problem average american thinking you need another planet <laughs> yes then came your vienna convention explaining the significance the need of ozone layer you understand then you have to study how there is formation of ozone ozone is good there ozone is bad here why that is where you have to talk about fundamental concept that ground level ozone you must have studied about something called as smog at least you must have studied about something called as secondary pollution Are you understand this yes so this ozone in general causes multiple abnormalities when it is present in or within tropo in strato it is good yes we understand that but in tropo it is not so good what's so bad about ground level ozone you understand this so that is what fundamental concept would be so vienna convention takes us back to the ozone and the difference between impacts of ground level ozone and stratospheric ozone that becomes the fundamental concept when you look at kigali amendment you have to go back to the difference in the impacts of ground level ozone and stratospheric ozone are you able to understand this that's how things are connected getting back and then montreal protocol which necessitates all signatory countries to gradually phase out those substances which damage ozone so how can some substance damage ozone you have to understand about what the concept of this the chlorinated brominated compounds interacting with ozone what would happen you understand this that is a basic concept chemistry it's all about chemistry you are a product of chemistry damn it yes so vienna convention montreal protocol then ozone 
things are connected and why cfcs are ozone depleting substances and what replaced cfcs we have something called as hcfcs and hfcs what is kigal amendment even hfcs though they are ozone friendly are causing it is like a solution to a problem is causing another problem are you able to understand this it is just like your plastic plastic was manufactured to solve some problem but this so called solution to a problem created another problem example hfc now that is where montreal and kigali amendment differ are you able to understand this you have to focus on that hfc phasing out by the virtue of kigali amendment we'll talk about that basic concept how ozone forms and how ozone gets destroyed at different stages within tropo within strato that's a basic concept you have to focus basel the transboundary movement of hazardous wastes you must have seen in many movies that developed countries dump their hazardous wastes chemicals pesticides any kind of aerosol which are potentially harmful carcinogenic in underdeveloped countries you must have seen in movies yes now we have an obligation to control it you get it for example in gujarat gujarat coast very popular what, what is the other name of gujarat coast here malang we have area called as malang the graveyard of ships you are not aware of even movies are made bikes are made from the steel yes okay so many ships across the globe when they are decommissioned they will be sent to malang coast of gujarat for dismantling ships hence that coast of gujarat is called as graveyard of ships now most of the ships after their completion of their life or service whatever it is they will be loaded with lot of toxic substances so in the name of dismantling of that ship lot of toxic waste are dumped in gujarat coast that is termed as illegal and how can we say it is illegal because of this convention basel convention well that's the concept here next is what the 1992 20 years after i'm not sure about what is the link between this 20 years 20 years yes 1773 charters 20 20 20 till 1853 what is the link 20 years now we have 1972 dash 1992 rio yes and then 2012 rio plus 20 what is the link 2020 we are not sure yes so 1972 stockholm 1992 rio 2012 again you must you must have studied in cops conference of parties and then we have 1998 rotterdam Rotterdam Convention. What is this convention all about here? International trade of hazardous chemicals and pesticides, which are otherwise called as what? Here. Both 1998 and this, the Stockholm Convention, they deal with what? International trade of hazardous chemicals and pesticides because POPs include pesticides. Persistent organic pollutants. These are called as forever chemicals. Other name of this is forever chemical. That means they remain in the environment for hundreds or thousands of years without undergoing major physical or chemical changes. Are you able to understand this? Yes. Stockholm Convention, not to be confused with Stockholm Conference. We have no link between Stockholm Conference and Stockholm Convention. Are you able to understand this? And then we can have, okay, so we have this. And then we have Minamata Convention, 2013. What is that? You know, Minamata, Minamata is the disease. Minamata is the name of the disease. First found in the Minamata Bay of Japan. There's the name of a bay. This bay was dotted with industries which deal with heavy metals. One such is mercury. Mercury related waste were dumped into ocean. We assume that ocean takes everything. Whatever you throw at it, ocean takes everything. 
we forget that it also gives back everything in a different form slightly yes and fishes which in general heavy metals have some properties that was questioned multiple times in prelims properties of heavy metals they are water insoluble but fat soluble an ideal toxin or toxic substance is immiscible in water but miscible in fats oils are you able to understand this and then they have long shelf life are you able to understand this and then you must have studied about a phenomena called as what bioconcentration and biomagnification so these toxins or heavy metals they undergo bioconcentration not biomagnification bioconcentration so all these things can be potential questions please understand this you just simply look at minimata convention and there is a kind of pandora's box open so you have to think of all these things so basic element getting back ipcc we will learn about it basic introduction here yes and you look at ipcc it's a product of unep yes so established in 1988 by the unep and the world meteorological organization please remember world Meteorolo meteorological organization was formed in 1950 but it was formed because of another institution back in 1873 itself 1873 what were indians doing in 1873 counting stars yes so international meteorological organization 1873 paved way for world meteorological organization in 1950 yes this world meteorological organization along with unep formed ipcc please understand this you may have anything as a question yes so what is the objective of ipcc please understand this provide the world with a clear scientific view on the current state of knowledge in climate change current state of knowledge so if you want to know what is climate change and its impact on the world you just need to have a look at the report provided by ipcc and you will come to know everything about the situation of climate change now you understand this so hence if you want to talk about climate change now you should have the basic knowledge of ipcc's ar that is assessment report and the most recent ipcc's assessment report came in 2021 that is the basis for whatever you talk concerned with climate change hence we started with it are you able to understand this so without having the awareness of ipcc's assessment report you cannot talk anything about climate change in an authentic manner that is the body please understand this yes and its potential environmental and socio economic impact so ipcc not only gives the status of climate globally but also gives its potential impact on different countries and different communities in the future so this is the authoritative body to talk about climate change yes so it is an intergovernmental body that means it works tandem in coordination with the respective governments of all countries on the planet earth please understand this hence the name ipcc intergovernmental panel yes so we have assessment report ar6 which is published in 2021 so based on this what do we have here so update of ar5 which was released in 2013 that means you have a huge deal of questions coming from this report don't worry you don't have to study all the reports or all components of reports here yes we have some summary here yes so we have components of ar6 what are the what are those components yeah improvements in observe why we have a kind of uh... okay so we have this points i thought something is missing yes so guess the borders are missing here
What's wrong? Yes, please. We need to zoom out. Zoom out in the projector. Here. We have a remote. I don't understand machines much. I've been focusing on humans of late and I forgot how to do it with machines. Okay. Zoom out. Is it visible? Great. There's no point in zooming out, I guess. Yes. So, we have the archives, paleoclimate archives. So, why it is important here? In another area in contemporary developments, we would come to know about one organism. It's called as coelacanth. Coelacanth is a fish like organism fish like organism which is which was observed by 1938 on the coast of south africa what is so unique about it it's a deep sea creature it was believed to become extinct 66 million years ago along with dinosaurs it was believed to be extinct are you understand this it existed in unique environmental conditions it is reappearing now. That means climate is becoming like it was 66 million years ago. Please understand this. And this creature, Silicanth, lives 2300 feet below the main sea level, a deep sea creature. Surprisingly, Creatures which live beyond 1000 feet in ocean do not have the visual structures because there is no light. If there is no light, would you need eyes? Oh, let's talk about prelims exam. Do you understand this? No light, no need of eyes. But this silicon has got eyes. So we can't explain few things about this silicon and that's also found. And then now this uh, IUCN talks about the conservation efforts here yeah? anyways so paleoclimate archives what is paleo here paleo means very old yes so paleoclimate archives so a new perspective was added by IPCC to the way we look at climate change what is that perspective retrospective I have understand this yes so provide a comprehensive view of each component of the climate system and its changes to date it gives a comparative perspective that's all how was the climate a few years ago how is it now so that we can understand how is it changing and how would that affect our lives number one this was essential component of the report here new climate model simulations new analysis and methods though these may not be directly understandable by you until we give the salient points of IPCC's AR6 this would be more relevant to you. Global surface temperature was 1.09 degrees higher in 2011-2020 than it was approximately 100 and odd years ago. So we have a rise. So if you want to say that whether global warming is real, it is real. By how much globe uh, has warmed up? By how much? Please remember, when you give any number, it can be any number, it loses its relevance in the absence of comparison with another number. Please understand this. When would one assume significance only in the presence of either zero or two? Otherwise, one would lose its relevance. We know that. One will not have any value if there is no zero or there is no two. Come on. Yes or no? So you will not have any value if you don't have any others around you. You get it? 1.09 degrees higher. So that is what till date the warmth we have been experiencing. A rise in average surface temperatures. So with larger increase over land. So surface temperatures are relatively warmer than the ocean temperature rise. Please remember these can be accessed by any of you. When you go to the website of IPCC. 
you understand this and have a look at this AR6 and then these are the salient points these are not confidential documents yes each of the last four decades has been successively warmer than any decade that preceded it since 1850 so every summer is becoming warmer and warmer and warmer go outside you would experience you understand this so every year every decade is becoming warmer than the previous decade that is the meaning this is a salient point of AR6 of IPCC just remember that yes. human caused global surface temperature increase from 1850 to 2010-19 is estimated to be 1.07 that means 0 0.02 degrees Celsius is the global warming naturally occurred I you understand this we are just finding the difference here that's all so 1.07 degrees Celsius is the amount of temperature we contributed to. You understand this? So it is called as human induced global warming and climate change. Yes. Arctic sea ice area has decreased about 40% in September and about 10% in March in between 1979-88 and 2010 and 19. Please remember. 99% of fresh water on the planet earth is in frozen condition 99% that means what we have in hydrologic cycle in fresh water form now we are not including ocean surfaces here fresh water form liquid water what we have that is surface water bodies the channels rivers and all those things stagnant water bodies aquifers that means ground water table fresh water all such water on the planet earth is only one percent remaining 99 percent of the fresh water is in frozen condition now what is happening here that is that means that ice frozen water is melting now this contributes to two impacts number one is immediate impact that is the floods and the submergence and inundation of the uh, borders or the the coasts or whatever it is of water bodies and then ultimately a rise in mean sea level ultimately yes global mean sea level increased by 0 0.20 meters this is the next consequence naturally so between 1901 and 2018 what would happen nothing would happen to Hyderabad we know that unless there is a holy moosey's change yes coastal towns and cities coastal plains they'll get affected island nations they get affected yes so climate zones have shifted poleward in both hemispheres that means the equatorial regions are becoming equatorial regions are becoming largely uninhabitable un please understand this that means they are becoming hostile to human survival so these climate zones that means habitable zones are shifting polewards that means equatorial regions are becoming so warm that they may not support survival of life that's a bad news please remember this news is authentic IPCC's assessment report news salient points so these are more than enough for you to understand the present scenario of the global climate change warming and potential consequences if at all any yes so concentrations of carbon dioxide unmatched for at least 2 million years that means we never had so much of carbon dioxide concentration in the last 2 million years what we have now that means we have highest concentrations of carbon dioxide glacial retreat unmatched for 2000 plus years that means in the last 2000 years we have greatest amount of loss of glacial ice IPCC reports points please remember this summer arctic ice cover is smaller than smaller than any time in the last 1000 years that means we have decreasing polar ice caps or ice sheets here yeah. ocean warming faster at any time since end of the last ice age when when was the last ice age we had approximately 11000 bc approximately please we don't have evidences for that yes so 11000 bc we had the last ice age the most recent ice age yes so ocean warming that means oceans are at their warmest phase now ocean acidification at highest level in the last 26,000 years ocean acidification in general results in what it results in 
the bleaching, both these activities will cause the loss of biological diversity, marine biological diversity, we know that. Coral bleaching, all these things you must have studied, yes? What is bleaching of corals? What is a coral? Okay, uh, now we are go polyps. going towards LKG. Yes. Loss of Please remember, coral is a symbiotic relationship between two different organisms. It is not just one. Yes. So we have, in animal kingdom we know we have certain kind of organisms which belong to a phylum called as Nidaria. Yes. You studied in school, Protozoa, Periphera, Cylentrata, Nidaria, Platyhelminthes, Nematyhelminthes, Ascihelminthes, Anlida, Arthropoda, Mollusca, Echinodermata and Chordata. Same thing, school stuff. Yes. So uh, we have polyps which are Nidarians and then which in general have symbiotic association. Now again biotic interaction in the fundamental concept of ecology. What is that? Symbiosis, mutually beneficial relationship, a win-win kind of. So to certain kind of colorful algae. Colorful means what? Photosynthetic, that's all. Photosynthetic pigments. Yes. So, when these live in symbiotic relationship, in general, these polyps have the capability to combine or to absorb the calcium and carbonates from the ocean water and combine to form calcium carbonate shell. So, their job is to have a shell and to provide a stable solid reaction platform for the survival of this guest. And this guest, whenever would find a solid stable platform, they would settle down there, utilize the carbon dioxide of oceans because oceans absorb 55% of surface atmospheric carbon dioxide. Hence they are called as blue carbon sinks, you know that. Yes, these perform because of their presence near shallow waters in the presence of sunlight, they perform photosynthesis and provide nutrition to these polyps. So it's, it's a mutually beneficial relationship, symbiosis and such organisms are called as corals. So what, what's the problem here? Now we have a problem with the increase in temperature. Increase in temperature decreases solubility of gases. Solubility of gases decreases, you understand this? So carbonate availability decreases. When carbonate availability decreases, these polyps cannot form calcium carbonate shell. Are you understand this? So rise in temperature results in inability of the polyps to form corals. At the same time, this acidification in general disrupts the symbiotic association. Are you understand this? Now we have a lot of problems here. So because of this, this is causing a coral bleaching. What is bleaching? Loss of color is bleaching. So these corals would repel colorful zooxanthellae and become pale. Pale corals in general are considered as dead corals. Corals are also called as what? Rainforests of the ocean. Previous preliminary question, please understand this. These are probably familiar to you. You must have given a lot of mock tests, yes? So the rainforests of oceans, they maintain ecological balance of marine ecosystems. Please understand this. If corals are absent, marine ecosystems balance would get affected. We will not know until that occurs. You wouldn't know the value of something or somebody until we lose them. Kind of. Yes. So these are the adverse impacts of these things according to IPCC's AR6 here. Next basic concepts which will take us towards IPCC's understanding of climate change. Don't worry, we'll have a basic glance about all these things here. It started in 1972. Much before that, what happened in 1969, you know that. Club of Rome, their publication, Limits to Growth, which generated panic. And then we had this conference. And in this conference, majority of the world countries met. They discussed that this environment is getting polluted. So back then, there was no concept of climate change, please understand this. 1972, there was no concept of climate change. It was only what? Human environment. Environment was changing. It was named as pollution. That's it. 
pollution was worrisome. There was no concept of climate change. Please understand this. People never thought about climate change back in 1972. Please understand this. It was only change in the environmental composition and they called it as what? Degradation, pollution. They thought they can set it right. Yes. So this is Stockholm, 1972, United Nations Conference on Human Environment, Sweden, Stockholm Conference here, yeah. yes. So we had this, lot of things happened here in 1972 conference but one of the most important one is what? UNEP, because this is the only surviving thing out of 1972, nothing else survived, yes. So, basic elements here and the most important outcome of 1972 United Nations Conference on Human Environment is UNEP. June 5th, 1972, you know that as you can see here, 1972 June 5th and where is the headquarters here? Nairobi, Kenya. So that is what you have to understand, that's more than enough for you, yes. And then. We have 88 IPCC with the help of the World Meteorological Organization along with UNEP they formed IPCC and then this IPCC has been publishing reports that is assessment reports ARs yes so recent one we had was in 2021 yes next comes here the 1992 after 20 years after Stockholm conference what is that United Nations conference on environment and development development in a sense sustainable development. Why this development concept was included in 1992? Because something happened in 1983. Because lot of discussions were going on across developed countries about changes occurring in the environment. You understand this? Now around 1983 many things happened. Publishing that is your the United UNEP published about this uh, ozone hole and lot of pollution was happening across and then the limits to growth became very popular and then this bothered, this worried United Nations. United Nations called one person who was a former Prime Minister of Norway and former Director General of WHO, Dr. Gru Harlem Brundtland, 1983 was called by United Nations and was appointed with the responsibility of finding a solution that is to strike a balance between development on one hand and conservation of environment that is to slow down or prevent or reverse the damage occurring to environment. Strike a balance. United Nations asked this person to come up with a solution in 1983. She came up with one book, a report by 1987-88. So based on that, it is believed that IPCC just took shape. 1987-88, she submitted her report. Gru Harlem Brenton, uh, female, sorry. Yes, first I should tell that. Yes, uh, lady, uh, Dr. Gru Harlem Brentland, she came up with this because we had a question earlier related to this. Yes, preliminary question. And her report titled as what? Our Common Future. Title, Our Common Future future. For the first time she gave a new perspective to people that all people on the planet earth have similar future. By giving this it actually generated panic. Now, truth always generates panic isn't it? Yes. This is Brundtland Commission report and in this book she came up with con one con concept called as what? Sustainability or sustainable development. What is sustainable development? Largely a joke. Yes. So, you get it? It is like without killing an organism, you need a biryani. Can you have one? That's over. What are you talking about? Sustainable development. So she defined sustainable development in the form of what? Development 
which meets the needs of present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. That means it is nothing but responsible utilization of natural resources. What is responsibility? We don't know. Do we? We know more about rights, not about responsibilities. You understand this? If somebody reminds you of your responsibility, you will become angry. That's you. Welcome to India. Fundamental rights are justiciable. Duties? No. Duties? What are duties? Whose duty? Not my duty. That's you. Enshrined in that joke book. As usual. Bundle of borrowed. Ransacked. Yes. So. Sustainable development was defined by Gru Harlem Brundtland. This also necessitated, along with IPCC's formation by UNEP and WMO, to have one more conference. And that is your 1992 Rio Earth Summit. United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. development. We added one more. 1972, it was only human environment. Now we added masala. What is that masala? Development masala. And this coincided with opening up of doors, collapse of Soviet, Soviet, you know that? India opened the doors. So a lot of things happened in 1991-92. Anybody born in that year? Yes? Definitely you are not normal. Because you were not surrounded by normal things. All these things are to make sure that you will remember things, that's all. Otherwise, I am really serious. I was normal. Yes. So we have 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. So sustainable development was the concept which was on the agenda of this conference. And then we know that outcomes of this conference. We are worried only about legally binding outcomes. Please understand this. If an outcome of a conference is not legally binding, nobody would take it seriously and would implement it. Only we have two legally binding outcomes of this conference. Number one is the legally binding outcome of a conference is called as a convention. And we have a framework convention on climate change and we have a convention on biological diversity. Only two legally binding outcomes. That's the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. Yes. So, almost all member countries of United Nations attended, hence it was called as all-inclusive, hence Earth Summit. Majority of the Earth was represented in that conference, hence Earth Summit. Occurred in a place called as Rio de Janeiro, hence Rio, Rio Earth Summit. Otherwise, it is called as United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. Yes. So, legally binding outcomes are these, we know that. Framework Convention on Climate Change and Convention on Biological Diversity. Legally binding. Well, if you have a convention, then what you need is how to implement, how to go about. So implementation mechanisms of conventions are called as protocols. We have Framework Convention has got one protocol and Convention on Biological Diversity has got two protocols. Cartagena. Protocol on Biosafety and Nagoya Protocol on Equitable Distribution of Benefits Arising Out of Genetic Diversity. So, to, so we have two legally binding outcomes. That's it about 1992 Rio Summit. Afterwards, after this conference, member countries came to understanding that they should meet every year. You understand this? So that they'll have some break. Yes, so they have been meeting since then till date and those meetings were called as what? Conferences. Conferences of what? Of the member countries. These member countries or signatories also were referred by a name called as signatory party. Because you are part of that conference, hence part of anything is party, not your party celebration. Yes, so this became the norm. What is that? 
conference of parties. Every year they come, they meet, greet, take some photographs, eat and drink and then go away so that they can come back next year. That's the ritual. Yes. So this is largely non-legally binding and did not get implemented till date. Framework convention is more important because we are talking about climate change, basic things, basic things. This would be focused whenever you talk about any conference of parties. And we have Glasgow, 2021 November. Glasgow, UK, naturally it is nothing but a conference of a 26th COP, conference of party, which is a product of framework convention climate change. So every year whenever there is conference of party occurring that goes back to the concept of framework convention. Please remember this. Yes. So of course it took some time from 1992. It took some time for its uh, effectiveness or efficacy or coming to force here. Yes. So currently almost all countries on the planet earth, almost all countries on the planet earth are members in this framework convention. So framework convention identifies countries based on certain parameters as you can see here. So we have the annex 1, annex 2 and non-annex countries. Don't worry we are here. Yes. So we have these countries which are developed countries. Annex 1. Developed. And then we have some other countries which are both developed and economies in transition. What do you mean by economies in transition? East European countries are those countries which were once part of the Soviet Socialist Republics. So those countries and non-annex are what? Those which are still developing and least developed countries, LDCs. And then they have differential responsibilities. The focus of framework convention is completely on only one element that is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's it. Are you will understand this? So only one component framework convention on climate change focuses that is reducing greenhouse gas emission. When we say greenhouse gas emission reduction then basic concept must go. What is a greenhouse gas? What is greenhouse effect? What are the greenhouse gases which have been labeled by Kyoto Protocol under framework convention as harmful? That's a basic concept. Please understand this. Yes. So you know this what is greenhouse? In almost all nurseries or plantations or viticulture, viticulture you know in viticulture we follow greenhouse method. Yes. So across the uh, farming practices we follow greenhouse method to increase the warmth for pl better plant growth and higher crop yields. What is this greenhouse? We just cover the area which is under cultivation with green colored cloth is it no. is that a greenhouse then why green it is open to please remember this is a practice where nordic countries follow nordic countries follow this to grow plants because they hardly get direct sunlight during most part of the year they don't have warmth which can support the growth of plants to increase the warmth, they construct glass houses within which plants are cultivated. Glass houses, transparent, within which green plants are grown. And those houses are termed as green houses because plants are grown. What is the significance? Glass has got a property to allow light and to prevent escape of heat. Basic property. Are you understand this? So in general, light in general travels at a lower wavelength in general. Heat has got relatively higher wavelength in general. When you look at electromagnetic spectrum, are you understand this? So you have electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves, microwaves, infrared on one hand, non-ionizing invisible. On the other extreme we have ionizing invisible. Those are in the form of ultraviolet, x-rays and then you have alpha, beta. Uh, gamma we cannot include directly. Yes. 
So we have this. So we have this, and then in between, we, what we have? This is non-ionizing invisible, ionizing invisible. In between, you have visible. What is that here? We have this visible. You understand this? So here, what happens? Wavelength decreases as we go from left to right in the spectrum and frequency and intensity would increase as we go from left to right in the spectrum. Please understand this. Frequency and intensity are directly proportional. Please understand this. Whereas frequency and wavelength, intensity and wavelength are inversely proportional. Wavelength determines how long or for how much distance a wave can travel. Are you understand this? Whereas frequency and intensity indicate how much energy they can transfer. Irrespective of the distance they travel, how much energy they can transfer. That's how we can easily understand. Here, most of the heat travels in the form of infrared radiations. Most of the light travels in the form of this visible and ultraviolet. So technically speaking, glass allows ultraviolet into and prevents the escape of infrared out of that house. Hence, you have glass uh, doors and windows to AC rooms, yes or no? Uh, you can remove curtains also. You understand this? So, glass allows lower frequency, that means short wavelength. Sorry, lower wavelength and high frequency. Lower wavelength, relatively speaking, higher frequency. Radiations, glass allows. And Glass prevents the escape of. What is this prevention here? Please remember, we have the property of objects upon receiving incident light convert the energy of the light into heat. This is the property of objects. Please understand this. To prove it, it is uh, empirical. You can prove it on demand. Measure the surface temperature of any object and Keep it under sunlight after a few minutes, take it up, take it just take it back and measure the surface temperature again. There would be an increase in the surface temperature. How can you explain this? Simple. Light energy gets converted into heat energy. This is the property of objects, please. How it happens, you know, that kinetic energy of all, you know, molecules or atoms would increase because of light energy and they bombard with each other and this bombardment generates what? This heat. That's how objects lose energy, please understand this. It is like boiling water, you just observe this uh, boiling water. You can boil the water using light also, you know that you did all those experiments in school, if you are especially from government school, yes, we did all these things, you know this small magnifying glass, whenever we, we used to have classes under trees, government schools we have class under trees, we used to play with this burning grass, burning paper, and boiling water using magnifying, small magnifying lens, you know the light also can boil the water, you know that, yes. So the potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy and then they bombard and then they become, they overcome gravity and then, you know, state of matter changes from liquid to vapors, you know that, that's a basic thing, yeah. So glass allows short wavelength radiations and prevents the escape of long wavelength radiations. This is the property of glass. And this results in what? So whatever light which enters the glass houses would be trapped in the form of heat and this heat enables plants grow better because heat cannot escape from the glass house. So it would be warmer inside a glass house under sunlight than outside the glass house. Are you able to understand this? You get it? And this is the simplest way to explain greenhouse effect. And here what we are looking at is the border, the roof of the glass house within which plants are cultivated in a greenhouse would be compared with that of the troposphere, especially tropopause on the earth. So tropopause or troposphere, the blanket of gases we have which form atmosphere, they act as glass, please understand this, glass ceiling. They allow light, sunlight and they prevent the escape of heat. 
resulting in entrapment of heat within troposphere resulting in rise in the surface mean surface temperature of the earth within troposphere and some gases which enable this troposphere perform this activity better are called as greenhouse gases and the overall effect is greenhouse effect you know basic concept and in general in general carbon dioxide is considered as one such gas why only carbon dioxide is taken as a standard greenhouse gas by UNEP why no other because many other gases are greenhouse gases which may be more potentially harmful please remember this is the only gas in the list given by UNEP we have multiple others for example water vapor is also greenhouse gas water vapor Methane is greenhouse gas, excellent. Methane is a greenhouse gas here. We have multiple other, yes, sulfur x so we have multiple other, so multiple other. So we carbon tetrachloride, so we have multiple other gases which are greenhouse gas, that means which help in trapping of heat. Yes. But why only carbon dioxide? Please remember carbon dioxide is in general considered as the primordial gas that means has been present on the earth for the past four and a half billion years you understand this consistently and has been responsible for gradual warming of the surface of the earth over a period of time and carbon dioxide was found in all places of the planet earth but no other greenhouse gas found in all places they have limitations in their occurrence or existence or presence and many of them were never present in the primordial atmosphere of the earth at the time of formation of the earth 4.6 billion years ago all these factors make carbon dioxide a suitable choice to be taken as a standard greenhouse gas by UNEP and all other gases are rated with reference to the ability or potential nature of carbon dioxide to cause greenhouse effect you understand this that is why whenever we talk about greenhouse effect or global warming we take carbon dioxide equivalent measures and we use the term carbon 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 to refer to any concept or for any contextual use concerned with climate change for example carbon neutral carbon positive carbon negative carbon footprint you must have said about those things very popular things across resources yes why we use carbon 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 trading yes why carbon because this this is the reason moreover carbon dioxide is present in almost all living organisms number one all living organisms require carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is present both in troposphere that is on the surface as well as in oceans it is soluble in liquids though we have a temperature gradient there yes so that is why we have this greenhouse gas emission reduction is the objective of framework convention on climate change and the Kyoto protocol in identical fashion yes so they all focus on one element please remember we have only one protocol concerned with framework convention on climate change the other protocol which is a successor of Kyoto is in making it is not yet a reality please understand this because we had a question in 2018 I guess they gave protocols list of protocols in the answer options and the question was really a funny question which of the following are the protocols associated with climate change and some people got confused yeah, yeah, we can keep their brains in museum later, but still, we have such creatures appearing for prelims. <laughs> you understand this? So, uh, don't be that joker. You understand this? So, how many protocols we have for climate change till date? Is it difficult to remember one? If it is difficult for you to remember only one, you can go to another planet. Please uh, talk to Musk Mama and you can go. Easy, come on. Ticket is on sale. Yes. So, framework convention on climate change here. Yes. It is binding. Yes. 
legally binding emission target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions for 37 industrialized countries and the European Union in general. Yes. So, what is the legally binding nature of Kyoto Protocol? What do you mean by legally binding? Non-compliance must attract penalty. That is the meaning of legally binding. Please understand this. For example, if you break a law and if you ask the question, what difference it, make? it makes? If you cannot, if we cannot answer you, it doesn't make any difference for you to follow the law or comply with the law. Please understand this. Non-compliance always must attract penalties. Only then there is significance of legally binding nature. Then what is the legally binding nature of Kyoto? This is it. So, emission targets amount to a total cut among all Annex 1 parties. Please remember, target is only for Annex 1 parties. OECD countries and EIT countries along with EU, yes, of at least 5.37% from 1990 levels by 2008-12. Please remember, we did not meet this. Hence, we, we had Rio plus 20 in 2012. We did not meet the deadline. Well, once we don't meet the deadlines, what do we do? We postpone it. And uh, we are masters in procrastinations. Anyways, yes. So, this is the target. And whichever Annex 1 country doesn't meet these targets would be liable for penal provisions. Okay. So, that is the Kyoto Protocol here in brief. Yes. So, UNEP in 2021 to substantiate this published something called as a report called as Emission Gap. What is this gap all about? Yes, exactly, exactly. As we have here, the overview of the emission gap difference between where greenhouse gas emissions are predicted to be in 2030, predicted to be, and where they should be to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So, uh, it is like your popular thing. What is that? Expectation versus reality. Or your Instagram profile picture, your Aadhaar card picture. You understand this? So, there is a difference. There is a gap. Remember that. Please remember what matters is what you remember. You get it? I always say this. Those students who are familiar would always smile at me saying that this fellow says same thing every class in every class. That never becomes old. Look at these faces. So fresh and innocent. They are good right films. And they call it as tough exam. They call it as exam. Now, my intention is, do not take it so seriously. Because if you take the exam very seriously, you will tend to overthink. Overthinking kills your cognitive abilities. Please understand this. That means, if you overthink, rational thinking gets affected. Please understand this. You get it? There is a difference. You get it? Getting back here. So we have. That means do not assume that this is a, a big devil kind of thing. No, it is not. It is doable. There is a procedure. That's all. You get it? Just one more exam. You have given so many exams in your life. One more exam. But let it be the last exam. That's it. Be at least that much serious. To keep this as the last preliminary exam in your life. Be that much serious and that's more than enough for you. Do you understand that? Let's see. So, 20, so there is a gap between the expected emissions and the actual emissions. Why? To avert the impact. What is impact because of greenhouse gases? Climate change. Yes. So what are the key highlights of this emission gap report? UNEP publishes it. That means it is of international importance. Please understand this. It is important. It is authentic. All countries have to take this as standard. There is no other way. Yes. So, we have nationally determined contributions. Please understand, of course, we also gave our uh, nationally determined contributions voluntarily. Please remember, these nationally determined contributions are mandatory for Annex 1 parties only. Please understand this. 
What are these nationally determined contributions? That means these are the efforts put forth by a specific country in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and managing climate change globally. To what extent one country can contribute? So nationally determined contribution. India is not an X1 country, please understand this. But we also gave INDCs, you must have studied, as a product of the COP21, that is, your Paris Climate Change Conference in 2015. In that conference, we also came up with INDCs, that is, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. Voluntarily we gave. It was not mandatory for India to give NDCs, but we gave voluntarily. Because it is mandatory only for Annex 1 parties. What is Annex 1? Annex 1 countries are developed countries, OECD countries, EITs and EU countries. Developed. Yes. So, what is that the emission gap report highlights say about the condition of green emission? Emission of what? Emission of greenhouse gases. Which contribute to global warming and eventually climate change. Please remember look, the greenhouse effect is the cause. Climate change is the consequence. Global warming is the evidence. All are not same. Are you understand this? Greenhouse effect is the cause. What is the cause for release of greenhouse gases? Carbon dioxide is anyways present in the atmosphere. Why do we say that it is human induced climate change? Because of our practices of combustion of, you must have studied in fundamental concepts that there is a cycle, especially the cycle of nutrients in fundamental concepts of ecology, you must have studied nutrient cycles. We have gaseous nutrient cycles and sedimentary nutrient cycles. In gaseous nutrient cycle, you study about what? You study about oxygen, you study about nitrogen, you study about this. Carbon. When you study carbon, carbon cycle follows two paths. Number one is a short term carbon cycle, another one is a long term carbon cycle. Short term carbon cycle is what? Plants take up carbon dioxide, perform photosynthesis, release oxygen. This oxygen is consumed by other aerobic organisms and plants convert the carbon of carbon dioxide into carbohydrate and animals consume that carbohydrate and they perform aerobic respiration. It's pretty simple. We know this. Right from LKG you have been studying about this. Yes, basic thing here, basic. Yes, and then on the other hand we have something called as So we have two reactions, we have multiple questions on this, yes. So what is this first one and second one, where do they occur and what is the difference? We had a question like, which of the following reactions occurs at a faster pace and why? I guess uh, you are familiar with this question. Which of these following reactions would occur? These two occur in living organisms, you understand this? Uh, okay, sorry. What is this reaction? What is this reaction? What respiration? That is why I rounded this. Aerobic respiration. Where does this occur? You have something called as uh, plastids. You have heard of? Chloroplast. That is where they occur. Not in plants. Inside plants where? Where this occurs? Where does this reaction occur? Where does this reaction occur? A different school you went to? Where in cells? Mitochondria. Hence powerhouses. That is what you studied in school. Well, a different school probably. School here means school of thought. Not the name of your XYZ schools, damn it, yes. You know this, plastids, mitochondria. Plants, both in plants and animals. You understand this? 
You get it? Or some people say, oh, this occurs in plants, this occurs in animals. Damn it. This occurs both in plants and animals. Yes or no? Yes. So, which of these following reactions occurs at a faster pace and why? That was a prelims question. Fast. No, examination is something, a test of something which is not visible, not available in books. Trust me. What's that? Test of? That is what is lacking. You thought you can crack this exam by reading books? Sorry. You can't. Why? This is not yet for sale. It's not published in books yet. What's this? Same thing. Do you understand this? Common sense. Save it. Yes. Yes, please. What's the answer? This? Why? What? What is easy? Why is important? Okay, so? Okay, so? 24 by 7, yes. So what is the answer? Respiration occurs at faster pace. That is the question. Which among these two reactions occurs at a faster pace and why? That is the question. Is the question clear? Yes or no? What's the answer? And come on, this was like a decade ago they asked a question, now you can't answer it. If not, second one, definitely first one. We don't have 100 options here. Did you say that you are writing this year's prelims? Did you say that? Who said it? Yes. Which one? How? When would you complete things? Whenever you have a deadline. You got it? What's the answer? Which process has got a deadline? What is that? This is what a deadline. Yes or no? Now, suppose it is this. You experience this on daily basis. What is this? Parkinson's law? Not Parkinson's disease. Yes? That is dopamine deficiency. That is different. This is Parkinson's disease. This is Parkinson's law. What's this? Work expands to fill the time. How much ever time you have, your work will occupy the time. Do you understand this? So work expands to fill whatever time which is available. That means if we say that preliminary exam is next month, you will say till last moment you will prepare. Preliminary exam is next year, still you will prepare in the same fashion. That is why lockdown, postponement of prelims exam did not give positive result in people who thought they prepared in spite of getting more time. You understand this? Why we should not give more time to people to prepare is Parkinson's law. How much ever time we give, your work expands to fill the time. That means you can never complete it. Hence, we should keep deadlines. And we should never postpone anything. That is why UPSC never postpones any exam. It sticks to its schedule. Why? Because once you change things, you change the consistency, you change the discipline, you change the attitude of people and attitude of the country. You understand this? Getting back here. Which reaction occurs at a faster pace now? Whichever has got a deadline to meet. What is the deadline here? Availability of the catalyst is the deadline. Though we have light reaction and dark reaction in photosynthesis, but during availability of light, photosynthesis occurs better, efficiently, effectively and at a faster pace. 
Are you able to understand this? So, biocatalysts, your enzymes, proteins, these are available 24 by 7. If you have anything which is available for you 24 by 7, you will take it for granted. And you will postpone things. Ah, this fellow tomorrow we will see, same fellow tomorrow also will come. You understand this? How do you deal with people? If a person is coming to you on daily basis, you will never complete that person's task. That's it. If a person is available to you 24 by 7, you will take that person for granted. If something is available for a limited time period, that value of that thing would be greater. Naturally, you would complete the task faster for that valuable thing. What is valuable here? Catalyst. What is the catalyst? Limited time availability. Hence, photosynthesis occurs at a faster pace. Technically speaking, that should produce more carbohydrates, more oxygen, than more carbon dioxide and more water, isn't it? Hence, we call increasing this as what? That is why we say grow more plants. To avert the adverse impacts of climate change, we should grow more plants. Why we say? They consume more carbon dioxide, they consume carbon dioxide faster. Are you able to understand this? And the funniest thing is what? Some people say, don't sleep under one tree. It releases carbon dioxide. Please remember at the same time, it is consuming carbon dioxide also. Can you understand this? Some people say, some organisms don't release carbon dioxide. Probably you are dreaming. Please wake up. This is how the universe works. There is no exception to this. If at all there is exception, there is exception wherein respiration occurs in the absence of oxygen. Absence of oxygen, depending on, depending on, you understand this? So, anaerobic respiration. If bacteria are performing this anaerobic respiration, that is respiration in the absence of oxygen. What is respiration? Breakdown of organic substances, release energy. Yes? So, if there is bacteria performing this action, you will have formation of methane and ammonia. It is called as decomposition. If fungi perform this aerobic respiration, we have formation of the ethanol. Methanol is different. Ethanol is different. Are you understand this? Ethyl alcohol. Two carbon ethyl. One carbon meth methyl. Are you understand this? So ethanol all means alcohol group. Ethyl alcohol, carbon dioxide. This process when mediated by fungi is your whatever this uh, the mushroom Gucci mushroom you know in use GI tag Jammu and Kashmir 36,000 per kg anyways we will come to that later yes this is called as fermentation yes fermentation you employ in two industries number one is what breweries number two bakeries these two are preliminary questions what causes the dough to rise? Carbon dioxide. Sweet order from bakery. Why you get sweet order from bakery? Yes. Fermentation. Ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol is sweet ordered vapor. Liquid primarily but when temperature just uh, uh, heats it up and then you have vapors. Because alcohol is volatile you know that. Yes. That is why you get sweet order. Molasses fermentation. Sugar industries, yes, sweet order. I you understand this? So everything. And lactic acid, muscles, skeletal muscles, when they perform anaerobic respiration, you will have lactic acid. Lactic acid causes what? Tongs, delayed onset muscle soreness, fatigue, pain. Gym, you go to gym, 
first day you do all exercises next day you remain like this yes because you'll have sweet pain that's called as doms because you did not supply enough oxygen for your muscles to release energy and you performed exercises in a hurry some muscles to meet the emergency energy needs they resorted to anaerobic respiration resulting in the formation of lactic acid lactic acid is a metabolite which causes fatigue and swelling which cause pain anyways so photosynthesis and respiration basic reaction lkg stuff now we are not supposed to discuss about all these things here and expect wrong answers from you and you saying you are writing the cs prelims yes getting back here carbon carbon that is why we use the term carbon everywhere are you understand this yes so so limited impact of new or updated ndcs and announce announce pledges for 2030 so countries have nationally determined contributions that means it is a promise countries have made that they will reduce certain amount of their total greenhouse gas emissions they gave a promise that is one and how much greenhouse gas reductions they are able to achieve is another there is a gap are you able to understand this that gap so projected to reduce 2030 emissions by only 7.5% 7 resulting in warming of 2.7 degrees celsius slightly less than 3 degrees celsius unep forecast in its last report so there is a gap between what countries have promised and what countries have achieved or achieving in general emission reductions needed a 30% cut to limit warming to 2 degrees and 55% cut to limit 1.5 so this is the required or the amount of greenhouse emission reductions to minimize or avert adverse impacts current net zero targets could limit global warming to around 2.2 degrees this is the estimation by the end of century estimation reduction of methane emission from the fossil fuel waste and agriculture sectors could help close the emission gap and reduce warming in the short term to fill the gap what we have to do is what we have to have reduction in methane emission please remember it was the important blame united states has put forth and stepped back from signing or ratifying kyoto protocol saying that india and china are the largest emitters of methane still they are non annex one countries and they don't have any responsibilities or obligations according to kyoto hence they are not willing united states is not willing to ratify the kyoto because of which kyoto protocol implementation got delayed by around 6 years so we say that developed countries emit more carbon dioxide and developed countries are saying that we emit more methane so what causes emissions of more methane number 1 your plants animal wastes meat consumption paddy cultivation wetland farming wetland farming is a major source of methane emission number 1 number 2 animal husbandry so animal right from its rearing till its consumption as food and disposal of waste all these activities would include large scale emission of methane the animals dung or feces decomposes and releases huge amount of methane animal feed or fodder releases lot of methane animal meat decomposes and releases lot of methane you understand so all these plant and animal so wherever in whichever country there is wetland farming in whichever country there is animal husbandry and meat consumption in large quantities there is large scale emission of methane so that is what is causing another adverse impact on climate change here yes so reduction of methane emission from the fossil fuels how fossil fuel and methane are connected please remember you must have heard about this something called as the natural gas yes let it be lng or cng all are natural natural gas is what methane 
coal bed methane, shale gas, natural gas, all these gas are nothing but your methane, biogas, methane. That means it's the major fossil fuel in gaseous form, please understand this. So methane continuously will be released from fossil fuel extraction. So wherever you have coal mining, there is huge amount of methane released into the atmosphere. You'll understand this. So all these activities release methane and the goal is to reduce these methane emissions to fill these gaps. So that is what is emphasized here. We know this, we have seen this, the sequence of changes occurring. Yes. Next is greenhouse gas bulletin released by World Meteorological Organization. So who would release greenhouse gas bulletin? Yes. So, World Meteorological Organization, World Meteorological Organization was established in 1950, which in the past was in the name of International Meteorological Organization, IMO, 1873. So, what is Greenhouse Gas Bulletin here? Concentration of carbon dioxide reached 413.2 parts per million in 2020 and is 149% of the pre-industrial level. Pre-industrial level, just take this as this. 1750 approximately. So, when compared to this year, by this year, there is 149% increase. Because of which we have more impacts of global warming climate change now than ever before. So, methane is 262% and nitrous oxide is 123% of the level since 1750. Why we are taking 1750 as a year? Because globally by this time, industrialization was not yet in practice. Those sporadically we have or in, in some places we had, yes. So methane and nitrous oxide also have increased to alarming levels, yeah. From 1990-2020, radiative forcings, the warming effect on our climate by long-lived greenhouse gases. Please remember what do you mean long-lived greenhouse gases? Including carbon dioxide. When compared to short-lived, short-lived greenhouse gases are your methane, water vapor, to some extent. Oxides of nitrogen, yes. Oxides of nitrogen, to some extent, yes. To some extent, yes. For, for large practical purposes, carbon dioxide and then the chlorofluorocarbons and then of course sulfur hexafluorides and then the hydrochlorofluorocarbons. So we have all these gases here. Yes, carbon tetrachloride, all these things, yes. To some extent, some nitrogen oxides also would be long lived here, yes. So these are short lived greenhouse gases. They have short lifespan and they influence the climate to a lesser extent when compared to long lived greenhouse gases. So long lived greenhouse gases are persistent greenhouse gases. They remain in the atmosphere for thousands, hundreds or thousands of years in general. So carbon dioxide is a small exception here. Carbon dioxide can live in the atmosphere in multiple forms or in its native form for approximately 100 to 150 years only. Yes, that's how it is. So getting back here. So from 1990 to 2020, radiative forcings, that means this infrared, the heat getting accumulated, causing greenhouse effect. The warming effect on our climate by long-lived greenhouse gas increased by 47% in just a span of 30 years. We have 47% increased impact of warming. So the carbon dioxide accounting for about 80% of this increase. So all this is attributed to what? Primarily. That is why across framework conventional climate change and Kyoto Protocol, they focus on only one thing. What is that here? Reduce fossil fuel combustion. That means go for alternatives. What is that alternative? Do not use coal, oil or gas, natural gas. So all these are considered as fossil fuels. Coal, oil, oil means all the components of the crude oil and then natural gas. All these three when exposed to the thermal dissociation, otherwise called as aerobic dissociation, they release carbon dioxide. It is nothing but a respiratory process, please understand this. Combustion is equivalent to intracellular respiration. If you just observe 
chemically. Yes. So fossil fuel utilization must be reduced. Probably that is the reason why higher prices are supported by governments. Higher prices to fossil fuels are supported by governments. Are you understand this? It is like in every budget increasing the price of alcohol and tobacco products. The intention is number one to reduce its consumption. Second intention is to earn revenue from it. Are you understand this? Likewise, fossil fuel prices are also increased and it is not reduced or it is not condemned by governments. Because ultimate goal of Kyoto Protocol is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that happens effectively only if you reduce your dependency on fossil fuels. That means you have to have more dependency on non-fossil fuel sources for energy needs. That is the goal. Yes. So we have greenhouse gas bulletin which indicates the percentage change in their emissions when compared with the past. This is the present condition of greenhouse gases released by World Meteorological Organization in the form of a greenhouse gas bulletin. Just to know what is the status of greenhouse gases now. Next component is global methane assessment. Please remember it would be essential for you to understand methane and its role here. Methane primarily is a greenhouse gas. Moreover, methane in general causes the formation of ground level ozone. Methane in general, in general, causes formation of ground level ozone and methane also, also releases the formation of what? The peroxides. Peroxides what is a peroxide? Wherever there is a compound with two oxygens, that's a peroxide. Are you understand this? Yes? That's a wherever there is. Yes, for example. Okay, simplest peroxide we are very familiar with. Are you understand this? So peroxides in general are responsible for formation of ozone. Please understand this. And ozone in general ground level ozone is corrosive in nature corrosive and ground level ozone also causes this has got the bleaching effect please understand this ground level ozone has got bleaching effect preliminary examination had questions like silvering of leaf underneath surface that means chlorosis a phenomena called as chlorosis that means chlorophyll a respiratory pigment disintegrates because of ground level ozone cracking of rubber resulting in reduced durability and any potential explosion of rubber products for example tire you see in summers there is more ozone formation why please remember you know that how ozone forms in stratosphere whenever you have oxygen primarily oxygen is a precursor to formation of ozone we know that yes so whenever there is oxygen, whenever there is ultraviolet, you'll have something what? Nascent. Nascent means what? Single, ready to mingle, do jingle oxygen. Nascent oxygen. Yes. This combines with this and then forms ozone. You understand this? So this is a natural process. Yeah. At the same time, this also disintegrates in the presence of ultraviolet and that is how ozone keeps forming and keep getting disintegrated. It's a continuous cyclical process. Please understand this. Yes. And formation of ozone is at a faster pace than disintegration of ozone. Hence we have more ozone in stratosphere in general. And in this process the energy from ultraviolet is maximally consumed. Hence ozone is called as the good ozone in stratosphere because it, it absorbs ultraviolet energy and doesn't allow ultraviolet to reach surface of the earth or into the tropo. Why? Because you, ultraviolet energy is consumed for the very formation of ozone. That is why it becomes good. So when there is a ground level ozone, we have formation of what? The secondary pollutant <coughs> which is peroxyacetyl nitrate which is responsible for what? Smog. 
ground level ozone ground level ozone causes chlorosis ground level, silvering of leaf silvering of leaf surfaces cracking of rubber it causes formation of peroxyacetyl nitrate and smog yes and what type of smog is this results in what it results in something called as what los angeles smog otherwise called as what photochemical smog you must have heard about these things what is okay so yes what is photochemical this occurs during availability of sunlight warmth it requires warmth whenever there is energy let it be heat or light ozone becomes activated heat or light acts as a catalyst for ozone to become reactive ultraviolet light here makes ozone reactive and heat here makes ozone reactive heat and light act as catalysts so here ozone forms peroxyacetyl nitrate and this forms a thick brownish smog smoke plus fog brownish smog is called as los angeles smog otherwise called as modern smog otherwise called as photochemical smog to the contrary we have another smog called as london smog or yellow pea soup smog classical smog you must have studied all those things in pollution basic concepts chemistry behind it a very important element here anyways so getting back here ground level ozone forms because of the presence of methane please understand this. so methane promotes the formation of ground level ozone methane by nature is a greenhouse gas in general wherever there is methane wherever there is a wetland wherever there is bacterial decomposition there is more methane and wherever there is methane there is warmth because naturally methane is a greenhouse gas please understand this for example see that the wet areas the marshy areas forest areas wetlands they are warmer because huge amount of methane is released yes getting back here so global methane assessment united nations environment program please remember you can have dangerous questions from this kind of things which of the following are not part of that's over that's a uh, uh, clean ball that's over you understand this hands up kind of thing if you don't know the list of countries which participate in the global methane assessment you are over those are dangerous questions uh, with negative marking that becomes even more dangerous the guesswork doesn't work here you can't guess it is factual please understand this. in factual questions guesswork doesn't work there's no logic behind it come on yes so along with united nations environment program some countries specifically participate in publishing this report yes so bangladesh canada ghana mexico sweden and united states they participate in this global methane assessment in general so objective is to improve air quality and protecting the climate through actions to reduce short lived climate pollutants methane is considered as a short lived climate pollutant what is the average life span of methane approximately 8 to 11 years because whenever this methane is available in the atmosphere it reacts it undergoes combustion it reacts please understand this it doesn't remain stable for long periods it has got short shelf life short lived just you can take 10 years as average lifespan of methane in the troposphere in general yes yes and this methane assessment can be taken up as a voluntary activity any country can become part of this uh, assessment yes india is a state partner we are also state partners but we are not completely into assessment because our methane emissions are very high that might invite unnecessarily obligations globally hence we are not we are just members but we are not participating in the assessment here yes so next is what the most recent conference of parties concerned with climate change cop 26 glasgow yes so 26th conference of parties of the united nations framework convention on climate change in glasgow hosted by uk november by mid of november it was over by 11th i guess it was over november 2021 
Yes. So, significance as it aims to finalize the Paris rule book. Please remember Paris COP21 Paris conference, COP15, COP15 the foundations were laid, COP14-15 foundations were laid, by COP21 rule book was ready. Yes. So, COP15, 14-15 the formulation of Paris rule book started, by COP21 formulation of rule book was over, but implementation did not take place. We have a problem. Yes. So, here to finalize the Paris rule book, what is the significance of this Paris conference or the 2015 Paris conference? What happens here is, here we have something called as the concept of INDC was introduced by 2015 Paris conference and targets, global targets of greenhouse gas emission reductions were fixed in Paris conference and this Paris conference was deemed to become the successor of Kyoto. Successor of Kyoto. But the outcomes of Paris conference did not receive the mandate or ratification because it targeted the developed countries to pay around 100 billion dollars to take up the global greenhouse gas emission reduction plans into action. So developed countries did not ratify, hence Paris rule book did not become a successor to Kyoto protocol yet. But 2021 COP26 intended to make this a successor to Kyoto. So following the 2019 COP25 summit in Madrid where we had many issues had not been agreed and had been pushed into the next year under the rule 16 of the UN climate process. Rule 16 says you can postpone, you understand this, you can postpone the deadlines is the essence of rule 16, please understand. How beautiful of a law, yes or no? That means you can postpone the deadlines concerned with greenhouse gas emission reductions. This leverage is provided by that rule. Naturally, things got postponed here. Yes. Here, the conference ended with all 197 parties to the framework convention agreeing to Glasgow Climate Pact. This is the greatest or you can say most positive news out of this Glasgow conference here. Yes. So, the global agreement which will accelerate action on climate. So, this decade and completes the Paris rule book. So by the end of this decade, by 2030, probably we may have the reaching of targets by all countries on the planet Earth which would meet the Kyoto deadlines. That's it. Pact aims to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Goal is to limit warming to 1.5 degrees by 2030. The, please remember this is ideal, that means goal, not reality. As agreed under the 2015 Paris Agreement and cut global greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 and to zero overall by 2050. Zero emissions. Can you imagine a world with zero? Well, that's a difficult thing to believe. Yes, that's how it is. That's what they talk when they meet, you know, crazy fellows, drunkards. They don't know what they talk. Yes. So, of course, the next development which happened, please remember, all these are developments concerned with climate change in the recent past. That means 2021-2022. People ask, like, how current should be current affairs? Well, it depends. We were told that 90% of the questions come, 90%, not 100%. Nobody can say that. That means majority of questions related to contemporary developments come from eight months before the prelims exam month. Prelims exam month. Eight months before the prelims exam month. Are you understand this? Majority of questions come from within this time frame. And the 10% can have any time frame. Like maybe 20 years ago things may come. 
50 years ago things may come, we never know. Yes, that's our test. Yes. Next is Kigali. Just remember, whenever there is something called as the Montreal and whatever amendment to Montreal protocol, remember one thing that is, it is about controlling or reducing or phasing out of ozone depleting substances. What are these ozone depleting substances? Primarily, these were chlorinated and brominated compounds. Primarily. What is the basic concept here? Whenever there is chlorine or bromine, whenever there is interaction, please remember these components, they are present in compressed environments under high pressure, high pressure, low temperature environments. Where do you have them? You have them in the HVACs, heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems. You have something called as a compressor, refrigerator, compressor. So wherever there is compressor, the contents of the compressor are nothing but coolants and chlorinated, brominated compounds are the chief contents of those cooling agents. Brominated compounds are also used as fire extinguishers or the brominated flame retardants. The handheld canister fire extinguishers you must have seen portable, handheld portable canister fire extinguishers. They are made of brominated compounds and your rocket propellants, rocket pro especially the solid rocket propellants you must have studied. Any example of solid rocket propellant please? You must have heard about this? Yes or no? And you are preparing for this year films. You said that? Now you are not saying. Okay. Hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene rubberized solid rocket propellant. The first stage of any launch vehicle which is called as a lift off stage. Mandatory will have solid propellant. Mandatorily. Missiles, conventional, ballistic, they are made of solid propellants. Are you understand this? Yes? So, solid propellants in general have a component called as the burn rate modifier. How do we calculate the efficiency of a rocket propellant? How do we calculate? Based on what? Based on a phenomena. We have only one word for that. What is that word? How is the efficiency of rocket propellant calculated? Why we are worried about the cryogenic propellant and why we are not using the conventional propellants because cryogenic propellants have a greater efficiency. So what is that parameter which determines the efficiency or efficacy of a rocket propellant? What is that word? Combustion is a very general statement applicable to all fuels. Well, do you think combustion is the parameter which determines the efficiency of a fuel? That's a property of a fuel. Okay, you have a scooter, bike. What determines the efficiency? Distance travel per unit volume of fuel. Come on. It can be the, yes, mileage. Okay, that's the word. All those, you know, surface surviving creatures. You move in a gravity eliminated position. Please understand this. Gravity eliminated. So when you move horizontally, you are moving in a gravity eliminated position. Not towards, not away from, not against. But propellants are unique because they have to overcome the attractive pull of gravity. They have to overcome. That means escape velocity and beyond. You know that, leave it. So what is the parameter which measures in such conditions to move against gravity to determine the efficiency or efficacy of a propellant? It's called as what? That means you did not prepare the defense or space technology. That's over. That is such a generic statement. Calorific value is applicable to all types of objects which can deal with heat and energy. That's like a school physics book. What is that? 
What is that? Damn it. Now you said you are preparing for this year's films. Specific impulse measures in seconds. Measured in seconds. A parameter of time. So, duration of combustion of propellant is what determines the efficiency of the propellant. Longer the duration of combustion of a unit volume of propellant, greater is the efficiency. Solid propellants can provide a maximum of 150 to 225 seconds of specific impulse. Liquid propellants can provide up to 700 seconds of specific impulse. Cryogenic propellants can provide a specific impulse of 1100 seconds and beyond. Hence the most efficient rocket propellants are cryogenic because of very high specific impulse. Hence we always aimed at either procuring or developing indigenously a cryogenic engine or cryogenic propellant. Why? because it is most so same unit of propellant some same volume same unit quantity burns for such a long time providing escape velocity and beyond to push or to propel the craft that's science and technology not for you not for you yes and Substances which are added to solid propellants to increase specific impulse are those which will make that solid, solid propellant to burn for longer period of time at the same time providing necessary thrust. And such substances are called as burn rate modifiers and bromine is one some compound. Bromine. Bromine increases the duration of combustion without altering the energy output of the combustion process. See the beauty of bromine. Get it? Doesn't alter the energy output of combustion process but allows the propellant or fuel to burn for longer period of time. That means that's a, a miraculous, magic thing. And this property of bromine burning slower is used in fabrication of furniture so that furniture catches fire slowly, burns slowly and gives time for people to escape. So bromine is used in fabrication, adhesives, paints and fire extinguishers. So bromine is everywhere. I don't think you don't know about all those things. Yes. Bromine and chlorine, chlorinated compound. These are present everywhere. For example, we have CCLTF2, very popular. Fluorinated compound. So chlorinated, fluorinated, brominated compounds are very widely used as coolants, solvents, thinning agents, fire extinguishers, burn rate modifiers or the flame retardants. They are present across. And when these, these are volatile in nature and these can escape by the virtue of their ability to trap energy and increase kinetic energy, they can overcome gravity and reach tropopause. When they reach the pause, they react with their eternal love. What is their eternal love? Ozone. Under the auspicious help of ultraviolet, they react resulting in the formation of chlorine monoxide and oxygen. Often this chlorine monoxide when reacts with under the ultraviolet here yeah? once reacts with the nascent oxygen forms the elemental chlorine and then oxygen ultimately this destroys ozone it is believed that one chlorine atom during its lifetime can destroy 100,000 ozone molecules one chlorine molecule can destroy 100,000 ozone molecules during its lifetime and please remember these are persistent they remain in the environment they remain in the pause or at the pause for hundreds of years you understand this and that is why these chlorinated fluorinated brominated compounds are called as ozone depleting substances how do they deplete they form monoxides bromine monoxide fluorine monoxide chlorine monoxides and thus destroy all ozone so here they persist 
Hence, the Montreal Protocol focused on gradual phasing out of these chlorinated, brominated, fluorinated compounds from usage. Altogether, they were termed as ozone depleting substances and they should be replaced by what? They should be replaced by the just remove chlorine. So, HFCs came into picture. Just remove chlorine. So, we have hydrofluorocarbons. We could avert the immediate danger, but these hydrofluorocarbons, though were not ozone depleting in nature, but they were greenhouse gases. You will understand this. So, to solve one problem, we designed a solution and this solution started creating another problem elsewhere. We wanted to solve a problem present in stratosphere. We designed a product and this product started creating problems within troposphere. You wanted to help your neighbors, damn it, you burnt your own house. How's that? You wanted to help neighbors. So first, damn it, help yourself. Save your home first, then think of neighbors. You understand this? So, that, that is Montreal. Montreal is gradual phasing out of chlorinated compounds which are ozone depleting in nature. We could achieve it. But those replacements came, they became greenhouse gases. Now, Kigali Amendment focused on what? Replacing HCFCs and HFCs because they are greenhouse gases. That means we have to invest more on R&D, research and development to design such products which are non-ozone depleting at the same time non-greenhouse gases. That is what we want, a new product. So this Kigali focus on such efforts. Amendment, amendment. So the, in India, India has ratified the Kigali amendment of the Montreal. Montreal is primarily to reduce the production distribution and utilization of ozone depleting substances, primarily 83-85. Now, Kigali Amendment started in 2016, now India has ratified Kigali Amendment, yes. So multilateral environmental agreement that regulates the production and consumption of nearly 100 man-made chemicals referred to as ozone depleting substances in general. 87, Montreal came into existence, theoretically 83 and waiting for ratification in 85 and came into effect or force from 87 but implemented in 89, yes, and to force in 89, it's the only UN treaty to be ratified by all UN members, it is almost one of the most successful protocols on planet Earth, the one and only probably, because no other protocol became so successful. That means ratified by almost all UN members. Based on the regulatory framework provided by the Vienna Convention on Protection of Ozone Layer. Vienna Convention 79 and this 83, what is this, the, uh, the, the 1983 Montreal, 85 ratification, 87 ready for implementation, 89 effect. Kigali Agreement was adopted in 2016 to phase down hydrofluorocarbons, HFC. HFCs were the substitutes to CFCs. Now HFCs are greenhouses. Now we have to substitute HFCs also. Yes. Entered into force in 2019. Divides nations into three groups with a four step path to achieve 80% reduction in HFC consumption by 2047. This is the target of Kigali amendment. Please understand this. Of Montreal protocol. What is the target here? Reduce HFCs to 80% of the present production and utilization value by 2047 here, yes. So globally almost many countries have ratified it, it is legally binding, yes. We are done with this I guess, yes. Methane assessment is done, right. Next is what? ISA. Why ISA is important for India? Because the only Headquarters which is present in India concerned with an international treaty. Gurga Haryana, we have this is concerned with International Solar Alliance. International Solar Alliance was a product of Paris Conference in 2015. France came forward to help India to tap solar energy for our day-to-day -day needs of individual people. 
Now we have more countries, 100 plus countries ratifying and supporting. And United Nations recently has issued an observer status to International Solar Alliance. This is considered as a success to India's initiative internationally. Now, International Solar Alliance would make or can invite all members of United Nations to become members of International Solar Alliance, which will increase the flow of funds and international cooperation. So this is the benefit of this allocating observer status to International Solar Alliance in the UN, UN General Assembly. So UN General Assembly confers observer status on the International Solar Alliance. Yes. So launched at Paris Climate Change Conference 15 to 2015 by the President of France and the Prime Minister of India. So only two countries were there in the beginning. Now we have 101, I guess, so countries. It's a multi-country partnership organization with membership from solar source rich countries between the two tropics, Capricorn and Cancer, you know that. So all the countries which are within Tropic of uh, Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, they get maximum solar insulation. So maximum solar insulation means you have high scope of tapping that hitherto untapped solar energy. So to tap that solar energy, we have this uh, International Solar Alliance here. So 101 countries have signed the International Solar Alliance Framework Agreement and 80 countries have signed and ratified the Solar Alliance Framework Agreement here in general. So that is how we have some. So what is the news here? United Nations General Assembly has conferred an observer status. That means the International Solar Alliance has accepted or it has received an international recognition. That is the news here. Yes. So, and then we will move on to the concept of uh, biological diversity. Just take a break now. Uh, I don't know for how long the break is going to be. 10 minutes, is it? So, after the post break, we'll talk about this concepts of biological diversity related contemporary issues and then the basic concepts associated with them. Just take a break and get back. We'll talk.
Yes. So this is what happens at the end of civil service exam preparation. So 11 lakh people apply. 4 lakh come to the prelims. Somewhere of 15, 20,000 remain till mains. 2,000, 500, 3,000 people remain in the interview. So 11 lakh people apply. So in the beginning of the class is like application time. 11 lakh people. Class is full. When the preliminary time comes, 4 lakh people. That means 7 lakh people disappear just with the name of preliminary exam, not even would attend the exam. They would apply, but will not. 7 lakh people will be completely ousted even you see the question paper, which is a joke, by the way. So see your classroom, that's the best example. Yes? So that is what is the difference between people who become successful, consistency, perseverance. It's not a cakewalk, it is not a, a T20, damn it. It is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So those who endure would last. Others perish. Just within two hours they perish. That's it, it's a simple thing. Anyways, getting back here, yes. Now this area is little tricky here. Why? Biological diversity and conservation related questions uh, wherein your guesswork most of the times goes wrong. More, uh, I don't know how many of you, uh, you know, have been giving the mock tests. Please remember you should give as many mock tests as possible, especially for preliminary examination, please instance. Get it? As many prelims mock test as possible. So the way you see the questions and answers given in the question paper must change. You get it? So for that you have to practice a lot. Yes. So often some people, it works for some people. Doesn't mean that it works for all. Six months prior to the prelims, their only preparation was through giving mock tests. We are not sure what was their strategy before six months of the prelims exam, but six months prior to the preliminary exam, their only strategy of preparation was giving mock test and learning from it and perfecting the art of answering multiple choice objective questions. And it works for some, works for some reason studies. Yes. Getting back here, this area the guesswork doesn't work, please understand this. So be a little cautious, that's all. Yes. So it is about what? E-D-N-A. Many people would think towards science and technology assuming that we can incorporate DNA into electronic things. It is like AI or machines with AI or robots or Sophia or whatever it is. Making you completely distracted. E-DNA is not electronic here, it is environmental. That means the first step itself you are likely to go wrong. So that is what is the very nature of the subject. Yes. So this concept is called as biomonitoring. Please remember it is quite natural that your surroundings have great deal of influence upon you and you also have great deal of influence on your surroundings. So eDNA concept works on this principle. It is like we have in medical science or uh, in anthropology also we discuss about this a test called as amniocentesis. Amniocentesis is nothing but taking the sample of amniotic fluid which has got similar genetic composition as that of the embryo. We look for any abnormalities in the, the, the DNA extracted from amniotic fluid and we assess, we anticipate similar genetic composition in the growing embryo without damaging the actual embryo. Similarly here, we take the sample from the surroundings of an organism and try to assess the genetic composition and the characteristic features of the very organism. Are you understand this? 
For example, in this room, if we extract the air samples, we'll have a lot of the dead hair follicles, dead skin cells in the air. Based on the analysis of those dead skin cell DNA, we can analyze what type of people sat here. What is their genetic composition? Whether their genetic structure was normal or not. Likewise, when we compare the environmental components across the globe, we can have a monitoring network across the globe reflected by environmental components. So we don't have to actually extract tissues from living organisms, thereby damaging their tissues. This is a new method of monitoring, please notice, monitoring, bio-monitoring. So the act of observing, it is the act of observing and assessing the state and ongoing changes in ecosystems. Please remember, surrounding environment affects you as an organism. You in turn would influence the surrounding environment. In general, non-human non creatures. Non-human creatures modify their surrounding environments to a lesser extent than humans. We know that. You understand this? Non-human creatures do not modify their surrounding environments as much as humans do. It's pretty simple thing, isn't it? We modify the natural environment more than any other creature. You understand this? That is how it is. So, for non-human creatures, assessing the environment is equivalent to assessing the organism itself. Not for humans. Are you understand this? Yes. So, ecosystems, components of biodiversity, landscape, including the types of natural habitats, populations and species. Please remember, we have a concept called as or environmental two components Possibilism and Determinism. Which are components of Darwinian evolution concepts. Wherein Charles Darwin by 1859 completely got convinced and explained to the world that whatever organisms are, they are because of their surrounding environments. Any change in the surrounding environment would result in change in the structure and function of living organisms. And this will be inherited by their offsprings and that's how evolution occurs. So environment centric evolution was Darwinian organic evolution. Please understand this. Whereas the opposite was Mendelian concept, you know that. In fact, the modern synthetic theories or the modern theories say that Evolution is not completely because of environmental changes and not solely because of genetic factors, rather a complex interaction between environmental factors as well as genetic components. A complex interaction results in evolution, not the only environmental factors or only genetic factors. Well, that's a modern perspective though. Here, Darwin says that environment and environment alone determines the what biological diversity. Determines size of population and population density and determines, please remember, Charles Darwin was the first person who authored a book by 1859-1861 called as Origin of Species, if you remember. That book is available on Amazon, you can buy and read it, original. That means modified printed, yes. So, Darwin was the first person who commented authentically with evidences that speciation occurs because of change in the environmental condition. And this adjustment of organisms to change the environmental conditions is the reason for evolution and that phenomenon is called as adaptation. That's what he mentioned. Adaptation, not adopt. It's adapt. So adaptation is the ability of an organism to modify itself from inside out suitable to environmental demands.
That's how he explained that we have multiple changes occurring in living organisms and then of course every organism struggles to survive, survival of the fittest, whichever modifies that would survive, that is fit. He gave multiple examples like Biston Mutilaria, Industrial Melanism, Moth, Peppered Moth, yes, that example and the uh, finch birds in Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador, yes, the Darwinian finches. As the environmental factors or food available change on each and every island, the shape, size and orientation of the beak of the finch also changed. So environment was the reason for change in the beak. So that is how Darwin arrived at components that is possibilism and determinism. What is environmental possibilism is environment allows some organisms to survive in certain environmental conditions. That means environment provides possibility for your survival by giving you a specific role. So that unique functional role played by an organism in a specific environmental setup is called as niche. So this is the opportunity provided by environment to you. So environment is giving you a possibility to survive to multiply, to reproduce, to multiply, to grow, evolve, ultimately to increase your population towards the future. So this perspective is called as environmental possibilism. To the contrary, we have something called as environmental determinism. That means environmental conditions doesn't allow the survival of certain organisms in it. For example, can you survive continuously inside the water? We cannot. So we can live with water inside us, but we cannot live inside the water because water acts as a determinant. That means it regulates our survival. It's a controlling factor. So certain environmental conditions would prevent the survival of certain organisms in them. So all in all, environment is what determines who survives, who doesn't or who cannot. So environment becomes the center of all changes occurring in living organisms is the perspective here. And the same is reflected here by extracting the samples, genetic samples from environment. We can go in for observation and assessment of what? Of changes in ecosystems. Please remember, biomonitoring is based on what? So we have the organisms which release certain kind of substances into their surrounding environment. Certain types of organisms can survive only in certain environments. So to monitor which type of organisms survive in which environments, we are not monitoring organisms but we are monitoring ecosystems. It's a different perspective which is non-invasive, less expensive perspective. For example, you must have studied in science, general science in general studies, we have a concept called as the index species of organisms. Index organisms or index species. Here stands. And at the same time, we have certain kind of organisms which in general is the indicator species. So index species and indicator species. So what do they do is they indicate a specific type of environmental condition in which they can survive. Are you able to understand this? Yes. So for example, we have freshwater organisms. They survive only when pollutant levels are minimum. So if you can see a fresh water, you can as well anticipate that this water may have that organism. Or if you find that organism, you can assume that water in which they are living now is fresh. So environment also gives hints to assess living organisms in it. Living organisms also help us to assess in which ecosystem they can live in. Please remember, so environment acts as a mirror of the biotic components within them. With this uh, nature of environment, we monitor, observe and monitor the ecosystems and changes occurring in them. This is one method. A new method though, 
so including the types of natural habitats populations and species yeah bio monitoring this is called as bio monitoring has become an indispensable tool for studying occupational and environmental exposure to chemicals including persistent organic pollutants please remember these pops are uh, conceptual things you must have studied about them what are these persistent organic pollutants here primarily what they are organic what is organic yes they have carbon hydrogen bonds not just carbon they have hydrocarbon bonds only then they are organic please understand this yes and they are persistent what do, what do you mean by persistent here persistent means they have very long lifespan they remain for a very long time period in the environment without undergoing major physical or chemical changes rather they are stable thermally chemically and stable that means they are non reactive in nature less reactive non reactive there is no substance which is non reactive truly yes they will be reactive with something else yes so these are organic and they remain they are called as forever chemicals forever chemicals example pesticides yes for example ddt yes ddt is virtually called as the immortal we have dirty dozen dirty dozen is the name of chemical substances primarily uh, ac across multiple conventions rotterdam also had this uh, and multiple other conventions had this prohibition on them yes basel rotterdam all those had dirty dozen were the initial substances which were banned or prohibited for production international trade or utilization because of their adverse impact on not only biological diversity but also on human health primarily they were used as pesticides you understand this for example your the chlordane aldrin chlordane endrin dialdrin dialdrin ddt so all these substances yes so these can be included as persistent organic pollutants here and lot of substances like organic solvents organic so thinning agents organic solvents and then pesticides these are for examples here these substances change the biotic components of a given ecosystem edna is isolated from environmental samples please understand from where do we get edna we get it from environmental samples what can be one environmental sample water small amount of water from a water body in a test tube that can be a sample air you understand this dust particles soil sample small amount of sample is enough yes we get the we, we can assess it in contrast to genomic dna that is extracted directly from specimens we do not excuse me for a minute okay yes we talk about edna here we get it from the environmental samples please understand this yes 
opposite to the sample we in general get to assess organisms what do we get is please remember you must have heard about a term called as biopsy what is biopsy we take the sample of a small tissue it can be one hair a strand of hair just a scraping from the epidermis or oral epithelial cells or a nasal mucosal epithelial tissues it can be anything a small sample of saliva blood can be anything what do we do we extract the dna from the cells which are taken from the sample and we go in for multiple tests and that to assess to monitor the genetic structure of that particular tissue this requires some amount of contact with the living organism which might result in damage to tissues biopsy to prevent this we have an alternative that is edna so what is genome here in general what do you understand by genome do not take this in a negative sense when i say that are you writing prelims this year that is to reinforce please remember you should remain unperturbed external environments may try to disrupt your confidence you should not lose it don't be so fragile be strong for example if you have a structure which sways to wind do you think the structure would remain for long she understands have such strong foundations others opinion should not affect your confidence i believe you are all grown ups don't be very sensitive upc is going to batter you he is about to crush you under its feet if you are sensitive you would perish like dust my intention is to strengthen you from the opposite direction needle is pierced into skin in opposite direction to your body only then drug enters please remember this not in the same line of your tissues always remember opposite is what attracts you reinforces you strengthens you come out of comfort zone please don't seek always a positive motivation try to get motivated by negativities and adversities as well if somebody says you would fail i would pass and show you that i will not fail that should be your attitude oh you said i will fail then i will fail i am gone damn it lkg student are you what are you ukg passed lkg pass ukg is it grow up you should be strong you understand nobody is going to tell you that be strong otherwise you cannot survive don't expect that others will keep telling you this what are you what's your age more than 20 25 between 25 is it don't act like kids you want to become a ms officer and rule the society ips officer and take ak47 pose and post these pictures in the facebook and instagram who are you what are you made of come on don't 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 try to be like you know so unstable or fragile or hypersensitive you know be strong your strength must increase based on adversity adversity must make you stronger not weaker you understand this challenge must make you victorious Do you think exam is conducted by UPSC to make you IAS officer or to eliminate you from the competition? How do you look at it? Yes, the exam is conducted to eliminate the non-serious candidates. UPSC need not support serious candidates; they would always emerge. Even in most adverse conditions, serious committed candidates would always survive. who would perish those who are not serious so examination is an elimination process not a selection process please remember this you get it these examinations are elimination processes not selection processes the who get selected those who do not get eliminated are you will understand this 
This exam is not to select you, to eliminate you. That means it is giving you a punishment first, test and lesson next. You understand this? I mean, you have to be strong. If I say that, are you going to write these prelims? Are you, uh, uh, do you know all these things? Doesn't mean that if you don't know, you will not qualify. There is no such thing. Please understand this. What we are learning here is just maybe 1 or 2 percent. If you don't know 1 or 2 percent, uh, you will not fail. Because you know rest of 98 percent. Look at that, what you have. If I say you will not fail or pass, please remember that. Now come on, don't drop down to that level. Now that fellow told, hence I failed. Black cat crossed my path, hence I failed. That lemon and chili combo on the road failed me. That fellow sneezed when I was going to prelims, hence I failed. What are you? Aliens? Don't be so fragile and weak. You are much stronger than that. You are going to become IAS and IPS officers and don't be so uh, weak willed or weak tempered. You understand this? My intention is to strengthen you in the opposite direction, not what would I get by discouraging you or saying that you won't or you can't. I don't have the right, I'm not entitled, but it is to just reinforce you. You understand this? It depends how you take it and how you look at the world. Whether you get scared by the adversity or you become stronger and move ahead by breaking the adversity. It, everything is a choice, please understand this. You get it? My approach is a little different. Probably students who are familiar with my way of discussion probably would be aware of this. My approach, my perspective is little different. Not conventional. You understand this? If I keep you comfortable, if I, if I discuss in a con conventional manner, you will come and sleep here, not there, here. Come out of this comfort zone. Don't expect that everybody will encourage you, everybody would wish for your success. No, society is very harsh. The environment is very rough out there. You need to be stronger to survive. You can't be sensitive. No, you can't afford to be sensitive. Sorry. Don't be weak. You understand this? But this is the stage where you need to prove yourself what you are and what you are not. Yes, getting back here. So, in general, what is genome here? The genetic material, entire genetic material of a given cell. In general, we take nuclear genetic material only. That means we take the DNA, of course, we cannot separate other things also from the nucleus. This is what we study in genome. Study of genome of an organism is genomics. Yes. So, this is called as the nuclear genome. What do you mean by nuclear genome? Do we have DNA elsewhere apart from nucleus? Yes. In animal cells, we have, apart from nucleus, mitochondria also have DNA. And in the case of plant cells, in the case of plant cells, apart from nucleus and mitochondria, they have, plant cells have other structures which are called as plastids, which perform photosynthesis. They also have DNA. In the case of bacteria, they have extra nuclear, extra chromosomal DNA, which is called as what? Where did you come across this plasmid? Please tell me in your science and technology. Question should not make you nervous. Question should excite you. You should transform yourself from the stage of becoming nervous from a question to the stage of becoming excited to a question. That is what your preparation should make you. Do you understand this? Well, the world is same, please remember. It's a choice what you become. You, understand? you must have studied about or you must have heard about at least this uh, very popular WhatsApp forward message. What is that? What are you? Potato or egg? Boiling water is same. Potato becomes softer, egg becomes harder. So the change is not in the environment. 
change is within you what do you become is a choice plasmid extra chromosomal circular dna fragments inside the cytoplasm of bacteria plasmid where do you come across this plasmid and why do you use it yes our dna technology you use a vector called as a plasmid this plasmid component is excised using a scissor what scissor restriction endonuclease restriction endonuclease is the enzyme gene scissors which we use in the rdna technology to separate the fragments of both vector plasmid as well as the desired gene fragment from the host genome and you take these two fragments and combine to synthesize a new dna what do you use to combine two things feviquick yes or no no feviquick can join anything and everything except broken hearts that is the caption they carry yes or no so what is the feviquick we use in rdna technology ligase enzyme you studied about all these things not new things to you you understand this ligase is the enzyme which is used as molecular glue or gene glue which is used in rdna technology to combine the two fragments of plasmid as well as the desired gene or gene of interest you combine these two and synthesize a new dna called as recombined dna otherwise called as recombinant dna and that recombinant dna is introduced into a suitable host for rapid multiplication and you extract the recombined dna for expression and this is the basic concept of the recombinant dna technology or genetic engineering or modern biotechnology that is what you learn yes or no please remember your concept should be as multidimensional as possible you get it sure definitely yes so our dna technology is a technology we employ to eliminate the species barriers we have to get or to synthesize a desired product or to produce a desired organism example bt you must have heard about bacillus thuringiensis is a soil bacterium which releases a bt endotoxin which is harmful to bollworm yes so to eliminate species barriers in general transfer of genetic material between organisms of same species is possible whereas between organisms of different species was not possible to eliminate this species barriers or restriction in transfer of genes or tissues between organisms which belong to different species we came up with a solution called as genetic engineering that means with the help of our dna technology we can transfer genetic material from any organism to any other organism irrespective of species variations you must have heard about multiple preliminary and mains questions like designer babies cloning somatic cell nuclear transfer surrogacy three parent baby all these things are applications of genetic engineering please understand this you get it all those are very important discussions in your science and technology for both preliminary as well as mains perspectives now here what yes restriction endonuclease yes so in general endonuclease and exonucleases are group of enzymes which are naturally released by dna during the process of replication please understand this during the process of replication dna fragments especially the parent template of dna releases certain hormones called as exonucleases and endonucleases these are for the correction of errors occurring during replication replication is the process in which one dna molecule produces identical dna molecule it is like photostat copy 
one DNA molecule produces identical DNA molecule called as replication. During this process in general we have multiple enzymes influencing this process and few such enzymes are exonucleases and endonucleases. So the function of endonuclease is in general to find flaws inside the structure of poly or you can say that the nucleotides in general. Yes. So restriction endonuclease is the modification of that enzyme to cut the fragment of DNA. Please remember fragment of DNA fragment of DNA is nothing but made of hydrogen bonds. Adenine thymine are bound by two hydrogen bonds. Guanine cytosine are bound by three hydrogen bonds. If you want to separate the fragments of DNA first you'll have to break these hydrogen bonds. Next, if you want to break these bonds, we have something called as nucleotides. Subsequent nucleotides are bound by phosphodiester bonds. Now these endonucleases work on this phosphodiester bonds. They break phosphodiester bonds resulting in the fragmentation of double strand DNA. If you want to separate the strands of DNA, you have to break hydrogen bonds. So two strands separate become singular strands. If you want to break DNA into horizontal pieces, you have to use or uh, you have to break phosphodiester bonds. Restriction endonuclease breaks those phosphodiester bonds separating nucleotides away from each other. Now this restriction endonuclease is used across the genetics laboratories as a scissor, gene scissor or molecular scissor because it helps in fragmentation, separation of the genes or the fragments of DNA. It is used at specific locations both in plasmid as well as the host genome. In plasmid to create a space for the attachment of desired gene. In the host genome to separate the desired gene from the rest of the genome. So we separate these two and bring together to combine these two to synthesize a brand new DNA. And that brand new DNA is by the virtue of the process of ligation using the enzyme ligase. So when once you use ligase, please remember ligase is an enzyme which is seen both in replication and transcription naturally as well. Please understand this. You must have studied that replication as a process of producing identical copy of DNA. We have something called as a DNA producing RNA as transcription. DNA produces RNA for the purpose of protein synthesis we know that. During these processes ligase is a natural enzyme released. Natural enzyme which is naturally released by both DNA and during the process of transcription as well. So the function of ligase is to bring two nitrogen bases together or two nucleotides together. So ligase establishes phosphodiester bonds whereas restriction endonuclease breaks phosphodiester bonds. Once phosphodiester bonds are re-established, fragments of DNA get attached with each other. Irrespective of species variations, the beauty of life is the structure of DNA is same right from archaea bacteria which formed 3.5 billion of years ago till humans who are modern day living organisms considered as most evolved. Structure of DNA is same. We take the advantage of similarity in the structure of DNA and resort to our DNA technology. Because the phosphodiester bond structure is same. Restriction endonuclease breaks those phosphodiester bonds in whichever organism we apply. Ligase establishes phosphodiester bonds between whichever organism's genes you combine. Irrespective of species variations. That means you eliminate species barriers. Please understand this. You can combine the DNA of any organisms. Bt cotton, bacterium and cotton plant. What is, where is the linkage? Yet we could combine and prepare GM crop, genetically modified crop or transgenic organisms. You understand this? So this is by the virtue of the ligase enzyme capable of establishing phosphodiester bonds and attach any gene fragments between any species. 
So we are here combining the vector plasmid from bacterium especially the E. coli very popular widely studied and the gene fragment from the host whichever organism is the host. So we combine these two to synthesize RDNA. Yes. So this is RDNA technology's core principle getting back here that is genomic difference. When we say genomic DNA we especially mean nuclear genomic DNA. Please understand this. What do you mean by nuclear D genomic DNA? Do we have any other DNA? Yes. We have extra nuclear DNA. Where is it present? In animal cells, mitochondria have. In plant cells, plastids. plastids also. Apart from nucleus, apart from mitochondria, we have in plastids also, in plant cells. This is a variation here. So, why not genomic DNA? Why we should extract a DNA from environmental samples? Why not? Why can't we take directly from organisms? Please remember, we have some advantages. It originates. What? What is this it? Environmental DNA. It originates from cellular material shed by organisms via skin, excrement, etc. That means if we, as I said, if we can take the sample of air in this room, we will have the dead skins released by all of your body cells. Hair follicles, dead skin or fluid, whatever it is. So this air in this room will have the sample DNA from all living organisms present in this room. That is what we are looking at. So these are released by organisms. For example, if you take the sample from a water body, that water sample will have DNA from organisms living within water. That is what we are looking at. Into aquatic or terrestrial environments, that can be sampled and monitored using a new molecular method. That means we can monitor, we can assess the living organisms present in a given environment. Not by examining living organisms, but by examining their environment. That is what is E. E is environmental. How can we have DNA in the environment? This DNA is released by the living organisms in that environment. That is what we are extracting. Yes. So what are the benefits? Restore water quality, that means we can, we can ensure that water quality can be maintained so that we can have the habitable environment for specific type of organisms. That means if you can monitor DNA in the samples, you can as well monitor toxins also in the samples. That is how you can make water, uh, you can change the quality of the water, save dwindling species from extinction, you can detect the decline in the number of organisms in a given sample of environmental component and thereby take measures to conserve that species and prevent it from becoming extinct. Early detection of invasive species, what are invasive species? You must have studied about this invasive species. Yes, so here Alien species, alien to one ecosystem. Please remember, globally speaking, no two ecosystems are identical. For every organism living in a particular ecosystem, an organism from another ecosystem is alien. Please understand this. What kind of alien? Ecological alien. Are you understand this? Alien is not necessarily from another planet. Are you understand this? Yes? For example, we say, Tribal cultures of northeastern part of India, when we go there, we are cultural aliens to them. Cultural aliens. Are you will understand this. When you go to neighboring state, you say you go to Maharashtra, you go to Odisha, you are a linguistic alien. Are you not? Linguistic. That means alienization or alien is new, different. That's it. Whoever is different from that of yours is an alien to you. Alien is not necessarily extraterrestrial. You understand this? So, whenever we introduce an alien species of living organism into a native ecosystem, if that newly introduced organism overconsumes the nutrients, overgrows and outcompetes the native species, such an organism is called as invasive species. Please understand this. If that alien species is deliberately introduced, aesthetically introduced, accidentally introduced, 
still there is a possibility of invasive species. Are you understand this? So in such scenarios, we'll have invasive species. So we can monitor. Not all invasive species are visible. Are you understand this? So if invasive species is invisible, how can we detect them? eDNA. Because we know the normal genetic composition of native species. If in the sample there is a strange DNA sample, that means there is an invasive species. Are you able to understand this? So that's how we can detect invisible alien invasive species. And then we can take measures to conserve the native species. Detection of rare and cryptic species. Rare species can be detected. Cryptic species can be detected. That means which are not usual, maybe a product of evolution. Yes, or we can detect the strange diseases or pathogens or germs as well in the surrounding environment. So we can have multiple applications. Advantages of eDNA, that is, we can collect this DNA with relative ease. Collection of sample is easy. Anybody can collect this sample and get it to the lab. Four ounce water sample can capture remnant DNA from thousands of aquatic species. That means very small amount of sample is sufficient to monitor large number of organisms. Traditional biomonitoring methods, scientists count individual species and their abundance at just few sites. So traditional methods are non-comprehensive, not inclusive. This method doesn't require killing wildlife for identification. Labor and cost effective. One person can collect samples in a large geographical region within short duration of time. This process requires just a cheap filter, a syringe and vial and anyone can do it. We are looking at eDNA, a potential topic. The moment the eDNA term appears in front of you, your thoughts go in a different direction. Just for the sake of it, we are explaining this. Carbon watch, it's a simple thing. It's just a kind of app here to understand the footprint. What is carbon footprint? Amount of carbon emitted by one person in relation to amount of carbon consumed. In a sense, emitted, saved. And You understand this? Based on your activities, that means right from the time you wake up in the morning till you sleep and during your sleep also. The amount of carbon dioxide you release, adding that much amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to amount of carbon dioxide you prevent from get being released into the atmosphere. That ratio, the gap is your footprint. Please understand this. How can you uh, prevent carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere? How can you do? Plant a tree. Use electric vehicle. Are you able to understand this? So, because of all these activities, what are you doing? Otherwise, if you have used a fossil fuel based vehicle, you must have emitted some carbon dioxide. You prevented it by using electric vehicle. Are you able to understand this? By consuming less electricity produced because of fossil fuel consumption. So, you saved. That means you prevented some carbon dioxide from being emitted in the atmosphere. Are you not trying this? Like, there's a gap between these two. That gap per capita is that individual's carbon footprint. If emission is greater than prevention of emission, you have a positive footprint. You are releasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Negative is a rare thing, unless you are a plant. What is negative? Prevention of carbon dioxide emission into the atmosphere is greater than emitting. For humans, it is not possible. Please understand this. A negative carbon. Then what is carbon neutral? Both are equivalent. Are you to understand this? That's about carbon footprint. Footprint is not foot, but the signature. What is signature? Whatever is, whatever is released by you, is you will have your signature. Please understand this. In a sense, you are responsible for it in that sense yes so that's how it is and in india we have produced a app which monitors please remember how can app monitor what you are releasing 
Well, it will have some questions, you will have to answer it. Based on the way you answer, it will give a result in the form of what? Today your carbon, it is like your calorie intake and calorie you have spent based on the questions you answer. How many steps did you walk? What kind of food you, eat, you ate? And how many calories are there in the food? And calculate simple. It's like calculator, please understand this. You get it? So that's how it is. So that's a carbon watch. Yes. So we have convention on biological diversity. We had a 15th conference of parties concerned with convention on biological diversity. Conference of parties concerned with convention on framework, a framework convention on climate change is different. So conference of parties concerned with convention on biological diversity is different. So that's the uh, variation you have here. Where this occurred? Kunming, China. But don't worry about it because it was you know, it's a, it's a virtual event here. Yes. So, what is this all about here? So, adoption of Kunming Declaration. If at all there is a question, because this is the only thing concerned with this uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, which happened in the recent past on international platform. It is a convention, a conference. Yes. So, uh, we have this. The declaration called for urgent and integrated action to reflect biodiversity considerations in all sectors of the global economy. That means what impact, what economic impact biological diversity has globally and it should be conserved, it should be taken care of is the objective here. More than 100 nations including India made commitments. That means we also had some commitments given. Now that is where this becomes our interest. So we have some stake in that. Yes. So, what are the components where India is concerned? Ensure the development, adoption and implementation of effective post-2020 global biodiversity framework. What is global biodiversity framework here? Please follow all the components of Cartagena and Nogaya protocol. That's all nothing else. So, Cartagena protocol biosafety. That means cross-border trade movement of this organisms which may have adverse impacts in one native ecosystems. Second is Nagoya protocol that is equitable distribution of the benefits arising out of genetic diversity. That means you should let people use the advantage of genetic diversity which you your ecosystems have and you will also have equal access to genetic resources present elsewhere. So that is how it is. So you have to follow the protocols of convention on biological diversity here. Reverse the current loss of biodiversity. What is the loss? Loss because of poaching, because of habitat destruction, because of industrialization, because of deforestation, because of disappearance of wetlands. All these things are happening which are threats and loss of biodiversity. We should reverse it. That is the objective. It's a simple thing here. Ensure that biodiversity is put on a path to recovery by 2030 at the latest. So by 2030, we should ensure that biological diversity would recover. So efforts and commitments of many countries. It's a simple thing. Target is 2030. We have India has got some obligations and 15th conference of parties concerned with CBD. India is a participant. That is where we have this here. Yes. So. It is not very important for you because uh, it is just a amendment to legislation which already existed in India. So just amendment here. Yes. Next concept is possibly extinct species. India, we have introduced this. Please understand. Of course, IUCN already has you know this concept here. Number of animals and plants have been listed as possibly extinct in the latest edition of the IUCN. Please understand. Here you have to understand about what IUCN. What is this IUCN? Excellent. So we have this IUCN concept. So 1964, this concept, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So we, this concept formulated in 1964 itself here yeah, as the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Nature includes natural resources, includes all flora and fauna here. And this publishes a list of organisms. List of organisms which include flora and fauna but doesn't include microorganisms. Please understand this. Uh, are you seeing red list? A red list. Please understand. Red has got some significance here. So doesn't include microorganisms. Includes flora that is plants and also includes organisms which are not microorganisms. Animals. That means right from fungi. 
from fungi iucn would include so fungi plants animals you must talk about five kingdom classification of living organisms by rh whitaker so we have monera protista i will understand this monera protista then we have kingdom fungi then plantae then animalia i will understand this five kingdoms but we don't have inclusion of viruses don't worry about it yes so monera monera means what the unicellular prokaryotic protista unicellular eukaryotic fungi uni multicellular eukaryotic plants multicellular eukaryotic autotrophic animals multicellular eukaryotic heterotrophic so five kingdoms you understand the rh whitaker classification in that first two kingdoms are not counted not considered by iucn red list that means no monerans no protistans would be considered by iucn but only fungi plants animals only these three would be considered here yes so this publishes world's most comprehensive information source on the global extinction risk status please understand global iucn covers all organisms on the planet earth globally extinction risk status it is given in nine different categories that how likely one species is going to become extinct in the near future so that is published by this iucn only for this publication iucn is popular that's it nothing else so this is about which includes what so fungi plants animals no microorganisms you may have a question like which of the following organisms are included under iucn red list if they give a microorganisms name you will be in trouble and if you don't know that that organism is a microorganism that is a bigger trouble and if you don't know the scientific name of all organisms given in the list don't try that question that's over for you do you understand this well in that sense that's a tricky question that's why because scientific names are we'll give you a sample how unique these scientific names would be yes yes so this is the entire list what we are worried about is only these three please understand us just these are threatened categories or categories under threat what are they here critically endangered 90% of the population and 90% of the habitat are already lost if immediate conservation efforts are not taken in the next 10 years this critically endangered species may become extinct critically endangered 90% is gone lost endangered 70% is gone 70% of the organisms species organisms 70% of its natural habitat is gone destroyed because of human activities largely and conservation efforts must be on priority basis for these endangered species if care is not taken to conserve them in the next one decade they might become critically endangered next is vulnerable 50% of the organisms population is already lost 50% of their natural habitat is destroyed if conservation efforts are not put forth on priority basis in the next one decade this vulnerable species may enter endangered category and please remember organisms in these categories are listed on papers on pages with specific colors if there is an organism included under red colored pages assume that that organism is critically endangered orange yellow orange means endangered yellow means vulnerable we should worry about only these three why because only these three categories of organisms need immediate conservation efforts these are already extinct you can do little about them and these need not be considered on priority basis because they still have a lot of population left and their natural habitat is present for more than 50% of its extent so these are not threatened categories organisms in this but only three so your conservation efforts globally should focus on organisms listed under three categories red orange yellow critically endangered endangered vulnerable only those organisms must be concerned other organisms other categories you don't have to worry about them yes 
So that is IUCN here, yes. So globally we have 1,42,500 species currently, currently means by 2021-22. 1,42,500 species on the IUCN red list with more than 40,000 species threatened with extinction. Threatened means critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, yes. Including 41% of amphibians, most vulnerable organisms on the planet right now are amphibians. And our western guards is home. Anyways, we'll talk about them. 37% of sharks and rays, 34% of conifers, 33% of reef building corals, 26% of mammals and 13% of birds. So you can have a look at these things. Just try to remember, it's okay. IUCN publication of red list is otherwise called as what? Barometer of life. If at all there is a question on which of the following is concerned with barometer of life? Barometer of life. You understand this? If you are not aware of this, barometer will take you in a different direction. Please understand this. Simple term barometer will take you in a different direction. If you are not aware of this. The difference is all about knowing or not knowing. That's it. That's over. That's what makes the difference. You know it or you don't. That's it. Your preparation is an effort to know things, that's all. As many as possible. Yes? So, barometer measures the pressure in general. But here what? IUCN red list measures the pressures acting on species. What kind of pressures? Well, we have multiple. Environmental disasters and all these changes, climate change and human. So, natural pressures. But Darwin has a different perspective. Pressure is good, environmental pressure is positive, says Darwin, because it changes you for your own good. So hence Darwin always considers natural, natural pressures as selection pressure. What is selection pressure? Because environmental stimuli always demand an organism to change itself. And this in general change, if it proves to be advantageous, that organism evolves. Natural selection, please understand this. Darwin proposed a theory called as theory of natural selection. Those organisms with advantageous modifications would survive, eventually multiply and evolve. Those organisms without advantageous modifications would eventually perish and become extinct. So here nature plays an important role in selecting which organism would survive, which would perish. Hence, natural selection. Darwin views this pressure as positive, but here we are viewing this pressure as negative. Are you understand this? So, here natural environmental pressures and anthropological pressures. What is the pressure created by humans? We call it as development. For us is development, for them it is, it's a pressure. Do you understand this? That's how it is, yes. It is like a, you have a, a Telugu proverb, right? Here my friends were saying, Venki's marriage is Subbi's death. Uh, something like that, yes. Yes or no? You must have heard about this? Exactly. What development is for you is a survival challenge for living organisms. Do you understand this? Yes. So, Pressures acting on species. So IUCN red list measures the pressure. But what kind of pressure? On whom? That's barometer of life. Please understand this. Yes. Which guides and informs conservation actions to help prevent extinctions. This is why the IUCN red list is referred as barometer of life. Just these terms cannot be guessed. That is why I'm just showing all these things here. So we're looking at possibly extinct species concept here. Yes. So number of animals and plants have been listed as possibly extinct in the latest edition of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, red list of threatened species. Possibly extinct. Earlier we never had a place for this kind of category. Extinct, extinct in the wild or regionally extinct. Next comes critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable. And the other things are just not very significant. You understand this? So, but here is a new category. What is that? Possibly extinct. That means we don't know. 
possibly it is extinct yes so the term is taken as a marker to estimate when the presence or population of the species has declined number one first component is what the population or presence is that means you are not able to observe that organism's presence anywhere and its population is not seen anywhere population of species has declined species marked as possibly extinct have been last assessed in the 1900s post which their presence and updates to their population has not been found so after the year 1900 or 1900s their presence is not recorded anywhere on the earth not by any government so that or those organisms can also be considered as possibly extinct Indian species that are possibly extinct just for the sake of your understanding IUCN website has got this this is directly lifted from IUCN website please understand possibly extinct species in India because we have no record of their presence in the past multiple decades we have no record of their presence nobody has recorded that they existed and those by IUCN has been included under possibly extinct in India yes so, tentacle, so it is just a factual thing please I'll share this PPT with you you can just have a look at them have a glance before you go to exam if you have time anyways just remember all these things is not an easy task among your thousands of things you remember yes so few organisms often UPSC uh, you know uh, is asking some unique names of um, organisms and asking their IUCN status not only IUCN status but its site status as well nowadays what are those things here number one is pangolin Indian pangolin what is a pangolin you must have seen this if you haven't if you haven't seen yes for your reference uh, this is a pangolin Whenever it is threatened, whenever it gets scared, it rolls into a ball-like structure with scales all around. And no organism, even a lion, can kill it when it gets rolled. It doesn't get destroyed. You throw it in the rocks, you throw away, you throw it in the water, you try to just break it into pieces, you can't do anything about it. It's, it's a protection, yes? So, it is poached for its meat. Probably some... some carnivores creatures they may love exotic meat so and scales are used for making belts bags or artifacts yes please yes so Indian pangolin Manis crassicordata so we have this scientific names often would be significant so for your reference if you want so these organisms which necessitate a kind of conservation efforts are mentioned here which were in use in the recent past especially concerned with sites what is sites here convention on international trade concerned with endangered species very simple it is sites convention India is a signatory yes so sites appendix one what is appendix one here sites you just need so we have Odisha government has stressed on monitoring of poaching of pangolin in India so it has showed its concern that their numbers are declining yes IUCN status is what endangered so sites here is the convention India is signatory here 1973 was drafted and 1979 so we have this international scope here and many countries of United Nations are members of sites. India is also a signatory here. So we have appendix 1, appendix 1, appendix 2, appendix 3. Don't worry about 3 here. One is more important. Trade is permitted only in exceptional circumstances. 3% of all species on the planet Earth are only permitted. And trade is permitted only for conservation efforts if its natural habitat is 100% destroyed in a given country. Are you understand this? If one species natural habitat is 100% destroyed in a country, and that country cannot conserve those animals in such circumstances that organism that species can be traded exported and given to another country only under such exceptional circumstances countries can trade in such endangered organisms of both flora and fauna those will be included under appendix one and indian pangolin is 
mentioned in appendix 1 of sites. So that is significance and we have trade is controlled that means quantity is controlled that means you cannot trade in large quantities that means you can trade in small quantities for specific purposes like manufacturing of medicines, life saving drugs or any kind of translocation of some organisms because of temporary disturbances in the natural habitat or because of natural uh, disasters. So you can have some excuses here. Yeah? And appendix 3 you don't have to worry about only in a particular country in organisms trade is restricted not in all other places. So appendix 1 organisms are more important here because uh, their trade is completely prohibited 97% of the trade is prohibited only 3% under exceptional circumstances would be permitted. For example right from its inception of sites as you can see here so pangolin has been given the appendix 1 status in the recent past. Why it is in use because in India it is recently declared yes so you can see multiple organisms which have entered appendix 1 status in the past across the globe. Sites is global please instance. Yes. So that is the status here of uh, pangolin, Indian pangolin, Manis Crossica data here. So the next component Iusin is done here, barometer done. Caracal, we are looking at biodiversity in India please instance. So what is a caracal here, caracal, caracal, it is a kind of cat which is you know uh, kind of uh, critically endangered as you can see here. Oh, this is the caracal. Why it is important? It has got a unique talent. It can catch birds in flight. No bird can escape the hands of this cat. Any bird when it is in flight it will catch. This is the only organism on the planet earth which can catch birds in flight. Okay, fine. So, it is uh, critically endangered here. So, we have this. Yes. So, next is what? Indian star tortoise. Geochilone elegans. Geochilone elegans is scientific name. Indian star tortoise. Yes. So, vulnerable IUCN red list. Yes. So, appendix 1 cites appendix 1 here. Yes. Critically endangered. Critically endangered. Yes. For your reference, this is the Indian star tortoise. It is vulnerable in India. So, it is recently added in 2019 20 into vulnerable category from India. Indian star tortoise, please understand this. Yes. Next important in news uh, recently, it was awarded a GI tag from Jammu and Kashmir. Of course, in Uttarakhand also it is present, Himachal also it is present, but more abundance or abundantly cultivated in Jammu and Kashmir now. One kilogram of this mushroom is approximately 36,000 in white market and 1 lakh rupees in the black market. 1 lakh per kilo. It's a mushroom. How much is a mushroom cost? 1 kilogram here? 100? 200. 1? 120 rupees is normal edible mushroom. This is in black market 1 lakh rupees. And recently GI tag was given to this. Now when we say mushroom, what is a mushroom? It is a, not all fungi are edible, please understand. Few are edible. Till 2021 we used to assume that colored fungi, colored mushrooms are poisonous or toxic and white fungi are edible, we used to assume. But recently we have a fungus which is white in color, deadly. And this is Amanitophyllidus. Amanitophyllidus is the white colored mushroom. It's a fungus which is deadly. Even if you go near to it and inhale the dust released by it, you would die within the next few minutes. You understand this? A deadly mushroom. Till last year we used to assume that colored red, blue or very brightly colored fungi as deadly, toxic, poisonous fungi. And white, you know, white mushrooms were never considered as deadly or uh, toxic. Now we have one which is white fungus. So you never know now. So be cautious. So why this Gucci? What is this Gucci or moral here? So it has got lot of medicinal values. Now that is why it is exported. Nowadays you go to Instagram, many people are 
uploading their reels of eating this uh, Gucci biryani. The cost of which is one plate is 10,000 rupees. In a normal Jammu and Kashmir restaurant, normal, not a five star. Five star just add zeros, that's all. Yes. So, expensive mushrooms grown in Jammu and Kashmir, Doda district. Now it is cultivated uh, deliberately because the cost is great, so to get the profits. Gachi mushroom is species of fungus in the family Morchellaceae of Ascomycota. You just, you just don't have to worry about these things. They are pale yellow in color with large pits, ridges on the surface of the cap, raised on a large white stem. It has received a GI tag in the recent past year. If you want to have a look at this, this is it. Gucci mushroom, Jammu and Kashmir. Yes. Health benefits rich in potassium, vitamins, and copper. Rich source of vitamin D apart from several B vitamins. So, nutrient loaded. Rich in antioxidants that prevent health issues including heart disease, diabetes and removing reactive oxygen species that harm the body. Reactive oxygen species are nothing but the free radicals which cause cancers. So, it is rich in antioxidants. So, prevents cancer. Okay. You can sell anything and everything in the name of medicine in India. Come on. Gucci GI tag. Yes. Mandarin duck. The most beautiful duck on the planet earth. That's how it is popular as. Recently it was seen in India. Yes. So we, we thought that it is seen only in temperate regions of northern parts of China, Japan and Europe, Russia, Siberia. But surprisingly, uh, we have visited this in Assam. We'll see that. So it was spotted at Maguri Motapung Beel. Beel means it's a Ramsar wetland here in Tinsukia district. Dibrugar, Tinsukia are the northeastern tip of Assam district, Assam state, which are closely related to Arunachal. Meghalaya on one side and Arunachal on the other side. Yes. Mandarin duck was recently spotted in Dibru Saikova National Park in Upper Assam's Tinsukia district in February. So it was a spotting after a very surprise you know, visit here. So the most beautiful duck in the world. I'll show you the picture if you want. So that's how it is. Yes. Yes. And a giant leatherback turtle. If at all you want to, yes. Dermochilis coriaceae, largest of all living turtles and the heaviest non-crocodilian reptile. These are the unique things here. So what's the news here? Yes. So in Andaman Nicobar Islands, because of increased tourism, this organism is threatened. It is becoming vulnerable. And its population is rapidly declining in Andaman Nicobar Islands because of tourism. Yes. So Andaman Nicobar Islands, so they have urged government of India to protect this, the turtles. So we have giant leatherback turtle here. So this is a very large uh, uh, turtle here as you can see the picture and uh, people play with it and kill it or harm it or because of the uh, fishing trawlers, nets, fishing nets or the boats they damage this. These are very large in size and slow moving here. Silicanth as we said earlier, Latimeria columnae. Latimeria columnae is considered as extinct along with dinosaurs. You can imagine an organism which lived along with dinosaurs is still present. Latimeria columnae, that is your silicanth. It is less of a fish, more of a reptile, but is seen in deep oceans, 2300 feet deep in ocean, and a shy organism, rarely seen organism. It was considered as extinct 66 million years ago. Now it is nowadays seen in Indian Ocean regions. Yes. So, uh, no, no. It is not. We cannot say that because 66 million years ago things were different. Earth was different. Now it is seen in Indian Ocean region. So we cannot comment on the endemic nature of that now. So in that sense, yes. So silicons follow the oldest known living lineage of fishes. Please remember we all believe that the terrestrial life evolved from aquatic ancestors. Please understand this. How can we say? Please observe the embryonic stages of multiple 
reptiles, birds and mammals, they all have gill slits in the embryonic stages. Gill slits in embryonic stages indicate that we evolved from common aquatic ancestor. Please remember this is the evidence we have embryologically speaking. Are you able to understand this? So reptiles, birds, mammals, embryonic stages have gill slits. What do you mean by gill slits? What do you mean by gill slits here? Yes? What do you mean by gill slits here? So we have... Hey, yes? So, water is taken through mouth by fishes. Please understand this. All it level. Water is taken through mouth and water exits through gills. Gills have mucous membranes which can absorb dissolved oxygen in the water. And based on simple diffusion process, oxygen in the water enters the bloodstream of fishes. This is a normal process of respiration or extracting oxygen in aquatic organisms. For this purpose, they have gill slits. These are called as gill slits. Why should terrestrial, that is reptiles, birds and mammals have gill slits in their embryonic stages? It, they indicate, it is again a Darwinian concept saying that recapitulation, theory of recapitulation, ontogeny repeats and resembles phylogeny. History repeats by itself, you must have heard about this. It is called as Darwinian concept of theory of recapitulation, ontogeny resembles phylogeny. What is ontogeny? Ontogeny is the stage in general, the developmental stages of an organism right from single celled stage that is your zygote, fertilized ovum to a complex multicellular giant creature what you are. Relative to zygote you are giant that is single cell. So, from one unicellular simple organism to multicellular complex organism you develop, this is not new, it resembles evolution that the present day complex multicellular organisms evolved from simple past unicellular organisms that is archaea and bacteria 3.5 billion years ago. So, this ontogeny, single celled zygote developing into fully grown multicellular organism, this ontogeny resembles phylogeny. Phylogeny is evolutionary stages of all organisms on the planet earth historically speaking. So, ontogeny resembles phylogeny is what similar to history repeats by itself. Are you able to understand this? Yes. So, that is what is happening here in general getting back here. Yes. So, that is how we can say that we evolved from aquatic ancestors. So are reptiles. Reptiles evolved from aquatic ancestors. And coelacanth, that is how it is considered as a living fossil between the aquatic ancestors and modern day reptiles. A living fossil, please understand this. What is a fossil? It is lived in the past and which is no more alive. What is a living fossil? an organism which is currently alive which connects two different lineages of organisms from past to present that's a living fossil and remember we have one more thing which is which can be answered uh, answered to a question living fossil which is called as what in genetics that's how we introduce in evolution that's how we introduce dna how do we introduce dna we introduce dna as living fossil. That means in our ancestors 3.5 billion years ago they had DNA in a similar structure. We also have DNA in a similar structure. Hence we consider that DNA is a living fossil. It was present in the fossilized organisms. It is present in the living organisms as well. Hence we introduce DNA as a living fossil. But such organisms which are connecting links between extinct fossilized organisms and present day organisms which can be seen even alive today are called as living fossils. One such is silicanth which was found in Indian Ocean. So thought to become 66 extinct 66 million years ago come on so dinosaurs well probably lived and became extinct some of them yes discovered in 1938 considered as living fossil the west indian ocean silicanth is i use in critically endangered species and recently it was included in appendix one of sites so it looks please remember it has got eight fins eight fins which resemble the limbs 
more than fins they resemble limbs they, they look like limbs that means probably they were evolving from fishes to become reptiles so they connect both fishes and reptiles you understand this and that's how we consider them as living fossils to aquatic between aquatic and terrestrial ancestors black naked crane and of course why we have a kind of cultural background here recently what happened here the buddhist monks started protesting we'll see that yes so buddhist monks are opposing arunachal pradesh government's efforts of renewing hydropower project because of power shortages arunachal pradesh or multiple himachal pradesh multiple multiple states are uh, renewing their hydropower you know uh, situations that means they want to tap the hydropower and they are building lot of uh, hydropower projects across whatever the water source they have across the northern northeast states yeah yes and local buddhist monks are opposing it so this, this is a recent development yeah and why because that affects these hydropower projects would affect the birds habitat natural habitat of this bird is affected and because of this birds cultural significance as embodiment of sixth dalai lama that is the problem with buddhists that is why buddhists are worried about the habitat destruction of this crane they consider that this crane is the embodiment that means reflection of the sixth dalai lama yes and it is also the state bird of ladakh state bird what is that here grus nigricollis yes so near threatened is iucn status please remember habitat of this bird is being destroyed are you able to understand this for cultural reasons that is the significance here sides appendix 1 black necked crane black necked crane please understand this uh, this is in india only please understand this that's what is the problem here olive ridley very popular i am expecting this can be a question here depends yes so odisha high court has taken sumo to cognizance of the death of around 800 olive ridley sea turtles due to negligence by odisha's forest and fisheries departments yes so what's the problem with olive ridley they are our guests what is this here so synchronized mass nesting phenomena synchronized mass nesting that means they resemble each other they come in groups and lay their eggs on the coast of odisha gahir mata synchronized mass nesting phenomena is called as what aribada now 800 olive ridleys died because of negligence maybe some people wanted to eat it maybe they wanted some exotic meat or we don't know or accidentally they were killed we don't know yes so the thousands of females come together on the same beach to lay eggs what happens here is what unique development as you can see here females return to the same beach from they they hatched please understand this we don't know how they remember it males don't ask about them they are romeos females come back from the same beach they were hatched i you don't understand this that is what you need to remember so females return female olive ridleys return to the same beach from where they hatched that means they remember and you don't remember last year things current affairs preliminary exam becomes a toughest exam where question and answer both are given that is not a discouragement uh, the, sh- the, the the lectures must come with a disclaimer i guess sensitive content do not overthink do you understand that yes normally we give this disclaimer to very young children of say 10 years 15 years because they don't know the world they haven't seen anything you your half of life is over well professional life come on 
Yes? Yes. So we have in the Indian Ocean, females return to the same beach. That's a wonder, isn't it? We forget the route to the home often. And they come back to the beach where they were hatched. That's a wonder. Hurry, brother. They lay their eggs in conical nests about 1.5 feet deep, which they laboriously dig with their hind flippers. So in the Indian Ocean, the majority of the olive lays nest in two or three large assemblies near Gahir Mata, Odisha. Are you seeing vulnerable sites appendix one? Just remember these things. If you want to have a look at them, yes. Synchronized. And they remember. Now it's your turn. Yes. So that's uh, Olive Ridley. Sivakthan, very popular, very famous in cosmetics, very famous in as a food preservative, in foodstuffs, flavoring agent, preservative. Yes, so Sivakthan is very widely used. Why? Because it is frost resistant. You can store substances made of Sivakthan for years together in the refrigerator. Even freezing doesn't destroy its properties. Why? Because it is frost resistant. So what? This feature is taken. Exceptionally hardy plant able to withstand winter temperatures. Why? Himachal Pradesh government decided to plant Sivakthan in cold desert region to provide food source and to prevent erosion and to maintain the soil nutrient status in cold desert region of Himachal Pradesh. Entire state is cold desert, Himachal Pradesh. Please understand this. Now they have decided to grow this. Yes. So hypophae is the scientific name here. Hypophae rhamnoides. Hypophae develops an aggressive and extensive root system and is planted to inhibit soil erosion used in land reclamation for its nitrogen fixing properties, wildlife habitat and soil enrichment. It has got medicinal and food nutrient value as well. Uh, berries and leaves are man manufactured into various human and animal food and skin care products in general. So it is, yes. So this would be more than enough for you uh, in a sense within this time. There is no limit and it depends on your own patience, perseverance and consistency, your own limitations. As I said, Time is the main constraint here and as individuals we cannot know anything and everything. No single individual knows all things about anything. We have some limitations. You understand this? I will share these things with you and if possible I will give you little more than what I have. You can always and please remember these things were of some help to you and it's a continuous process. Please understand this. Your contemporary development study is a continuous process. You can never ever say that your preparation is complete concerned with contemporary developments or current affairs. Every day is a, a learning thing for you till the month of exam. I guess the days are very near. Why we have to emphasize more on environment is 5th June. We have some significance towards one subject more than any other subject. What is that subject? This is the subject. Remember the day of the exam. 5th June, right? What is that? Uh, you talk about UNEP, environment, a lot of stuff. Expect some questions because of the significance of the day of the exam. But question paper is probably already prepared, I guess. It will be ready by now, I guess. What is this? This is 9th of May, right? Probably it would be in printing. You understand this? Question paper is under preparation, of, that means printing stages. Because next week they'll have to dispose to all centers, at least, or it depends on the system, we don't know about it, yes? So questions are already prepared, they are already there. Answers are also given. Both question and answer, both are there, printed already. So the question and answers are waiting for you, for your eyes to see, for your brains to identify. Please remember, try to give as many mock tests as possible. Try to evaluate yourself. There are no boundaries to civil service exam, please understand this. And any amount of preparation may be insufficient at times. 
you never know it is highly unpredictable you understand this try to know about as many things as possible work really hard this is the time you work really hard please understand this once you do very well in this stage make sure that you will not write this prelims again give whatever you have 100% please understand this. and cut down on all other commitments just focus on only on this exam because this is the time you just revise and try to know as many contemporary developments as possible this is the time you have solid three weeks make the best use of solid three weeks you can definitely make a difference in your own lives make sure whatever you study you won't miss a question from answering be very thorough in whatever you read you can make a difference the three weeks from now can make a difference please understand you still have time don't pick up a new source don't pick up a new book now revise whatever you have been reading all these months on top of it half of your day must involve in studying contemporary developments if possible give one mock test and stop one week before the exam you have three weeks from now it makes a difference this three week time can be very very precious for you can be life changing time for you do you understand this you still can do better provided you change the way you prepare that means not random changes you cannot change the way you have been preparing completely don't try something new don't pick up a new book don't randomly change the way you prepare that means waking up in the night sleeping in the morning don't try those things they will alter your chemistry please understand this continue whatever you have been doing in a more intense manner focused manner keep all other things aside they can wait you have solid 3 weeks it can make a difference make it count all the best do well and clear the prelims and come for mains we'll talk after the prelims we'll be here to give you answers don't worry about them you still have time you can make a difference in the prelims exam remember it's not a big big exam because answer is given look at it in that way it's going to be relatively easy for you because the answer is in front of your eyes just look more cautiously look with a little more logic with more reason rational you understand this revise as many number of times as possible with whatever you have been reading all these days months and add contemporary developments in a more logical manner to them and the next 3 weeks are going to be life changing for you trust me on this never lose hope and don't get distracted because of others your life is dependent on your efforts not others words please remember this all the best do well good luck work hard thank you